Today I'm releasing my third book on Amazon called The Ragged, and instead of dropping it on Audible and ACX, I decided I'm just going to put the story here on YouTube for all of you folks. Um, if you do enjoy this, please check out my other two books, S79, The Horror in the Swamp, which might actually make an appearance on this channel as well, and Leash and other short horror stories. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Andrew put the car in park and took a deep breath in before slowly exhaling. He adjusted his tie in the rearview mirror and slumped back in his seat. A small, gentle hand found its way onto his, and he remembered his wife sitting next to him. Soothed by her soft and cool fingers, Andrew felt himself relaxed as he turned to look Celeste in the eye. I don't know if I'm ready for this, he whispered. No one ever is, she replied softly, placing her hand on his cheek to wipe away a tear. But that's why you have me. I'm the parachute, here to soften your fall. But what if I don't pull the ripcord though, he asked before cracking a small wry smile. Then you're just an oversized backpack. She rolled her eyes. Then I'll guess I'll just have to wait in the car. Only an idiot wouldn't pull the cord. Celeste leaned over and gave Andrew a small kiss on the forehead. Then they both got out of the car and headed across the parking lot to the funeral home. The funeral home looked and felt like every other funeral home in existence. Dim, yellow chandeliers hung limply from the ceiling, illuminating the dark carpet, overly cushy chairs, and fake flower pots. There was a lamp in every corner, and even at eleven in the morning, the building felt eternally trapped in twilight. The funeral director stood in the center of the tiled foyer, and welcomed them in a way that only funeral directors could manage with a blend of genuine warmth and heartfelt condolences. The director, a tall, plump, and friendly man named Randall Gibbons, but you could call me Randy, gently walked Andrew and Celeste through the plans for the day, stopping regularly to make sure that the two of them were following along. Andrew wasn't. He couldn't focus. His eyes kept darting around the room, looking at every floral arrangement, furniture pattern, and lamp, but taking in none of it. He couldn't quit thinking that it was all too much. Nothing about the funeral home felt right for Corvus. His grandfather never cared much for formality or fanciness, and Andrew couldn't help but feel guilty for allowing his memorial service to be both. He also knew that Corvus's body if Andrew could even get up the nerve to see it, wouldn't look like the man he once knew. Now does that sound good to you, Mr. Wilson? Randy asked, yanking Andrew back into reality. I'm sorry, what? Are you ready to see your grandfather? Andrew mumbled, sure. I was led into the chapel by Celeste, who held his hand as she followed the funeral director. Randy told them to take their time before heading back to the lobby to wait for the minister to arrive. Celeste asked him if he wanted to do this with or without her. Andrew couldn't remember responding, but Celeste squeezed his hand and stepped out of the room as well, leaving him alone in the chapel. The center aisle of the room seemed to stretch out ahead of Andrew as he tried to work up the will to move forward. He felt himself start walking, his legs wobbling with each step. Andrew had lost more than his fair share of loved ones in his life, but this time it felt different. Corvus had been one of Andrew's only positive influences growing up, and he wasn't sure he was ready to see his grandfather's body. Still, despite his reservations, Andrew found himself carried across the room to the open casket. The body looked picture perfect. It was wearing a crisp black suit with a red tie fastened in a perfect double Windsor knot. 
The wispy halo of hair around the head was combed without a single hair out of place, and there was a small, serene smile immortalized on his lips. It looked perfect. But it just wasn't Corvus. A stranger would have thought that the body laying peacefully in repose looked excellent, but anyone who knew Corvus could spot anything wrong from a mile away. His grandfather didn't even wear a suit on his own wedding day. Andrew had lived with the man for two years, and had never seen him wearing anything other than overalls and a flannel, and he had only seen the man smile a small handful of times. Corvus wasn't a mean man, but he wasn't a warm man either, and he definitely didn't care for anything as showy as this funeral service. Andrew jumped when he felt something touch his back, pulling him out of his thoughts. He turned to see Celeste looking up at him with a look of concern. Are you okay? She asked, her eyes already knowing the answer. We should have just buried him behind the farmhouse. I mean, he'd have a cow if he saw what I did for his funeral. Hey, you still can if you want to. A voice rang out from behind the couple. Andrew turned to see a familiar face. I could distract Randy while he sneaked the old dude out back. Jackson Crowley. Well, he hadn't changed a bit in the 24 years since he and Andrew had last seen each other. He stood just a few feet up the aisle with that same stupid grin he had always had after making a terrible joke. Andrew forgot his grief for just a moment at the sight of his old friend. Jax, he called out in a mix of surprise and joy as he stepped forward to hug the man. You're here. Ah, oh, don't act so surprised, man. I wouldn't miss this for the world, he said as they broke their hug and he placed his hands firmly on Andrew's shoulders. You could have told me you were coming back. Oh, I'm sorry, man, it's... It's all been such a whirlwind that I forgot. His death really took me by surprise. Yeah, I get that. Jax replied before a new stupid grin washed over his face as he looked over Andrew's shoulder. Now the real surprise here is that you landed such a fox. And uh, who might you be? Celeste introduced herself and reached out a hand, which Jax summarily ignored as he moved in for a hug. He had never met a stranger. He turned to face Andrew with his arm still around Celeste's shoulder and gave an exaggerated thumbs up of approval. All three of them smiled and laughed a little and Andrew was thankful for that small moment of levity on such a hard day. It didn't last long. Randy came back a few minutes later with the priest in tow. If Randall Gibbons was a mountain of a man, then Father Davis was a molehill. The small, mousy priest wore thick glasses with circular rims that made his eyes nearly double in size. The two of them approached Andrew's group and introductions were made all around. They all made uncomfortable small talk until it was time to start the service. All the while, Andrew noticed that Randy and Father Davis were suddenly looking around the room definitely wondering where the other guests were. Andrew wasn't at all surprised that no one else had showed up. Corvus was already somewhat of a hermit back when Andrew lived with him, so he could imagine that his grandfather had only become more reclusive since then. But that didn't take away the sting of a nearly unattended funeral. It was finally time to get started, so Andrew, Celeste, and Jax took their seat on the front row as Father Davis made his way up to the podium. Randy took a seat a few rows behind them, and the service began. The funeral took an eternity, and Andrew felt himself regretting the decision to have a service at all. He couldn't bring himself to focus on what the small man was saying about his grandfather, just like he couldn't bring himself to look back at the open casket just a few feet away. None of it is what Corvus would have wanted. None of it was what Andrew wanted. 
Andrew? Father Davis called down from the podium. Would you like to say anything before we close out the service? He wanted to say no, to get up, storm out, and just drive home. He wanted to be petulant and hateful. But instead, he nodded quietly and stood up to give a half-hearted eulogy. Chapter 2 Celeste pulled her jacket tighter around herself and leaned further into Andrew's side as a cool October breeze swept across the cemetery. She stood next to the grave with her arm wrapped around Andrew's arm and watched as they lowered his grandfather into the ground. It truly would have been a beautiful service if anyone had bothered to show up. Celeste had quietly decided during the funeral that the day was easily one of the most awkward days of her life. Dealing with death is hard for a number of reasons, but she had learned earlier that day that being the only one in the room not dealing with death is its own kind of strange. She was doing her best to comfort Andrew, but it was clear that what he needed more than anything was for the day to be over. She didn't blame him for feeling like that. She wanted the day to end too. She was used to being capable and helpful and strong, but ever since they had gotten out of the car to enter the funeral home, Celeste just didn't know what to do with herself. She knew that just being there with him was more than enough, but it didn't feel like enough. All of those thoughts swirled in Celeste's head as she picked up a handful of dirt and tossed it into the hole. She knew almost nothing about Andrew's grandfather, or the rest of his family for that matter, but she did know that he was one of the only good influences Andrew had growing up, and that made him okay in her book. Shortly after the ceremonial dirt had been dropped, the priest and the funeral directors said their goodbyes and left, undoubtedly commiserating over how awkward the day's events had been. Celeste watched them walk away, partly wishing that she could leave with them. Jax put his arm around Andrew, and Celeste took the opportunity to slip away. I'll give you two a minute, she whispered before stepping back. It seemed like he and Jax needed some time to mourn together, which was fine with her. She needed to take a breather. As much as Celeste loved Andrew, being his rock was really taxing her that day. Grief made Andrew act in strange ways, and it was getting harder for her to separate his pain from his personality. He was normally bright, warm, and more than a little sarcastic. He always knew how to make her laugh, even if she was rolling her eyes while she did. But ever since he had heard the news about his grandfather passing, his jokes had been fewer, and his smiles were smaller. His sarcasm had taken on more of a bite, and she found him to be almost mean on occasion. Celeste knew it was just part of the mourning process, but that didn't make it any easier for her to live with. She watched Jax and Andrew for a minute, two old friends coming back together in the worst of circumstances, and smiled a bit. Celeste had never heard of Jax before that morning, but Andrew seemed to find himself again when he arrived, and that was all that mattered to her. She watched them grieve together, kneeling down at the graveside, Jax holding Andrew close with an arm around the shoulder, and their heads leaning against each other in the middle. It was too intimate and personal for Celeste to keep staring at, so she decided to start looking around the graveyard. It was a standard small town southern cemetery. Tiny, unassuming headstones dotted the plot of the land, most of them holding the remains of people who were born, lived, and died all in the same place. Celeste had never understood how someone could live like that. It seemed too small a life to never leave your hometown, which was exactly why she left for school in Massachusetts the first chance she got. She always thought that the world had to be so much bigger than she could ever know. 
but she wanted to try and see it all anyway. Celeste was lost in thought scanning the headstones when she noticed the vehicle at the edge of the cemetery, idling on one of the roads near the entrance. It was a beat-up blue truck that looked like it must have been on its last leg a decade ago. The afternoon sun was shining too brightly in her eyes for her to get a good look at the driver, so she raised her hand and shaded her eyes to try to get a better look. The truck shifted gears and slowly drove away, seemingly after the driver realized that Celeste was looking at them. She watched the vehicle slowly drive to the entrance of the cemetery before turning left onto the main road and speeding away. Despite reason telling her that it was a public graveyard and that anyone could visit, Celeste felt a cold chill roll across the back of her neck. She suddenly felt too out in the open, too naked. She took a few steps closer to Andrew and Jack's, but the men stood up before she could get to them. They turned around and, seeing the look of concern on her face, both grew concerned too. Is everything alright? Andrew asked, reaching his hand out to her. I'm fine, Celeste said after a short moment of hesitation. It was just nerves, and she didn't want to make things about her. I'm just worried about you is all. I'll be okay, he replied, but let's get out of here. I don't want to spend all day in a graveyard. The three of them walked quietly to their cars, all seemingly unsure of what to say. Celeste thought about the myriad effects of grief, and counted herself thankful that not wanting to talk much tended to be high on the list. She never knew what to say in moments like that. Being there for someone and knowing what to say to someone were very different skills indeed. Hey, uh, give me a sec before you guys get going, Jack said before walking over to his car. Celeste did a quick scan of the cemetery while he was rooting around in his back seat. She knew the truck was long gone, but the feeling of being watched still hadn't subsided. Jax came back with a bottle of whiskey held delicately in his hands. Well now I got you this, I figured what you guys would need more than anything is a good drink. Oh, thank you Jax, but I'm afraid this gift is just for Andrew, Celeste said, feeling sheepish. Well now, what's that supposed to mean? Jax asked, looking puzzled. Well, I really don't drink. He looked taken aback for the briefest of moments before recovering and replying. Hey, there's nothing wrong with the teetotaler. That just means there's more for our boy here. Jax held the bottle out and Andrew took it, reading the label as he did. Well now, you really spared no expense, Andrew said with a chuckle and a wry smile. Fifteen bucks, man. Well, I, well, I hope you didn't break the bank. I never claimed to be a rich man. Jax laughed it off. Running a small town pharmacy ain't as lucrative as you'd think. You're a pharmacist? Celeste asked. Well, that's perfect. I actually just finished my inhaler last night. Well, then you've come to the right man. Jax said, looking pleased. Why don't you guys come on over to the store this afternoon? I could get you all hooked up. Celeste felt Andrew's hand tighten a little bit on hers. She knew him well enough to know what that likely meant. He just didn't have it in him to do anything else that day, and that squeeze was him asking her not to accept the invitation. He was pulling the ripcord. That's all right, she said laying it on a bit too thick. I'll just come by tomorrow. Well, are you sure? Jax pressed. Well, I'd hate for you to have an asthma attack tonight. Every excuse she could think of tumbled out of her mouth before she could pick just one. I'll be fine, I promise. It's really not that severe. I can make it for one night. Plus, we need to get the cat to the house and let her out. She's been in the car all day. Lying was not her strong suit. 
Well, okay then, he relented before adding, if you're sure. The three of them said some quick goodbyes and declared that they all have to make plans to spend some time together and catch up and get to know each other. Andrew opened Celeste's door for her before going around to his own. Even in grief, he was always the gentleman. They drove to the edge of the cemetery and Andrew turned left while Jax turned right. He held out his hand and Celeste took it as they drove down the road toward the house they had just inherited. Chapter 3 The 30 minute drive to the farm passed in relative silence. Andrew's music hummed softly through the car's speakers a cheerful underscoring that clashed with the unease in the car. Neither of them had been out to the property since arriving. They came in late the night before from Massachusetts and booked a motel, conveniently letting them put off the strangeness of sleeping in a dead man's home for one more day. Andrew didn't know what Celeste thought about everything, but he knew for certain she didn't want to stay in his grandfather's house for very long. It had all happened so fast. Andrew got a call one morning while getting ready for work that his Andrew had died in his sleep, and the next thing he knew, he and Celeste were the sole inheritors of his entire estate in Georgia. Of course, calling it an estate was a gross over-exaggeration. Corvus's property consisted of 153 acres of half-decent farmland, an ancient farmhouse, and a ramshackle old barn that even on its best days ought to be condemned. Andrew had liked his time living with his grandfather, but his property wasn't the best maintained, even back then, and he shuddered to think about the state of it after all the intervening years. The only child of an only child, Andrew was Corvus's only surviving descendant, and with the way his father and grandfather fought, Andrew wouldn't have been surprised if Corvus had left the property to him, even if his father were still alive. His dad wasn't a bad man by any stretch, but he wasn't a great man either. Andrew's mother died when he was six, and his father never picked up the slack in her absence. When he passed unexpectedly during his sophomore year, Andrew was sent to live with Corvus. He learned more about life in the two years he spent with his grandfather than he had learned in the 16 years he spent with his father. A lot of the lessons were hard to learn that late in life, but they shaped him into the man he was that day, driving towards a property that was undoubtedly littered with the reminders of the past. The way Andrew saw it, dwelling on the past only kept you out of the present, and there were too many good things in life to let the bad things take away their beauty. That philosophy was certainly being tested by this trip. Andrew just didn't want to dig up the past. He had learned to enjoy his time in Dry Creek, but it was also the hardest time in his life. He had been recently orphaned and sent away to live with a grandfather that he had only been taught to distrust. It took a long time to adapt to the man's way of life and to grow to trust and build a relationship with him. He knew that going through Corvus's property would just force him to relieve all the hardships he had tried so hard to forget. And Andrew got the feeling that he was going to need that drink from Jack's soon. So there he sat, in a car with the love of his life, driving towards a past that he'd rather leave buried. The silence of his thoughts was only broken when Celeste spoke up to comment on the lack of cell signal. Oh, yeah, Andrew replied, eyeing the road ahead. The open fields on the right were in direct contrast to the thick tree line on the left. You're not going to get any signal the whole rest of the way to the farm. We're in a massive dead zone, but hopefully Corvus got Wi-Fi in his twilight years. Celeste cracked a smile at his lame attempt at a joke. 
with how old he was, I'll be surprised if there's electricity out here. Oh, there's electricity, but <laughs> not in the outhouse where you really want it. You're hilarious, she said before growing slightly nervous at his lack of response. There's not really an outhouse, is there? <laughs> not that I remember, but... It would certainly be a step up from the chamber pot that I had to use when I lived there. Celeste rolled her eyes and squeezed his hand. How are you feeling? I... I don't want to do this. I don't want any of it. I didn't want to bury my grandfather. And I definitely... Don't want to have to go through his stuff. It just doesn't seem fair. Death rarely does, she said. But on the bright side, we don't have to stay very long. All we have to do is clean up the house and, well, figure out what's worth keeping and sell the rest to the state. We'll be here for two weeks tops. Andrew spotted an opening in the thick tree line and slowed down before turning left onto the gravel driveway. The trees seemed to encroach on the road their gnarled roots spidering out through the dirt and pebbles, adding to the bumpiness of the drive. Thick branches loomed overhead, creating a tunnel effect before suddenly opening up, revealing a small field with a farmhouse in the center. Time had not been kind to the ancient building. The dark wood was dry and cracked in many places, and more paint had peeled off than had stayed on. The windows were all yellow with age and filled with cobwebs. The wraparound porch was piled high with junk. And old farming equipment and moth-bit furniture were all littered across the old porch, with some places having given in from the weight and decay. Andrew and Celeste both looked at the house and then back at each other as he pulled up near the porch. Well, so much for two weeks, Andrew said, trying to get over the shock of just how much Corvus had let the house fall into disrepair. He was scared to see the inside. We're both up to date on our tetanus shots, right? Celeste asked. Andrew couldn't decide if she was making a joke or being genuine. I don't think there are shots for what we could catch from that stuff. She looked over at him with a look of disbelief. And you're still having us sleep here? I mean, if it's safe, yes. Andrew replied, grimacing at the prospect of sleeping in that house. We just don't have the money to live out of a motel for weeks on end. Not when we're both using vacation time for this. Hmm, some vacation. The two of them unbuckled and got out of the car and Andrew went around to the trunk. He pulled it open and was greeted by an impatient meow from their cat, Gracie, who looked up at him with large, unamused eyes. He unlocked her carrier and swung open the door. She took a tentative step out of the carrier and sniffed the air for a moment. Then, ignoring his outstretched hand, she hopped down and wandered off into the overgrown grass. Once there, she found a nice sunbeam and ruffled her fur a bit before flopping down onto her side. Well, at least she'll be happy here, Celeste mused as she pulled their bags out of the back seat. Andrew came around the side and took his suitcase from Celeste, and the couple walked up to the house. The floorboards on the porch creaked like they might give out under their weight, but they held firm. Towers of junk loomed over them on either side, threatening to topple under the slightest gust of wind. They approached the front door, which seemed to look down on them disapprovingly. Andrew didn't remember having the house having so much personality when he first lived there. He took the key ring out of his pocket and found the most recent addition, which was an old skeleton key that the court-appointed executor had given him. It took more than a few attempts to get the old lock to turn, but Andrew eventually managed to find the trick and open the door. A strong, musty smell emanated from within the house. 
somehow managing to be a different kind of smell that hung over the porch. The couple gave each other the same incredulous look before stepping inside. Andrew reached over to the wall by the door and flipped the switch. Surprisingly, the lights worked. Even though they only gave off a faint orange glow, he and Celeste walked into the center of the living room and dropped their bags, sending up a small puff of dust. Andrew then looked around the room, torn between the familiarity and the alienness of it all. Most of the furniture was still the same, but the whole house had taken on an aura of neglect and disarray. Several years' worth of newspapers were stacked in a pile by the fireplace, all still in their original plastic. Scattered across the coffee table were generic magazines and papers covered in scribbles of nothing in particular. The only part of the room that seemed well-maintained was the small bookcase under the living room window, which simply had two full shelves of books sitting in neat rows. Corvus had stopped taking care of the place in his old age and had possibly even started losing his grip on reality, if the scribbles were any indication. Looking at the mess of the living room caused a whole new kind of mourning to pass over Andrew. His grandfather had spent his final years alone and uncared for, and that was Andrew's fault. He could have hired someone to take care of Corvus or had him move up to Massachusetts to live with him and Celeste. Would have been better than living out his days alone in a house that decayed with his mind. But even through the guilt, a small part of him knew that his grandfather wouldn't have allowed Andrew to help him even if he tried. Corvus was from a time where working was all you had. Andrew was certain that Corvus wouldn't have wanted to be alive if he couldn't live on his own and take care of himself. Maybe that life was what he wanted. Celeste walked through the living room and around the half wall into the small kitchen area and ran the tap. The water came out clean, much to her apparent surprise. You know he drank the water, right? Andrew called across the living space, having a small laugh at his wife's expense. Yeah, well, have you seen the room that you're standing in? She called back. I'll be surprised if anything here is safe or healthy. She had a point. Corvus never excelled at cleanliness or tidiness, but it also wasn't like him to let his house fall apart the way he did. The man had lived his whole life working the land and making things with his hands, so it was strange to see his home in such a sad state. Celeste turned the tap off and walked over to the phone hanging on the wall. She picked it up, held it to her ear, and listened. A look of dismay fell over her face as she announced, It's disconnected. What? There's no sound, no dial tone, nothing. Well, that's weird. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I guess we're on our own while we're out here. I think this is another point in favor of getting a room at that motel in town. Celeste pointed out, clearly unhappy with the condition of the house. As I said before, Andrew said through a clenched jaw, we don't have the money right now to stay in a motel for weeks on end while we fix this place up. If it's safe, we stay. It's the end of story. Celeste visibly stiffened at his words, and Andrew immediately felt bad for the way he had spoken to her. The frustration melted out of him. Listen, I'm sorry, Pumpkin, he said. It's fine. She crossed the room and put her arms around him. I know how hard this must all be for you, so we'll stay here if we can. Thank you. It means a lot to me. She kissed him on the cheek. Do you want to help me take our bags upstairs? A small smile spread across his face. Yeah, I'd love to. The two of them grabbed their bags and made their way up the stairs, which creaked loudly with every step. 
At the top of the stairs was a hallway with a bathroom on the left and two bedrooms on the right. Andrew led Celeste past the first door, telling her as he did that it was Corvus's room, and he'd rather sleep in his old room. He opened the door to the bedroom he used to sleep in, and recoiled at what was inside. Dozens and dozens of porcelain dolls filled the room. They were on the floor, lining the walls, on the rocking chair, the bedside table, and even all over the bed. There were cracks and holes on many of their heads, and broken shards of porcelain were littered across the room. You've got to be kidding me, Celeste balked at the sight of the ceramic carnage. Well, I guess Corvus had some beef with all of Grandma Eileen's old dolls, Andrew mused. So our sleeping options are the room your grandfather died in, or the room where he tortured children's toys. Okay, maybe just one night in a motel. Chapter 4 Celeste opened the front door of the old farmhouse and flipped the switch, but no lights came on. She flipped it a few more times. Nothing. She cursed under her breath and turned her phone flashlight on before stepping inside. The house was far creepier in the dead of night. A strong wind blew, rattling loose boards and whistling through openings in the structure. She walked into the living room, shining the light across it. Old furniture came into view as the light went by, but nothing was out of place. She continued her search. She turned and went up the stairs, led by a strange compulsion she couldn't seem to name. She just had to. At the top of the stairs, the dark hallway beckoned to her, her flashlight guiding the way. Celeste approached Andrew's old bedroom. Her hand hesitated briefly before clutching the handle and turning. The door slowly creaked open revealing dozens and dozens of those wretched porcelain dolls, all cracked and chipped and broken. She scanned the flashlight slowly across the room, looking for any signs of movement. Nothing. Celeste went back down the hall to the next door, to Corvus's room, and pushed it open. There was a human figure, laying in the bed, covered by the bedding. Against her better judgment, she approached slowly, tiptoeing toward the bed, her hand reaching out to grab the blanket. She finally took hold and threw it back, revealing an empty bed. A rhythmic rumbling suddenly emanated from the other side of the wall, startling Celeste. It was coming from Andrew's room. She crept out of the room she was in, went down the hall, and peeked around the corner to see what was making the sound. The old rocking chair was aggressively moving back and forth, seemingly on its own. She went over and stopped it, plunging the house back into silence. Puzzled by the chair's activity, it took Celeste far too long to realize that something else was out of the ordinary. And then, all at once, it hit her. The dolls were gone. Panic set in, and she found herself running. She ran out of the room, through the hall, and down the stairs, desperate to leave the house. She made a beeline for the front door, but found it locked. She pulled and pulled, dropping her phone in the process. The flashlight landed facing the ground, and darkness surrounded her. Celeste leaned down to pick up her phone and saw movement out of the corner of her eye. She slowly turned the phone, illuminating the living room behind her. Her heart dropped. There they were. The dolls were perched all around the room. They were on the couch, the coffee table, the bookshelf, the floor, everywhere. And they were all facing her. Celeste woke with a start and was relieved to find herself in the motel room. Soft morning sunbeams poked through the gap between the curtains. 
bathing the room in an amber glow. Andrew walked out of the bathroom in a pair of jeans with a toothbrush in his mouth. <laughs> Morning, gorgeous, he said through a mouthful of toothpaste. Sound like you were having a nightmare. Cause I was, she replied, still trying to convince her heart rate that she was safe. Andrew walked back into the bathroom and spat before calling out. Well, do you want to tell me what it was all about? It was those stupid dolls from yesterday. I had a dream that they were moving on their own and they were coming to get me. Well, I can't blame you there. They were super creepy. Celeste jumped out of bed and walked into the bathroom as Andrew stepped out, their routine transitioning cleanly into the new environment. She sat down to pee. They have got to go before you get me to go back into that house again. Yeah, I figured as much. Andrew called from the other side of the door, where Celeste knew he was undoubtedly throwing on an old work shirt. Years of marriage had made the two of them more than a little predictable, which she preferred. Why don't you stay in town while I go out to the house and take care of the porcelain infestation? You could get your prescription filled and maybe do a little bit of window shopping. I'll come back to get you once the house is doll free. Celeste finished washing her hands and opened the door to give Andrew a good morning kiss. I knew there was a reason I married you. He put his shoes on, kissed his wife goodbye, and headed out the door, leaving Celeste alone in the room. She took a nice long shower while listening to music. The past week had been a whirlwind, and Celeste was just thankful to have a morning of alone time. As she left the motel room, she thought that Andrew would probably appreciate it too. A light autumn breeze blew past Celeste as she stepped outside, squinting in the sunlight. She had looked up the pharmacy and knew that it was just a few blocks away from the motel. To be fair, she thought, everything in that podunk town was just a few blocks away from everything else. Celeste put wireless earbuds in and turned on her music. She walked down Main Street, passing the only stoplight in Dry Creek, and marveled at just how empty it all was. Most people must have been at work or school, because she was the only soul on the street at that time. Now Celeste had always grown up thinking that she was from a small town, but her 8,000-person hometown was gargantuan when compared to the less than 700 people that Dry Creek boasted. She walked past the sheriff's office, the Catholic church, and what was ostensibly the town's only grocery store, all in the span of ten minutes. And nestled between them were a series of mom and pop shops that each seemed to be relatively unoccupied, save for their proprietors. They all watched her pass in that way that people from small towns tend to do not being outright unwelcoming, but being more than a little aware of anyone who doesn't look like they belong. After 20 minutes of walking, Celeste finally arrived at the pharmacy. She pulled her earbuds out and stashed them in her hoodie pocket as she entered, sending a bell above the door into a frenzy of tiny clangs. Jax looked up from the counter and flashed her a large, toothy smile. Well, I was wondering when I was going to see you again, he said as he came around the counter and went in for a hug that Celeste felt obligated to return. She ended the hug as soon as possible. I told you I was coming in today. Well, I know, but well, you never specified when. I've been on pins and needles all morning. Now, Celeste was really confused. Why is that? Well, <laughs> Well, now, because you're Andrew's girl, he told her as he went back around the counter. She handed him her prescription, and he started typing on the computer as they spoke. Look, well, that guy was the best friend I ever had as a kid, so I'm excited to get to know you. Well, that's very sweet of you. Plus, you know, I get bored when there are not too many customers. 
And how often is it like this? <laughs> Almost every day. Yikes, why don't you just move? She regretted saying that as soon as it came out of her mouth. That was way too forward. Jack seemed to take it in stride. Well, I like it here. The people are good and I'm the only pharmacist around. Hell, without me, they'd have to go to the next town over. Just like the kids have to go for school. He paused for a moment. Well, I just hate to be another reason my hometown's dying. I'm sorry, she said at a loss for words. I didn't realize... Oh, you're fine. The smile was back. You didn't know any better. But I think it's only fair that I get to pry a little in return. Go for it, she feigned bravado, thrown off by the sudden shift back to lightheartedness. I'm an open book. What's with the age gap? Andrew's gotta be... what? Eight years older than you? Celeste wasn't at all surprised at his question. She got it all the time. Andrew was 42, and she was 32, a gap that had drawn the eye and ire of many people throughout their relationship. It frustrated her at first, but she got used to it. By that point, it was as normal as telling people what she did for a living. Ten, actually. We met when I was finishing up college in Massachusetts. I think we were both nervous about the gap at first, but our connection was strong enough that it ended up not being that big of a deal for us. Convincing my parents it wasn't a big deal though, well, that did take a bit longer. Well, I can imagine, but you guys seem like a good fit, so I'm happy it all worked out. He finished up typing on the computer and printed something out. Well, I'll head in the back and get this ready for you. And with that, Jax walked out of sight, leaving Celeste alone in the pharmacy. She looked around, taking it all in for the first time. The building was shaped like a shotgun barrel, long and thin. Windows lined the outside entrance, full of posters for town events that had passed months and even years before. Fluorescent light shone down harshly on the rows and rows of medicines lining the aisles. It was all very standard fare for a pharmacy, outside of one particular detail. A large cork board hung on the wall near the counter, filled with missing person posters. Each sheet of paper bore the image of a woman, only a few years younger than Celeste. There were almost 30 of them fighting for space on the board, each one from a different year. The oldest paper occupied the top left corner of the board and was dated October 1993, and the newest one on the bottom right was from just that month. The most recent girl looked strangely like Celeste. She had the same dirty blonde hair, falling in a wavy cascade down to her shoulders, and a very similar facial structure. But the only notable difference was that the girl on the poster had brown eyes, not blue eyes. But outside of that, they could have been cousins. Her name was Amelia Barnett. Celeste felt a pang of sadness as she looked at Amelia Barnett, and all the other faded pictures of the smiling young women who should have had their whole lives ahead of them. She thought briefly of their families having to live with the fact that they may never know what happened to their little girls. Then her mind turned to her own family and resolved to call her mom before going back out to the house again. Well, it's tragic, isn't it? Jax asked as he reappeared behind the counter. Celeste jumped and clutched her chest at the surprise. Don't sneak up on me like that. She practically shouted at him, immediately regretting her tone. Oh, I'm sorry, I just have a light step. R right, right. You were saying? Oh, I was saying that it's tragic. All of those missing girls. Absolutely, she replied, her curiosity getting the better of her. But why these girls, and why do you keep them so long? 
I don't know. Those are just the flyers that get brought in. And as you could tell by all the other old signs hanging up around the store, well, I'm not the best at throwing things away. So you wouldn't be any help cleaning up Corvus's old place then, would you? She teased, secretly hoping it might prompt an offer. He chuckled a bit. Well, I might be around every now and then to lend a hand, but you see, but this place keeps me pretty busy. We'll appreciate all the help we can get. That house is going to need a lot of work done. Jax rang up Celeste's prescription and handed her the small paper bag with her new inhaler inside. She thanked him before adding, Can I ask you something about Corvus? A somber look fell across Jax's face. Absolutely. His house has some seriously creepy junk in it. Was he okay in his later years? He thought for a moment. Well, Corvus definitely lost himself a bit in his old age, but he was always a little bit strange. He garnered a bit of a reputation as the town weirdo. People never really trusted him. Celeste leaned forward onto the counter and asked, well, Why is that? Jax did a quick scan around them before answering quietly, despite the two of them being the only people in the store. Well, most people around here think that he killed his wife. Her eyes grew wide. What? He nodded enthusiastically. Yep. Well, she went missing back in the 90s and was never seen again. Well, I believe it was actually just a few years before Andrew came to live with him. Cops investigated him and didn't find any evidence, but a lack of proof never stopped a small town rumor mill. Do you think he did it? Jax leaned back. <laughs> nah, uh, Corvus wouldn't hurt a fly. He was just a superstitious old man that everybody loved to gossip about. Well, I thought the world of him all the way to the end. There wasn't much left to say after that, so the two of them said their goodbyes and Celeste left. She spent her walk home in silence, choosing to listen to the sounds of the small town rather than her own music. She'd never heard about Andrew's grandmother before. She couldn't blame him for not wanting to talk about it. But it made her wonder how much else she didn't know about his life. That thought spiraled in her head, drowning out any other thoughts she might have had. Celeste got back to the motel room and did the only thing she could think to do to help clear her thoughts. She called her mom. Chapter 5 Andrew kicked up dirt as he pulled into a parking spot at the motel. The sun had started to set by the time he had finished cleaning up the mess in his old room. There were shards of porcelain everywhere, and nowhere near the house to dispose of it all, so he filled multiple trash bags to bring back and throw in a dumpster in town. He was satisfied with a job well done, but he was also more than a little aware of just how long he had left Celeste alone at the motel. As soon as he had gotten service again, Andrew's phone buzzed with several new notifications, including a handful of missed calls and texts from his wife. Andrew had called her back to let her know that he was almost there, and to ask her to think about what sounded good for dinner. Now that the sun was setting behind him as he walked across the parking lot to their door, Andrew felt even guiltier than before. He knocked and called out that it was him, then listened for the soft reply on the other side. Celeste opened the door with a smile, to Andrew's surprise, and greeted him with a hug and a peck on the cheek. Oh, hey, gorgeous, he said as he pulled back from the hug, a smile supplanting his penitent expression. I'm sorry I'm so late. I had no idea it would take that long. Are the dolls gone? She asked. Yeah. Then I don't mind one bit. The two of them grabbed their bags and headed out to one of the few restaurants in town. 
It was an old-fashioned burger joint full of people who kept sneaking glances at the two outsiders in their midst. Andrew did not miss that feeling at all. One of the main reasons he preferred cities was the anonymity they allowed him to have. No one knew him or cared what he was doing, and that was the way he liked it. Uncomfortable with the stares and whispers, Andrew and Celeste only made small talk as they ate. Celeste asked how Gracie was doing out at the farm, and he told her that she was loving it. He said that it would be a miracle if they could get their cat to go home with them at the end of their visit. They finished up their food and began their trip back to the house, talking more earnestly about their days and their emotions now that there weren't prying eyes and listening ears. Andrew told Celeste all about his battle with the ceramic army in his room, and about how he felt sorry for anyone who went dumpster diving where he threw them away. She told him about calling her mom, and about her chat with Jax, but wasn't overly talkative. Andrew was glad that she seemed to like him, but he could tell that she wasn't saying everything that she thought. He decided not to press her for the rest. Celeste would always say what was on her mind eventually, and Andrew had learned over the years that asking her to talk before she was ready would only make it harder for her to string her thoughts into words. They spent the last few minutes of the drive in relative silence, listening to the quiet music playing over the car speakers. Andrew wondered what was going on in her head, but chose again to bide his time. If it was worth saying, she would say it. The two of them arrived at the house and started winding down for the night. Celeste had downloaded some movies on her computer for them to watch together, since Corvus never ended up buying a television. Despite Andrew's assurances that he had found them all, Celeste did a full sweep of the bedroom to check for any remaining dolls. Once she had full confidence in his work, the two of them snuggled up on his old bed and watched a romantic comedy together. It was a pretty generic story. It was about a guy who missed his chance with the girl of his dreams, who was of course now about to marry his best friend. The hook of this movie, though, was that the man found a genie's lamp and got three wishes to help him make things better. Andrew had spent the whole movie hoping the dude would just fall in love with the genie, but it ended up with him using the lessons he had learned and got the girl without needing the genie's magic. As far as Celeste's movie choices went, it wasn't too bad. After the film ended, the couple went through their nightly routine and got ready for bed together, again, rather quietly. Andrew racked his brain trying to figure out what she could be chewing on for so long, but kept drawing a blank. They had climbed into bed together and Andrew was about to turn off the lamp when Celeste finally spoke up. Hey, uh, why didn't you ever tell me about your grandma? She asked plainly. I thought I did. He replied, unsure of what she was getting at. She died a few years before I moved out here. I never really got to know her. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Then Andrew understood. He felt like an idiot for not considering that this would come up while they were here. Did Jax tell you? Yeah. Well, what did he say? Does it matter what he said? She sat up straighter. I want to know what you have to say and why you never told me. Andrew pursed his lips for a moment before sighing. Well, um, what should I have said? That the people out here thought my grandpa killed my grandma? That I was not only an outsider when I moved here, but I was also living with the town pariah? That... People would either stare at me or talk about me behind my back, but would never be caught dead actually talking to me. I'm sorry, I didn't really want to relive that. He paused for a moment to steady himself. Celeste reached out and squeezed his hand, and his shoulders relaxed a bit. You know, I just wish I could forget it all, yet here I am sorting through the past. 
Celeste moved in for a hug, and Andrew pulled her close. He took a deep breath as they held each other, and the scent of her shampoo filled his nose, comforting him with its familiarity. I'm sorry you had to go through all of that, she whispered, her head against his chest. Well, I'm sorry I never told you about it. They held each other for so long that Andrew fell asleep. He was snoring softly by the time Celeste shook him awake. His eyes blearily opened. Andrew. Her harsh whisper woke him up a bit more, and he picked his head up to look at her. She was sitting straight up, hugging a pillow to her chest. What? He asked as he rubbed his eyes. I can hear something moving around on the back porch. She hissed urgently. I think there's someone out there. Andrew rolled over and closed his eyes. Well, it's probably nothing. But what if it's not? She shook him again. You need to go make sure. He let out a sigh as he sat up and put his feet on the floor. And that's when he heard it too. The faintest sound of creaking wood came from the back of the house, just quiet enough that Andrew couldn't tell what was causing it. A sudden sense of urgency passed over Andrew, and he tiptoed across the room to grab the broom he had left there after sweeping up the broken porcelain. He picked it up and headed slowly toward the stairs. Was someone outside? He winced at the creaking that every step brought as he descended toward the living room. He reached the bottom of the stairs and peeked around the corner to the left. Nothing there. Soft moonlight bathed the living room as Andrew crept over and crouched behind the half wall that separated it from the kitchen. He paused to listen and the creaking had grown quiet now. Did they hear him coming? His heart pounded in his chest as Andrew moved slowly into the kitchen and approached the mudroom that contained the back door. He stepped up to the door, turned the lock gently, and took a deep breath. The door squeaked as he slowly pushed it open and stepped out onto the back porch, broomstick raised in preparation. Andrew stood frozen as he listened, his eyes scanning the porch, and all seemed to be quiet. Piles of junk and garbage sat inert to his left and right. He looked out at the tree line, squinting through the darkness. All seemed to be still. A sudden burst of movement near his feet startled Andrew, and he let out a yelp. He jumped forward out of the way and raised the broom to swing when he finally realized what he was looking at. Gracie paced aggressively in the doorway, clearly agitated. Andrew let out a sigh of relief and lowered the broom, silently chastising himself for getting so worked up over nothing. It was Gracie, he called out as he stooped down to pet the cat. I'm sorry we forgot to let you in before bed, bubs. She rubbed against his hand once before turning around and running inside. He closed the back door and locked it, then followed Gracie through the kitchen and into the living room instead of trying to follow him upstairs or begging for a treat. Gracie crawled under the couch and looked up at Andrew with massive eyes. Hey, are you okay there, kitty? He asked as he crouched down to get a closer look at her. The cat scooted deeper under the couch, recoiling from his outstretched hand. Something was upsetting her, but Andrew figured it was just the jitters of being in a new place. Yeah, I get it. Hey, I'm a little creeped out too. He crooned to Gracie as she watched him intently. Don't worry. I've lived here before, there's nothing to be scared of out there. Hit by the post-adrenaline wave of tiredness, Andrew yawned before standing up and headed back to bed. He was halfway up the stairs when a shadow passed by the living room window. Chapter 6 The morning sun cut through the bedroom curtains as Andrew woke up. He rolled over to check his phone and saw that it was 6.45, 15 minutes before his alarm was supposed to go off. Typical. 
He rolled over and pulled Celeste close, determined to make the most of his unfortunate premature wakefulness. Still, mostly asleep, his wife instinctively snuggled up against him, an experience that never got old. Andrew hadn't always been an early riser, but his time with Corvus changed that. Much to his chagrin, his grandfather made him get up early before school each day to do some work around the farm. Andrew refused to get up on his first morning there, and was met with a bucket of water for his insolence. Corvus didn't know the meaning of the word, gentle. He of course hated the early morning work schedule at first. It took months for Andrew to complete the work without complaining the whole time, and another few months after that to start waking up on his own. Chorn has to be done, Corvus would always say. You could lose your morning to it, or you could lose your evening, but it's gotta get done. Ultimately, Andrew valued the possibility of free time away from the farm more than he valued that extra sleep, so he decided to accept his fate and lean into the work that had to be done. Much to his surprise, at some unknowable point during his stay at the farm, Andrew began to enjoy the early morning chores. That newfound appreciation for getting things done in the early hours of the morning never left him, much to Celeste's dismay. Andrew discovered early on in their relationship that Celeste would sleep until two in the afternoon every day if given the chance. He often joked that she loved sleep more than she loved him, a statement she had yet to deny. It frustrated him for a little while. The way she would stay in bed for hours after he had gotten up, especially on weekends, but Andrew learned to use that time to his advantage. He would go on a run, clean up around the house, and start cooking breakfast, the smell of which would awaken her from her slumber better than he ever could. Music drifted over the nightstand, a soft jazz shuffle tune playing as his alarm went off. He untangled himself from Celeste and turned it off before swinging his legs over the side of the bed and placing them on the ground. One stretch and a few good rubs of the eyes later, Andrew was getting up for the day. A strange wave of familiarity washed over him as he walked across the hall to the bathroom. That special kind of nostalgia that only came from returning to a path you used to walk daily. Andrew decided to lean into it. After all, he was alone until Celeste woke up, and he knew that he needed to let himself process his feelings at some point. Why not now? Looking in the mirror as he brushed his teeth, Andrew saw himself as a teen again, first feeling stuck in that house, but eventually growing to love it. It had always been a run-down, beaten-up, piece-of-junk old farmhouse, but that became part of its charm. Countless stories echoed within those walls. Andrew thought back to the time that Corvus had tried to teach him how to kill a chicken. The old man preferred to buy his food fresh, and nothing was fresher than a meal that was still alive when you picked it up. About a month after Andrew had moved in, Corvus walked into the living room with a small cage containing two chickens. He set it down, grunted at Andrew, then stepped back and crossed his arms. He looked from the cage to his grandfather and then back again before the man spoke. Well, there's supper, he said. Kill him. Corvus was never a man of many words. Andrew always assumed that he didn't have much to say, but he also had a quieter theory that he never told his grandfather. Fewer words meant less room for discussion. You can't talk back to a man who isn't talking. Of course, that never stopped him from trying. <laughs> you can't be serious, he protested. I'm not going to kill them. I don't even know how. Then pay attention. Corvus stalked over to the cage and took one of the birds out. 
It ruffled its feathers a bit in protest, but otherwise didn't struggle as he tilted its feet up and reached a hand down to hold its neck. He gripped right below the base of its skull between his pointer finger and middle finger and tilted its head 90 degrees to the right. You get it like this, he explained, and then you pull. Corvus jerked quickly down, and Andrew could hear the neck crack from where he was standing. The bird spasmed and twitched, trembling as it died. He recoiled at it all, fighting the urge to vomit. What? He choked back tears. I can't do that. The man paid no attention to Andrew's hysterics. His grandfather's face might as well have been a stone. Well, sure you can, he said plainly. Just do what I did. Well, why can't you just buy a dead one at the store? Because I'm trying to teach you something about life, boy. Corvus carried the dead bird by its feet as he stomped past Andrew and into the kitchen, heading toward the back porch. He paused halfway through and turned around to address his grandson once more, cooler this time. Every burger you ever ate was alive once. Life doesn't happen without a little death to feed it. He turned back around and kept walking, calling over his shoulder as he did. You either kill it, or you go hungry. Andrew chose to go hungry that night. Of course, Corvus still made him sit down at the dinner table to watch him eat. You always sat down for dinner as a family. When he woke up the next morning and went downstairs, Andrew found that chicken sleeping soundly in its cage. Corvus was sitting in his rocking chair a few feet away from the bird. He looked up at Andrew and set his face. Same offer as yesterday, he said. You kill it, or you go hungry. It was almost dinner time before Andrew decided to abandon his hunger strike. He never forgot the feeling of its little neck bones breaking between his fingers. A small shudder went through Andrew at the remembrance of his first kill. Corvus managed to have a small shred of mercy for the struggling teen under his roof so he only made Andrew prepare a chicken once or twice a month. Thinking back on this time with his grandfather, Andrew never knew exactly how to feel. A large part of him was grateful for the old man taking him in and teaching him values the only way he knew how, but another, almost equally large, part of him was furious at the old man for being so cruel and hard at times. He knew it was mostly just the generational gap that made Corvus seem so unkind, but he also had a difficult time excusing his behaviors. Ultimately, he just wished that he understood the man, afraid of burning himself out by feeling too much too quickly. Andrew splashed water in his face and pushed the emotions to the side for a moment before heading downstairs to make breakfast. Celeste rolled over and stretched, basking in the small sliver of morning sunlight that came between the curtains. Andrew was gone, which didn't surprise her in the slightest. He always woke up at the most ungodly hours, even on weekends, so Celeste was used to waking up alone. It upset her at the beginning of their relationship, but she grew to love those last few minutes before he got out of bed. He would always pull her close and hold her. Sometimes she was awake enough to notice, but most of the time she wasn't. It didn't matter to her though, because she always started her day feeling safe and warm. The scent of bacon wafted into the bedroom, making her stomach growl. That was another big upside of Andrew's early rising. She never had to cook breakfast. She climbed out of bed and stumbled into the bathroom, still drowsy. After sitting on the toilet for a few minutes playing games on her phone, Celeste felt awake enough to go downstairs and start her day. The creaky staircase announced her arrival long before she reached the bottom, 
and she rounded the corner to find a peculiar scene. Andrew was looking like the dream husband that he was, flipping pancakes on the stove with a kitchen towel draped over his shoulder. The rest of the image, however, was grimy and dismal. The overall messiness and creepiness of the living room and kitchen stood in direct contrast to the wholesome image of Andrew cooking. She couldn't help but smile at the juxtaposition. Even in the darkest places, that man managed to be her bright spot. Celeste walked up behind Andrew and slipped her arms around his waist before giving him a peck on the cheek. He caught her before she could pull away and gave her a deep kiss in return, which she happily accepted. All those years later, and the two of them still felt like they were honeymooning. <laughs> Good morning, gorgeous. He grinned like an idiot as she pulled back, his eyes barely open. You better watch those pancakes there, Iron Chef. She slapped his butt. They'll burn if you don't pay attention. While Andrew was finishing up cooking, Celeste started looking around for dishes to set the table. He noticed this and said, Plates are on the top left cabinet, cups are in the cabinet to the right of that, and silverware is in the drawer to the left of the sink. That's impressive, she said, pulling out two of each dish they would need. That's like riding a bike. Yeah, a bike that has a porcelain graveyard. A bike that used to have a porcelain graveyard, he corrected with a wink as he put food on the plates. One that I don't recall you helping to clean. She gestured vaguely around her as the two of them sat down at the table. I think I'll more than make up for it with how much I'm about to clean up around the bike. They chatted over their morning meal, discussing their plans for the day. After breakfast, they both headed upstairs. Celeste brushed her teeth, and each one of them put on some working clothes. Celeste put on one of Andrew's flannel shirts and tucked it into a pair of old jeans before putting on the boots that she would wear while doing field work. Celeste was an ecologist who specialized in soil. Most people's eyes would glaze over as she told them that, and she completely understood why. From the outside, studying dirt seemed comparable to watching paint dry, but she loved it. She was on unpaid leave for the duration of their time in Georgia, but was determined to make the most of the trip by getting some soil samples to bring back to Massachusetts. Andrew, on the other hand, was a marine biologist, which garnered him far more attention than Celeste ever got when he talked about his career. She understood that, too. Marine biology brings to mind playing with dolphins, helping baby sea turtles, and scuba diving. Soil ecology brings to mind literal piles of dirt. She didn't mind that, though. Andrew may have been the rock star, but she was happy to be the roadie. She had always preferred to be in the background. She liked to just do her work and let that be its own reward. Receiving recognition always made her uncomfortable, to the point where she almost skipped her college graduation. She ended up attending but only because she knew that her parents would have been devastated if she didn't. After they were both dressed for their first day of cleaning, Andrew announced that it was time for the tour and led Celeste to the end of the hall, declaring that the best place to start was, in fact, the attic. He stopped short as they approached the old pull-down ladder. She followed his gaze and saw it too. There was a padlock on the door. Andrew looked around the hallway briefly before spotting a stool in the corner. He pulled the stool over and sat it underneath the entrance before stepping up onto it. Celeste watched as he inspected the old padlock, a look of dismay darkening his face. Well, the skeleton key definitely won't fit this, he said. But I don't know where the old man kept his keys. Didn't you ever go up there when you lived here? Celeste asked. Nope. He never let me. Always said it was too dangerous. He stepped down off the stool and returned it to the corner. 
He fixed his gaze on the lock and scratched his chin. Come to think of it, I only ever saw the guy go up there once or twice myself. The two of them stared up at the locked door, tantalized by the mystery. Celeste thought about how there was no faster way to pique someone's interest than to put them in an old building with locked doors. But quickly after that thought came, her mind drifted to all the other work that needed to be done around the property, and she decided it wasn't worth wasting time over at that moment. Maybe we'll find the key while we're going through his stuff, she shrugged. Well, not if I find some bolt cutters first. He replied, I don't have the patience to search for a key in this mess. I want to clean it up just enough to sell it to the state. Hell, I can guarantee there's almost nothing in this house worth keeping. I think you might be surprised, babe. Just promise me you'll at least look through things before you throw them away. He looked sullen for a moment, and Celeste could see the gears turning in his head, searching for a protestation worth trying. She smirked with satisfaction as his search proved fruitless, and he gave up. All right, you win, but I don't have to like it. She gave him a quick kiss and a slap on the butt as he continued their tour. The two of them went from room to room in the upstairs hallway, starting with the closet next to the bathroom. Celeste nearly screamed when she opened the door and found it full of spiderwebs. She threw herself back against the opposite wall and demanded that Andrew close it immediately, a plea he responded to by scooping up a small strand of the webbing and waving it in front of her face. A few shouts and punches later, Andrew was rubbing his arm as he led her past the bathroom and his bedroom, all the way to Corvus's door. She held her breath as Andrew pushed it open, letting out a small sigh of relief when it looked nothing like it had looked in her nightmare from the other night. She didn't know what she would have done if her dream had contained a perfect depiction of a room she had never seen before. But it wouldn't have been rational or helpful. She knew that much. The room wasn't nearly as creepy as she had imagined it to be, outside of the fact that the man had died in it a week ago. The furniture was well maintained, if not a little dusty, and nothing stood out of place. Surprisingly, it was a normal looking old man's bedroom. The tour continued as the couple went down the stairs, the cacophonous creaking sending Gracie, who had been sleeping in a sunbeam in the living room, running. They had seen the main floor plenty. There was a living room directly inside the front door, a bathroom off of the living room, a kitchen separated by a low wall, and a mudroom connected to that, which contained the back door. The whole space was a mess, and Andrew and Celeste spent a little bit of time sitting on the couch amongst the clutter in the living room, strategizing how they would tackle the massive project. They decided that their best bet would be to divide their focus between the organizational tasks inside and the moving tasks outside. And of course, Andrew cracked a joke about how excited he was to let her do all the heavy lifting out on the porch. Celeste rolled her eyes at his corniness, but she was secretly past glad he was making jokes again. She loved him with all her heart, and it hurt to see him mourn and grieve for the past week. She knew that the process was far from over, but the progress still brought a smile to her face. Okay, Andrew said as he stood up from the couch they were lounging on. Time to finish one leg of the tour off with the basement. What's leg two? She asked. The barn. We need to clean it out and then search the fields for any tools or equipment Corvus might have left out. Well, maybe the barn can wait until we finish with the house. Celeste suggested as they walked over to the basement door, which sat next to the bathroom. That's fine by me, but I want to go out there and look for a pair of bolt cutters after we wrap this up. Then I'll follow you out to get some soil samples. Together, and with Gracie in tow, 
the couple opened the door and went down into the basement. A rush of cool, dank air flew out from the basement below as Andrew opened the door. He reached over to the wall next to him and flipped a switch. A few seconds passed with no response before a dim yellow light illuminated the stairs in front of him. He led Celeste down into the cramped space. The ceiling was barely seven feet tall, forcing Andrew to duck underneath floor supports and the single bulb that hung down from one of the beams. The basement was unfurnished and nearly empty. The dirt floor and haphazard walls gave Andrew the impression that it was more of a walled-off part of the crawl space than it was a true basement. The only things down there were an ancient water heater and furnace, each one with a few pipes or vents leading away from it and running out beyond the wooden planks that served as walls. Gracie bounded past the two of them at the edge of the stairs and immediately took to sniffing everything. Seemingly aware of the extra crawl space that lay on the other side of the walls, she stared intently, examining a portion of one of them. Andrew and Celeste watched her for a moment before stepping into the middle of the room. Well, he said, this is the basement. Well, this tour has been truly incredible, Celeste deadpanned. Were you expecting more? he asked. Not necessarily more. I guess the dolls just made this place seem worse than it was. For example, she gestured to the water heater and furnace. I really thought the basement would be way creepier than this. A small crack echoed from behind them. Andrew and Celeste both turned to look at each other before slowly pivoting around to see what had produced the sound. Gracie was rolling on the floor, happily wrestling with a long piece of wood that she must have broken off the wall. Both of them let out a small sigh of relief that no real damage had been done. Then they moved forward in unison to pet the cat and to try to get the wood away from her, a maneuver they had attempted countless times. Having been satisfactorily petted in managing to keep a hold of her new toy, Gracie hopped up and strolled away, dragging the lumber back up the stairs with her. The couple watched her go, laughing to themselves about who owned whom. Andrew stooped down to take a look at the board she had broken. The last thing he wanted was to have to spend money to make the home sellable. The walls were made up of thin four foot by four foot sheets of plywood fastened to the support beams of the house. Gracie had broken the corner of the sheet closest to the stairs, revealing a small little opening. Curious. Andrew pulled out his phone and turned on the flashlight before holding it up to the hole and pressing his face in close. There was mostly just dirt and rocks as he passed the light around, but he could have sworn he saw something sitting right up against the wall, just too far to be seen from his vantage point. I think there's something back there. He said, debating whether or not it was worth prying open the wall to find out. Andrew Wilson, Celeste said in the tone that she reserved for when he thought he was trying to mess with her. If you're trying to scare me, I swear to God, I will leave you alone out here to rot. Celeste Wilson, he replied in the tone that he reserved for reassuring her that he was, in fact, being serious. I legitimately think... That something is back there. He stood up and examined the plywood panel, shining a light around until he found where the nail was embedded with their heads, slightly lifted off the board. He looked over at the other boards and saw that their nails were all flush to the wood. Something was back there. These nails aren't fully driven in, Andrew announced. If I had a hammer, I could pry them up. Then it must be your lucky day, Celeste said, handing him a hammer and shrugging at his look of shock. It was under the bottom step. You think Corvus hid something back there? Well, there's only one way to find out, he said as he took the hammer and pulled the clawed end around the shaft of the first nail. 
He rocked the head of the hammer toward the blunt end, lifting the claw up. The nail came up with almost no effort. It had been pulled out multiple times. A small shudder of excitement went through Andrew as he pulled the rest of the nails up. When he first moved into the house as a teen, even through his angst and grief, he always felt excited by the possibility of a secret or two being hidden within the walls of such an old place. Sometimes, if he got home from school before Corvus got in from the fields, he would sneak around the old farmhouse running his hands along the walls and looking behind shelves and dressers for secret passages. He never found any hidden treasures or dark mysteries, but he always held out hope that the property held something beyond belief. Otherwise, what was the point of living on a creepy old farm like that? As the last nail slid out of the plywood and the panel fell away, Andrew came face to face with a childhood dream come true. A plain wooden chest, no bigger than a shoebox, sat in the dirt. Andrew turned, slack-jawed, to look at Celeste, who met his look with confusion. Why is that back there? She asked, taking a step back from the discovery. I have no idea. He answered with more than a little bit of excitement in his voice. Andrew reached out and grabbed the box, pulling it forward to rest on the wall panel that he had just pulled down. He worked with growing fervor, undoing the latch and throwing open the chest. Despite her obvious reservations, Celeste stepped forward to watch over his shoulder the thrill of discovery seemingly outweighing her concern with the box surreptitiously hidden behind a wall in a basement. Andrew knew, logically, that there was every reason to be suspicious of a find like this. But he just couldn't say no to his inner child, who was jumping for joy. So many years after giving up his search for hidden secrets, the house had finally offered one up. The chest only contained one thing. A small leather-bound book. Andrew picked it up and traced his hands down the cover. The leather was real. He turned it over in his hand and took it in. The book was handmade. He could see the individual stitching that held the strips of hide together, each loop perfectly placed and intricately woven. He leafed through the pages and found that the book was halfway full of handwriting. I think it's a journal, he told Celeste. Why would he bury his journal behind a wall in the basement? She asked, like he could possibly have that answer. Darling, if I knew that, do you think I'd be surprised to find it? Let's just go upstairs so we could check this thing out. He stood up and led the way to the main floor scratching Gracie behind the ear as he passed her on his way into the living room. He'd have to remember to give her an extra treat later. He strode over to the couch and sat down, eager to start reading. Celeste joined him with far less enthusiasm. The look of concern still painted on her face. She put a hand out and rested it on the cover of the book, partially holding his hand in the process. Are you sure you want to read this? She asked. Your grandfather hid this thing for a reason. Do you really want to violate his privacy like this? Andrew thought for a moment before saying, Corvus Wilson was an enigma to me my whole life. First, he was the jerk my dad made him out to be. And second, he was the grumpy old man who took me in. And third... He spent the last 20-odd years as a recluse. I've never been able to figure the guy out. And maybe this is my chance to get to know the real him. But what if you don't like what you find? Well, then I'd rather hate the real him than love the fake him. A moment of tense silence passed between the two of them. Each one determined that they knew what was best. Andrew knew Celeste had a point, 
But he also knew that she knew that he had a point too. That meant that it was up to a quiet battle of wills. They had played this unspoken game for years as a couple. Whenever they came to a disagreement with no clear right answer, whoever broke the silence first deferred to the other. It didn't take long for Celeste to concede. Just so you know, I take issue with reading a person's diary after their death. Don't worry, babe. Andrew smirked. Corvus ain't Anne Frank. That poor girl did not deserve millions of people snooping through her pubescent thoughts. And with that, Andrew opened the book and began to read. June 3rd, 1992. I've never kept a journal before, but this is as good of a time as any to start. Eileen told me to leave her alone with all my superstitious hokum. So I'm writing it down here. That old sow never understood it anyhow. But I know what I saw out there. I'm not sure how to describe it. It was all tattered and gaunt, like a mummy losing its wraps. I've seen it out in the woods behind the house a few times. Just small looks here and there while I was out hunting. But something big happened last night that made me write this all down. You see... It saw me. Well, I was upstairs looking out the windows before bed when I saw it. The thing was closer to the house than ever before. It was right at the edge of the trees, just staring at the farmhouse. I was watching it when it lifted its head and looked me straight in the eye. Well, we stood like that for a little while. I was looking at it, and it was looking right back at me. It put a hand on its stomach like it was hungry, then it just turned and went back into the woods. Well, I don't know what it was, but I sure need to find out. My parents came over here from the motherland, and my mama told me all about the fair folk. Their nature spirits as old as the world itself. They keep to themselves mostly, but if one of them notices you, then you best start paying respects. I think what I saw could have been one of them. Maybe it came over from the old world. Or maybe they just live here too. And I don't think that matters much. The crops haven't been doing too well. Maybe that's because of that thing. It looked right at me. Maybe. It wants something. Okay, I've heard enough. Celeste said, getting up and walking away from the couch. What do you mean? Andrew whined. Well, it's sad enough that he was losing his mind like that. Do we really need to read through his descent into madness? We don't have to, but I sure would like to. Like I said, good or bad, I want to know more about him. Well, then you could count me out of the creepy book readings. She took her jacket off the coat rack by the door and put it on before picking up her sampling kit. She had had her fill of creepiness the past few days, and was not looking to experience any more. You want to walk with me out to the field? What are you going out to the field for? I want to get some soil samples from the farm in the woods before we officially get to work, she said. He didn't seem overly interested in her offer and Celeste didn't want to walk out there all by herself after what they had just read. So she decided to sweeten the pot a bit. You could check the barn for some bolt cutters. The idea of further exploration into his grandfather seemed to do the trick. Andrew set the journal down on the coffee table and got up as well. He threw his jacket on and opened the door, calling out to Gracie that they'd be back soon. The cat yawned and rolled over as they closed the door and left. Gravel crunched underfoot as Andrew and Celeste walked hand in hand down the driveway. It was the middle of the day, but the thick tangle of branches above them made it seem as if it was already dusk. Trudging through the gloom, a small chill went across the back of Celeste's neck. She kept looking around and behind them as they walked. It's kind of... Creepy out here, isn't it? 
Andrew asked, reading her mind. You could say that again. Well, it's kind of creepy out here, isn't it? You're an idiot, she said through her smile. For real though, I always hated the walk to and from the field when I lived here. The trees and the shadows and the wind that always seemed to blow through here. It's just creepy. He chuckled a little. Well, I used to sprint back to the house when it was getting dark. Celeste laughed a bit at the image of teenage Andrew running up the driveway in fear, especially since she would have done the same thing. As she laughed, she felt a small tightness in her chest and realized that she had forgotten to use her inhaler the night before. She would need to remember to use it before bed that night. They walked a little bit further in silence, just taking in the day. Eventually, Celeste spoke up. What do you think he actually saw? She asked. Well, I thought you weren't interested in the ravings of a madman. Andrew replied, saying the last part of his sentence like a horror TV show host. She shoved him slightly with her elbow. I'm not. I just can't help but speculate what the old guy might have seen. Well, you want to know what I think? A stupid grin spread across his face. I think he actually saw a mummy. She could not have rolled her eyes hard enough. Forget what I asked. Andrew took a moment to savor his world-class wit before saying, For real though, he was probably just seeing things. Although I will say, that line calling Grandma Eileen a sow was the most I'd heard him talk about her. Really? Celeste asked. She thought back to what Jax had told her at the pharmacy the day before, and the conversation she and Andrew had had that night about it. Yep. I mean, the man's wife disappears without a trace one day, and the whole town thinks that he did it. I don't blame him for keeping his mouth shut. I had to learn about it from the kids at school. I'm so sorry, Andrew. She squeezed his hand. Thank you, but I promise I'm okay. The branches above them thinned out as they got to the road, and the couple crossed over into the field. I just wish he could have gotten some closure with whatever happened to her. Celeste watched as Andrew walked off to the left, heading toward the barn. Then she went out into the middle of the field. She picked up a random row of dirt and stooped down to collect samples. The heat of the midday sun was smothered by the October chill, and Celeste shivered a bit as she surveyed the farmland. It was completely unremarkable, as far as she could tell. Rows of dirt stretched off into the distance, empty after the harvest. And the only outstanding features of the land were a few scarecrows here and there, and the old barn that somehow managed to be in even worse shape than the farmhouse. Looking at the weathered and worn scarecrows keeping watch over the field, Celeste couldn't help but wonder if Corvus wasn't just hallucinating them in his old age. After all, the mind could play some powerful tricks on you under the right circumstances. Having collected her sample, Celeste stood back up and set her sights on the woods. She walked back across the road and up the driveway to the house, fighting the impulse to run the length of it like Andrew used to. She had to admit, even in the middle of the afternoon, that the driveway was monumentally creepy. She walked up past the farmhouse and into the woods behind it, looking to get her second set of soil samples. Leaves crunched underfoot as Celeste searched for the perfect patch of dirt, kicking away swaths of orange, yellow, and red as she did. She found a small clearing and decided to take her sample there. A crescent of impenetrable briar bushes surrounded the back half of the field, blocking her view of what lay beyond. The thick tangle also blocked out the cool wind that had been blowing the whole time they were outside though, so she was fine with the sacrificed visibility. Of course, 
Celeste wasn't about to let her expedition pass without savoring the small joys of the outdoors. For all of her education and research, what kept her coming back to work day after day was her love for nature. After scooping leaves out of the way to clear a patch of earth, she gathered them into giant armfuls before throwing them into the air and dancing as they fell. Her head tilted up to the sky as she did, and she soaked up the sunlight on her skin. After playing in the leaves for a little longer, savoring her small escape from the weight of reality back at the farmhouse, Celeste finally stooped down to take her sample. She had been interested for some time in the impacts of farming on soil, and she was looking for ways that she could apply that information to conservation efforts. By taking some samples from the farm in the woods, she could compare how farming practices impacted that area specifically, which could yield some promising results for her research. Her mind wandered as she worked, drifting down to the worlds held within the dirt. Many people thought of Celeste's work as boring, but she could never understand that. Millions and millions of insects and microorganisms called the soil their home, and she was fascinated by every one of them. The soil was the bedrock of every ecosystem, allowing plants to grow and consuming living things after they died. And within that bedrock was a whole other ecosystem that made it all happen. Weirdly, Celeste connected to the dirt. The ground was full of behind-the-scenes workers, making the flashy surface ecosystem possible, but getting almost no credit. Yet, it didn't need credit, and didn't ask for it. The soil was just happy to play its part in a thriving world. People who thought that was boring simply didn't have enough vision or imagination to see just how exciting it was. The sound of a twig snapping somewhere in front of her pulled Celeste out of her thoughts. Had her dancing attracted a curious animal, she froze and listened. Nothing. Slowly, she lifted her head and stood up, scanning the area around her. The feeling of being watched grew stronger by the moment as Celeste looked for the source of the sound. The bramble thicket that had been sheltering her from the wind suddenly felt a lot less comforting, and Celeste felt incredibly exposed as she stood alone in the clearing. Something was on the other side of that wall. A slight movement caught her attention, and she snapped her head to the side to see what it was. A pair of antlers poked over the thick tangle of bushes, holding still now that it had been caught. Celeste let out a sigh of relief. It was just a deer. She chastised herself for being so skittish. It was foolish to get that worked up over nothing, and she knew it was because of Corvus's stupid old journal. She watched the horn slowly move behind the bush, heading deeper into the forest while still keeping an eye on her. After it was clear the animal was walking away from the clearing, Celeste took a deep breath and stooped down to pick up her things before heading back to the farmhouse. Another rush of that strange nostalgia hit Andrew as he pushed open the barn door and stepped inside. It was in far worse condition than the house, with rot in multiple places and even a hole developing in the ceiling. Corvus must have been having a hard time keeping up with maintenance in his old age. Outside of the damage and disrepair, the interior was almost exactly how Andrew remembered it. Corvus's old tractor sat in the middle of the barn and was the only thing in the room that was still in good condition. That fact didn't surprise Andrew in the slightest, and he chuckled as he thought back on all the times that he had begged his grandfather to drive the tractor, only to be met with a resounding no. He often joked during his time on the farm that Corvus loved the tractor more than he loved him, an assertion that the old man never once denied. 
Maybe he would take a joyride with it while he was here. Of course, driving his grandfather's tractor may have been the fastest way to get haunted by his ghost. Corvus didn't let Andrew be anywhere near the field while he was driving it. He always said it was too dangerous. Off to the side of the room, the wall of tools and the workbench were all cluttered and messy. Most of the equipment had gathered an almost impressive amount of rust, another sign that maintenance work was being shirked, and wasn't certain yet whether it was because of forgetfulness or loss of ability. He walked over to the pile of tools and started gingerly digging, careful to avoid the myriad sharp and rusted edges that threatened to give him tetanus. He didn't want to make the trip to the hospital for something as foolish as a cut. He spent the next ten minutes searching the whole area, sifting through all sorts of miscellaneous tools and equipment. Much to his frustration, though, there was no sign of his coveted prize. What kind of farmer doesn't have bolt cutters? He muttered under his breath as he tossed the last tool back on the bench. The only upside to his failed search was that Andrew now knew that the only thing of value in the entire barn was the tractor, which could still fetch a pretty penny at an estate auction. He leaned against the workbench and wondered where his grandfather might have hidden those bolt cutters. He could have sworn that Corvus had a pair back in the day, but any number of things could have happened to them in the intervening years. He was about to give up and leave when he noticed the ladder in the corner that led up to the loft. How had he forgotten about the loft? He had made plenty of trips up and down that ladder in his youth, hauling hay for the cattle back when Corvus still had some. It was a long shot for sure, but Andrew honestly had no idea what could have been going through his grandfather's mind in recent years. So, anything was possible. Andrew crossed the hay-strewn floor to get a better look at the rickety ladder, patting the old tractor as he passed. The wood was dry and cracked with age, looking more and more brittle the closer he got to it. A test pull proved that at least one rung wouldn't disintegrate under his weight, so he put a foot on the bottom rung and stepped up. There was a definite groan and a slight bowing in the middle as Andrew stepped up, but the ladder held under his weight. He cautiously brought his other foot up and placed it on the next rung, which stayed in place as well. Gaining confidence in the old ladder's durability, Andrew began to pick up the pace. He reached the top quickly and couldn't believe what he saw. Deer mounts and skulls littered the floor of the loft, forming grotesque piles of haphazardly stacked heads. Andrew pulled himself onto the platform and stared slack-jawed at the scene before him. There was no blood to be seen. All the mounts and skulls were expertly cleaned and prepared, and even the taxidermy was well done on the would-be trophies. After the initial shock of the fine faded, one detail sprung forward that somehow unsettled Andrew even more. The antlers were missing. Not a single head in the entire cranial menagerie belonged to a female deer. And yet, not a single one had antlers either. He picked up a skull to get a closer look and found that they had been sawed off with clean, precise cuts. A flurry of questions swirled around Andrew's mind as he tried to make sense of what he had just found. Had Corvus started selling deer antlers on the side? But why would he keep the heads if he was? Was his condition more serious than Andrew had thought? Did Corvus have dementia that no one knew about? He started back down the ladder in a tizzy. He didn't know what to do or think and it was becoming clearer by the hour that he knew nothing about his grandfather, and that he may have never really known him. Andrew was so lost in his thoughts as he climbed down that he missed a step. 
His heart flew into his throat as he started to fall, and his hand shot out to grab a hold of the rung in front of him. Pain seared through his shoulder when he jerked to a stop, and he hung there for a moment. A loud crack rang out in the silent barn as the rung he held onto snapped, and Andrew fell 15 feet down to the earth below, landing on his right arm. A second crack could be heard within Andrew's forearm when he landed, and he cried out, scattering a small flock of crows that had landed outside. His vision blurred from the pain, and Andrew choked out a small sob before his eyes shut and his head slumped to the ground. Chapter 7 Bright white light pulled Andrew back to consciousness. He had been in the deepest sleep having the strangest dream. Skeletal deer paraded around him in the barn, trotting jauntily as they went. The circle tightened around him with each passing rotation, and the deer began to move faster and faster. Their bodies blurred together as they gained speed until they were a blazing white halo around him. Opening his eyes, Andrew saw that halo of light was a literal fluorescent light on the ceiling. He blinked slowly and squinted as he lifted his head. He was laying in a hospital bed, clothed in one of those gowns that let your butt hang out. Even though his back was completely covered, Andrew immediately felt naked. Why was he in the hospital? A familiar weight landed on his left hand, and Andrew turned his head to see his wife sitting in a chair by the bed, her arm outstretched to take his hand. A smile spread across his face, supplanting the look of confusion that had previously been there. Andrew tried to sit up, but a jolt of pain shot through his right shoulder, making his vision go blurry for a moment. Oh, babe, no. Celeste stood up and helped ease Andrew back down, his head ringing from the pain. What happened? He asked as his head dropped back to rest on the pillow. You fell off the loft in the barn, she explained, running her fingers through his hair and looking worried. I had to drive the car through the field to get you because you were just too heavy for me to carry you back to the house. The memory of the incident flooded back into Andrew's mind, souring his stomach. He remembered the piles upon piles of those skulls and mounts, which explained his strange dream. Trying to parse through the images in his head to figure out what was real and what was a dream was proving to be exceptionally difficult with how fuzzy the pain had made everything. Thankfully, the doctor came in and interrupted his wondering. The old man had to be at least in his seventies. Bifocal glasses sat low on the bridge of his nose, and liver spots dotted his bald head. But the man carried himself like a professional, which eased Andrew's age-related concerns. He had kind eyes and a soft smile as he addressed Andrew. Good evening, Mr. Wilson, the old doctor said as he sat his clipboard down on the counter by the wall and approached the bed. How are you feeling? Well, like uh, I got hit by a bus, Andrew replied. Well, you're not too far off there, son. You see, a fall like that can do an awful lot of damage. He gestured to Celeste. It's a good thing your girl here found you so fast. Andrew could feel his wife rolling her eyes without having to even look in her direction. Having grown up in the South, Celeste had her fill of being someone's girl from a very young age. People often mistook her quiet nature to mean that she was an obedient Southern belle, but they couldn't be further from the truth. Andrew just hoped she wouldn't let the old man have it while he still had the power to give him painkillers. Doctor, she said in her best, most acquiescent voice, would you please tell my husband what happened to him? Next, it was Andrew's turn to roll his eyes. Celeste may not have been the shrinking violet everyone assumed her to be, but that didn't mean she didn't know how to play the part. 
Oh, sure, absolutely, ma'am, he said cheerfully, her sarcasm flying right over his bald head. He turned his attention back to Andrew. Well, you got banged up pretty good out there. You tore your rotator cuff and you broke your ulna in the fall, along with getting a mild concussion. Well, you're looking about six weeks for the bone to heal and probably four to six months for the rotator cuff to get back up to snuff. Andrew looked down in awe at his sling. That was a lot of damage. An off-white cast wrapped around his forearm, going from thumb to elbow, and his whole arm was cradled in a light blue sling that held it to his stomach. He tried to say something witty in response, but all that came out was, Wow. Well, wow indeed, young man. You're lucky that's all there is. But if you take the time to let everything heal, you'll be back to normal by next summer. After pausing for a moment for questions, the doctor walked back to the counter and picked up his clipboard. I'm going to get you guys ready for your discharge. You can pick up some over-the-counter pain meds at the pharmacy in town, but I don't think you'll need anything stronger. You kids have a good night now. Andrew and Celeste made eyes at each other as the man left, both holding their tongues until the door shut. As soon as it clicked and they heard his footsteps walking by, they were off to the races. Can you believe that guy? Celeste asked, slumping over as she let her dainty facade drop. <laughs> I know, Andrew replied with glee. Who does he think he is? Calling us kids. I'm 40 years old. Celeste fluttered her eyelashes and struck a delicate pose. Maybe... He was talking about how youthful and lovely I am. Well, give it a few years, Pumpkin. You'll be old and decrepit like me soon enough. The two of them laughed together for a few more minutes, mocking the doctor more than he deserved. A nurse, confused by their laughter, came in and helped Andrew get out of bed and put on his clothes while Celeste jokingly looked him up and down and fanned herself. He winked at her and thought about how she could make him smile through the worst of times. After the two of them were officially checked out, they walked out to the car together. Celeste helped Andrew get in and get his seatbelt on before going around and getting in the driver's seat. The two of them chatted as they drove the few minutes it took to get to the pharmacy. So, what should we do now that I'm out of commission? Andrew asked. Celeste let out a sigh and shrugged. I don't know. Taking care of you is more important than the house, so maybe we should sort through what we still can and just sell the rest with the estate. Andrew mulled that over for a minute while quietly cursing his clumsiness. If he hadn't gotten spooked and lost his grip, then the two of them wouldn't need to cut their losses and give up on the house so soon. But maybe that was for the better. He doubted that any of Corvus's stuff was worth very much, and he didn't have a sentimental connection to any of it either. At that point, Andrew was far more driven by his desire to understand his grandfather than he was by any concern for profits or property values. I think that's a good idea, he said after a moment. Let's just focus on the smaller things and let the auction people figure out what to do with all this big junk. She flashed a smile at him. It sounds good to me. They pulled into the pharmacy parking lot and went inside, the bell above the door tinkling with glee. Celeste bowed as she opened the door for Andrew, and Jax, who was sweeping the floor, looked up at the two of them as they walked in. His normal grin morphed into a scowl when he noticed Andrew's arm. Jax had always been a mother bear type of friend, and Andrew could already tell that he had drawn some ire due to his injury. Now what did you go and do to yourself? Jax scolded him. Andrew raised his good arm and bowed his head in a gesture of sheepish surrender. I fell off the ladder in the barn. Jax turned his attention to Celeste and said, Well then, why did you let him do that? 
Now it was her turn to raise her arms. I wasn't there. He did it all by himself. Jack stepped forward and met Andrew with a hug, carefully avoiding his shoulder. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Well, I take it you want some drugs. Absolutely. The three of them went over to the register and Jacks rang them up a bottle of acetaminophen, talking as he did. So, is this going to impact your time frame for being here? He asked. Maybe convenience you to stay a little longer? As much as I'd like to get some more time with you, well, I'm afraid we're probably going to leave earlier than we thought. There's not much of any value on the property as far as we can tell, and this injury means that there's even less we could do around the place anyway. Well, yeah, makes sense. Jax looked crestfallen as he handed Celeste the small bag with the medicine in it. She took it and the receipt, on which he had drawn a small smiley face. Even getting bad news, Jax was being friendly. Andrew felt bad for the guy. It couldn't have been easy on him to still live in Dry Creek. He had never been the most well-known or well-liked guy in school, and most of the people he knew from back in the day had either skipped town or were complete burnouts. Andrew could remember how often his friend had lamented feeling stuck during their late-night talks when they were teens, and that made this moment so much worse. He could only imagine how lonely Jax must have felt all of those years, and it killed him to thrust his friend back into that loneliness so soon. Hey, don't worry though, Andrew tried to sound upbeat. We'll just have you come over Friday night so that we can all hang out. You can see the house one last time before we sell it, and then you know you could always make the trip up to Massachusetts to visit us. Jax perked up at that. But you know, I think I'd like a trip up to New England. I'd never seen it before. Well, then we'll make it happen, Celeste chimed in. With their plans made for that Friday, Andrew and Celeste left the pharmacy together. Hey, pumpkin? Andrew broke the silence of their walk to the car. Yeah? Since we're in town, do you think we could make a quick stop before we head back? Chapter 8 Celeste walked into the kitchen and set the brand new bolt cutters down on the table before opening up the pain pills for Andrew. He had convinced her to swing by the local hardware store on their way back to the house. The two of them swooped in right before it closed like Bonnie and an injured Clyde, buying the best pair of bolt cutters they had. Her partner in crime had already made his way up the stairs to get ready for bed, while she got him a glass of water to take his medicine with. She felt horrible about what had happened, but thinking back over the events of the day, Celeste was impressed with her intuition. After getting back to the farmhouse from her walk and finding it empty, she felt in her gut that something was wrong and hopped in the car. Thankfully, her gut was right in that instance, because she had found Andrew laying unconscious on the ground in the barn. It had taken all of her might to lift his dead weight into the passenger seat. Andrew was not a small man, and the exertion had left her drained after the adrenaline wore off. Making her way up the stairs with the water in one hand and the pill bottle in the other, Celeste found herself smiling as she heard Andrew softly humming to himself while he brushed his teeth in the bathroom. Even through her exhaustion, she felt her heart swell a little bit with love and admiration for the man she had married. After all that they had been through that day, Andrew still had it in him to hum a little tune as he got ready for bed. She snuck up behind him in the bathroom and watched him smile in the mirror as she wrapped her arms around his chest. Bliss came at the strangest of times. You ready for bed? She asked as they swayed back and forth slightly. Absolutely, he replied with a mouth full of toothpaste, grinning at her reaction as it spilled down his chin. You're a man-child, she said through her laughter. He spat in the sink before saying, Yeah, but I'm your man-child. She rolled her eyes and handed him the pill and the glass. 
Then come on, man-child of mine. Let's get you tucked into bed. Celeste helped Andrew get out of his clothes, which was no small task with his injuries. After a few painful minutes of wrestling with the sling and his shirt, the two of them finally managed to undress him. You know, she said after triumphantly throwing his shirt across the room into the dirty clothes pile and slumping onto the bed. I've never had to work that hard to get your clothes off before. <laughs> yeah. He laughed. They normally just find their way to the floor on their own. They kissed goodnight and Celeste turned off the lamp before walking back to the bathroom to get herself ready for bed. She got the new inhaler out of its packaging and took a long puff of it, marveling at the difference it was already making. Her asthma was never all that bad, so she found it easy to forget what it felt like to breathe normally if she couldn't have her inhaler. With clear lungs and heavy eyes, Celeste brushed her teeth and washed her face to clean the day off. It had been long and strange and stressful all at once, starting with finding that creepy journal and ending with a trip to the emergency room. Celeste found herself praying that the rest of their time in the farmhouse would be less stressful. By the time she had turned off the lights and returned to the bedroom, Andrew was fast asleep. She openly envied his ability to fall asleep and stay asleep at the drop of the hat. The man had slept through every storm and every nightmare that had kept her awake. If Celeste had to make a list of things she didn't like about her husband, his aptitude for sleeping whenever and wherever he wanted would be at the top of the list. She pulled back the sheet before crawling into bed, happy to be finally laying down. She smiled softly as she waited for sleep to come, and she waited and kept waiting. After several minutes of tossing and turning, begging for sleep to show itself, Celeste felt the strange sort of lightheadedness overtake her. It was as if the air in the house had shifted. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end as she laid there in silence. And then, the rattling started. It was soft and slow at first, a strange sort of jangling could be heard in the hall. Celeste's breath caught in her throat. What was making that sound? The woozy feeling in her head got worse as she reached an arm back behind her to grab a hold of Andrew's hip. She shook him quietly and was met with a snore. The darkness in the room seemed to intensify, threatening to blot out the moonlight shining in through the window as the rattling quietly continued outside the bedroom. After a few more failed attempts to rouse her husband, Celeste took a deep breath and slowly slipped out of bed. The cowardly half of her mind that never forgot horror movies screamed at her to stop and to lay back down, but the scientific half of her mind needed an answer, and curiosity won the day. The jangling sound grew louder as Celeste crept toward the bedroom door certain that she was making a mistake. She stopped and leaned against the wall to steady herself, the static in her brain making it harder and harder to think straight. Celeste steeled herself and slowly poked her head around the corner to find the hallway empty, and a look of confusion spread across her face as the rattling carried on, coming from somewhere near the end of the hall. Using the light from the window to guide her, Celeste slowly approached the back wall, her heart beating in her head as she did. As she neared the end of the hallway, she finally realized where the sound was coming from. Through the dim light, Celeste could see the attic door on the ceiling shaking softly against the padlock, as if something on the inside wanted to get out. Her body moving against her better judgment, Celeste found herself walking forward until she stood directly under the entrance to the attic. When she got there, the door fell still. Celeste gazed up at the padlock as it swayed quietly and felt strangely detached from reality as if she were watching a movie 
rather than experiencing that moment herself. All of the fear and dizziness seemed to leave her at once as she watched the lock come to a stop. It was with that same odd detachment that she noticed movement outside the window. A woman stood in the center of the backyard, her white dress glowing softly in the dim moonlight. A pair of antlers protruded from her head at unnatural angles, just a few inches above her ears, with trails of dried up blood seemingly flowing from them. Her hair was wild, and she was covered in so much grime that Celeste couldn't tell where the blood met the dirt. The horned girl stood still for a moment before slowly lifting her head to look at Celeste, who could only stare back. Celeste could hear the quiet rattling of the attic door resume somewhere miles away, but found herself unable to focus on anything other than the woman in the yard. She watched in a daze as the woman's mouth silently opened wide and her head started trembling. Then, all at once, Celeste was pulled back into her body. The attic door above her was shaking so hard that she feared it might break the padlock, and she swore she could hear something pounding on it from above. The horned woman's anguished scream finally reached her ears, and Celeste found herself screaming in return. She turned and ran from the window, dashing underneath the attic door and taking off down the hall. Then she dove into bed and hid under the covers, pulling herself as close to Andrew as possible. The screaming and rattling persisted as Celeste squeezed her eyes shut and prayed for it all to end. Celeste woke up the next morning in that same position. She was curled up underneath the blanket with her face buried in Andrew's back, hearing nothing but a bird singing outside. She poked her head up above the covers and squinted in the morning light. Andrew was still sound asleep, not even stirring as Celeste got up and walked out to use the bathroom. It was unusual for her to be up before him, but she figured that his exhaustion and her nightmare were equally good reasons for that to be the case that morning. After all, it was a nightmare, right? Celeste replayed the events of the night over and over in her head as she brushed her teeth and got dressed, stopping in the hallway just long enough to cast a glance down the hall toward the window. But thinking back through it all, she decided that it simply had to have been a nightmare and that there was no way any of it could have been real. Just to make sure though, Celeste walked down the end of the hall and examined the padlock. There was no sign of any strain or damage on it, or the attic door, which absolutely would have been there if something were shaking it like that. Next, she stepped over and looked out the window, satisfied with the complete and utter lack of any deer women. Now completely confident in her assertion that it was all just a bad dream, Celeste resolved to put it behind herself and go make breakfast. Andrew groggily came down the stairs as she was finishing up cooking the bacon, giving her a quick kiss as he passed by her on his way to the coffee maker. How do you feel this morning? She asked, watching him clumsily try to make his morning coffee with his left hand. Oh, I slept like the dead, he replied. I don't think anything could have woken me up last night. Celeste's hand tightened on the fork she was using to turn the strips of bacon on the stove. That had to be a coincidence, right? Either way, she had decided that she would put it behind her, and that was the end of the story. Andrew had enough on his plate as it was, and she was determined not to add to it with her silly dreams. I'm glad to hear it, she said after only the slightest pause moving the last piece of bacon onto a plate and turning off the stove. The two of them sat down to eat, both seemingly preoccupied. Celeste wondered what was going through his head. She hated how much had happened to him in such a short time. Losing his grandfather and wrecking his right arm in less than two weeks must have been awful. She racked her brain trying to think of a way to brighten his morning. 
After a few minutes of eating in silence, it hit her. How about I bust open that attic door after breakfast? She asked. A small smile appeared on Andrew's face and he replied, Well, you know, I think that'd be excellent. I've been wondering what was up there for years. After they finished their meal, Celeste picked up the bolt cutters and led Andrew back up the stairs and down the hall. She grabbed the same stool that she had used the day before and pulled it over underneath the door. She hesitated for a moment before climbing up, images flashing through her mind of the door violently shaking in the night. She then silently reassured herself that it was all just a dream, before stepping up onto the stool and lifting the bolt cutters to the padlock. Celeste's lack of brute strength made the job difficult for her to accomplish, so she just had to resort to using small, continuous motions to saw the lock. After several minutes of pinching and prying, loosening and tightening, the padlock finally fell to the floor below with a satisfying clang. Celeste did a small little dance, losing her balance in the process. Andrew had to grab her with his good arm to help stabilize her. Careful there, babe, he said. Sorry, she grinned sheepishly. I'm just really proud of myself. Yeah, you're allowed to be proud, but we both can't break an arm. Celeste handed Andrew the bolt cutters. Their once smooth blades now covered in chips and burrs and felt a small pang of guilt for ruining their new tool. Andrew, seemingly reading her mind, said, Don't worry, we only need them for this. Good, because I doubt they'll be good for much else after what I just put them through. Bolstered by her success, Celeste turned her focus back to the attic door. She reached up and took a hold of the latch before taking a deep breath and pulling. She flinched slightly as the panel shifted and the stairs started lowering. A little bit surprised that nothing flew out and attacked her. She stepped down off the stool and let the stairs completely unfold. After you she said to Andrew, secretly too scared to lead the way. You're too kind, he replied as he grabbed a hold of the flimsy old railing and started up the stairs. Celeste watched him go, silently chastising herself for letting a nightmare make her so jumpy. She took a deep breath and reminded herself that nothing up there could be as scary as whatever her imagination could cook up. Uh, babe? Andrew called down from the top of the stairs, ruining her theory. You're not going to like what's up here. Andrew Wilson, if this is a prank, she began as she followed him up the steps, but stopped as soon as she caught her first glimpse of the attic. He stood next to her, stoically taking in the scene. Not a prank. This is definitely not a prank. Paintings of various sizes took up most of the space, leaning and hanging on every trunk and chest in sight. They were all in slightly different styles and done with slightly different colors, but they all showed the same grotesque scene. A dark and gaunt figure covered in blood stood tall and menacing in each, wrapped head to toe in tattered clothes and with a tangle of dark rope-like hair covering its eyes. And accompanying the figure in each painting was a woman in a white dress. Sometimes she was screaming, other times she was dead and covered in blood. The only consistent details about her were the white dress and a strange set of antlers protruding from her head. Celeste's stomach turned as she took in the dozens and dozens of pictures, each one unnerving in its unique way. Something inside her snapped as she looked at them. I can't do this, she said miles away. What? he asked. I just can't. She turned and went down the rickety stairs as quickly as possible. Celeste, wait! Andrew called out as she hit the hallway floor, having descended halfway down the stairs. Are you okay? No, absolutely not, 
She suddenly rounded on him. Her shock is replaced with fury. This house gets creepier by the minute, and I'm not about to spend another second of my time in the attic surrounded by those disgusting paintings. I'll be downstairs if you need me. And with that, Celeste stormed off down the hall, presumably leaving Andrew stunned by her sudden outburst. She knew she would regret speaking to him like that later, but at that moment, she didn't care. She just needed out of that attic. As she rounded the corner to go down the stairs, Celeste delivered her ultimatum. I want out of this house by the end of the week. Chapter 9 Andrew watched in stunned silence as Celeste rounded the corner and went down the stairs. After an embarrassingly long moment of staring blankly at the wall at the end of the hallway, he shook out of it and went back into the attic. It wasn't like Celeste to explode on him like that, but he also knew that it was better to give her space to cool off than to follow her and press the subject. He didn't blame her for being so upset. As he slowly walked across the room, examining each painting, he became more and more unsettled. No two paintings were exactly alike. The brushwork was often frenetic, zigzagging and swiping in strange directions as it formed the dark shape of its subject. Overall, the paintings were sloppily made, which made them even creepier and even more likely to have been made by Corvus himself. There was another figure depicted in most of the portraits as well, what seemed to be a young woman in a white dress. Her hair color could change from picture to picture, but she was always in that dress, and she always had some strange kind of crown on her head. It almost looked to Andrew like a set of antlers. He finished looking at the paintings and turned his attention to the rest of the attic. It was long and narrow, spanning the entire length of the farmhouse. Sunbeams streamed in through a small window facing the backyard, reflecting off of thousands of dust particles in the air. Old chests and cardboard boxes were stacked floor to ceiling along the sides, leaving only a narrow walkway, which was of course lined with paintings of Corvus's grotesque muse. Andrew moved a few of the portraits out of the way and opened one of the boxes, shaking off dust and cobwebs as he did. Inside the box was a series of drab nightgowns and dresses that must have belonged to his grandmother. Corvus had never seemed like the sentimental type to Andrew, but he was also standing in the middle of an attic he had never been allowed to enter, and looking at a collection of incredibly disturbing paintings. So... He was willing to concede that he might not have known his grandfather very well at all. Seems like Corvus never got rid of anything, he said to himself as he cracked open another box and found more of Eileen's things. As he tallied it, his grandfather had kept a wraparound porch of furniture and farming equipment, a bedroom of porcelain dolls, a barn loft of deer heads, in an attic full of paintings and boxes. Whoever he thought his grandfather was, it was becoming increasingly clear to Andrew that he didn't know him at all, and Celeste's declaration that they were leaving by the end of the week left him with only a few more days to see what he could learn about the man. He decided that it was time to read more of the journal. Maybe that would give him some insight. To Corvus. As Andrew walked back across the attic towards the stairs, a glimpse of white among the browns and grays caught his attention. It was black behind a few stacks of heavy boxes, but Andrew managed to push them out of the way with just his good arm and hips. The last tower slid away with relative ease, revealing an old dress form with a moth-eaten wedding veil sitting atop the figure. Confused, Andrew scanned the floor for any sign of where the dress itself may have fallen, but he couldn't find anything. Of all the junk in the house that might have been worth keeping, of course, it was his grandmother's vintage wedding dress that was nowhere to be seen. 
He sighed and picked up the form, pulling it out and carrying it with him as he went to the stairs. At the very least, he could let what was left of the veil be on display. He had never met his grandmother, but he figured she would have appreciated the thought. He set the dress form down next to the window near the stairs, but out of sight from the hallway below. The last thing he wanted was for Celeste to get up in the middle of the night and see a white figure in the attic. Their marriage might have never recovered if that had happened. Andrew made his way downstairs and did a quick scan to see where Celeste was. Seeing her through the kitchen window on the back porch, he went to the door and poked his head out. Hey you, he said. I get it if you still need more space, so I'm just here to let you know that I'm fine with leaving at the end of the week. Celeste had been in deep thought and seemed caught off guard by both his presence and his statement. Despite her apparent surprise, her eyes softened when she saw him. Are you sure? She asked. Absolutely. She put down the indiscernible piece of junk she was holding, walked over, and threw her arms around him. Listen, I'm sorry for yelling at you earlier, she said with her face buried in his chest. We could stay longer if you need to. Are you kidding me? He pulled back and grinned down at her. This place is mega creepy, and I want out of here as soon as possible. She smiled back up at him before giving him a quick kiss. I'm gonna go inside and read Corvus's journal for a bit, he said. Let me know if you need any help. Will do, she said with a small salute. Andrew made his way back through the kitchen and into the living room, stealing a small glance at his wife through the window as he did. Sitting down on the porch, he picked up the leather-bound book and opened it up. The first thing Andrew learned as he started reading through the journal again was that most of his grandfather's thoughts were not very exciting. A majority of the entries simply described the weather and what he had eaten that day. There were a handful of passages about how the crops weren't doing well, and more than a few about how Eileen was such a cow. From the way the journal read, Andrew's grandparents seemed to be stuck in a rather loveless marriage. And while that explained why her dress was gone and her stuff was boxed up and out of sight, it also had the unfortunate side effect of making it seem like Corvus might have been responsible for Eileen's disappearance all those years ago. There wasn't any evidence of him doing anything wrong yet, but she had gone missing in the fall of 92, and the entries were still in the summer so there was plenty of time for something to go wrong. As much as Andrew hoped that he wouldn't find a confession of murder written somewhere in those pages, he was bored enough by most of the entries that he might have welcomed the change. While most of the pages were full of idle ramblings about crop yields and soup for dinner, Andrew occasionally stumbled upon a passage with something a little more exciting. He dog-eared the interesting pages as he read. Corvus described further sightings of the thing in the woods, with the skill and attention to detail of a lifelong hunter. It walked like a man, but moved through the forest like an animal, hiding as often as possible, and moving through the clearings with surprising speed. He saw it now and then for a few months, sometimes out in the woods but usually at the edge of the backyard as it stared up through the window at him. And every time it visited the house at night, it would put a hand on its stomach like it was hungry. Corvus took to calling it the ragged on account of its filthy and tattered appearance. After a couple of months of visits from ragged, Andrew's grandfather had decided to reach out. Chapter 10 August 21st, 1992 I left a bowl of milk out for Ragged last night. Eileen called me an old fool. After all the times he's visited me, I figured there was something he wanted. So I gave him an offering. 
It's something my mama taught me about the fair folk. If you leave them an offering of milk or fresh butter, they'll leave you be, keep you safe. Maybe he'll help my crops get better next year. Maybe he caused this year's drought. August 22nd, 1992. He didn't like it. When I went to check the offering this morning, I found the bowl shattered on the ground. Eileen is furious with me for breaking her bowl, and she won't listen to me when I tell her that I didn't do it. The ragged must not be like the old world fay. Maybe he wants something different. I'm going to leave him some meat tonight. I don't know anybody who can turn down a good cut of beef. August 23rd, 1992. Well, that did the trick. I went out this morning to check on the offering. And wouldn't you know it, it was all gone. And on top of it, I could prove it was him that ate it. He left me a sign that he liked it. When I went out to the spot where I left the meat, in its place I found a group of sticks and rocks arranged in a smiley face. Now, of course, Eileen wouldn't listen when I tried to tell her about it. She thinks I'm going crazy. My grateful cow. She might just ruin this for the both of us if Ragged hears her talking that way about him. Celeste's mind wandered as she slowly sifted through the piles of junk on the back porch, looking for anything that might be worth keeping. So far, she hadn't found a single thing worth holding on to out there. Not that it surprised her. The more she thought about it, the more she realized that she and Andrew both knew that there was nothing of value on the property. Yet, they decided to keep looking anyway. She understood why, though. Corvus was Andrew's last living relative, and was the closest thing he had to a father figure most of his life. His deadbeat dad never taught him anything worthwhile, and Corvus at least taught him the value of hard work. Andrew needed this time to sort through his memories and emotions. Of course, that endeavor seemed to be causing more problems than it was solving. It was becoming increasingly clear to Celeste that the old man had more than a few skeletons in his closet, and she wasn't confident that Andrew would like what he found out. She wanted to shelter him from whatever dirty secrets were waiting for him in the farmhouse, to get him out of there and just let the past die. But Celeste knew that wasn't an option, and as much as she hated to admit it, she didn't want to let the past die either. She wanted to leave, sure, and she didn't want to spend any more time in the house, but she also wanted to know what Corvus was up to. She finished digging through one pile of junk and moved on to the next, her thoughts drifting back to the paintings in the attic. How had she dreamed about a girl with antlers before she even knew about those paintings? She knew there had to be an explanation for it but none came to mind at that moment. There was simply no possible way for her to have gotten the imagery that perfect in her dream the night before they discovered the portraits. And it wasn't just about the antlers. She dreamed about the white dress, too. It had to be a coincidence, right? Celeste decided that there was simply no possible explanation other than happenstance, of course, that didn't mean she wasn't thoroughly unnerved by the fact that it happened. A cool wind blew through the porch, sending a shiver down her spine. Celeste knew that she needed to stop thinking about it. She didn't want to give herself any more nightmares. She pushed those thoughts out of her mind and focused on sorting through the next pile of junk. After a few hours of mind-numbing and monotonous work, Celeste had gone through the entire wraparound porch, finding absolutely nothing of value. She sat down on the most structurally sound chair she could find and let out a long, slow breath. She pulled her phone out to check the time and found herself playing a game instead. She didn't need a cell signal to waste time, after a few minutes of playing, though, 
Celeste started to get the strange and overwhelming feeling of being watched. The hairs on the back of her neck stood up, and she felt the sudden urge to run. Keeping her head pointed at her phone, Celeste ran her eyes through the tree line across from her. Leaves were rustling in the wind, but other than that, all was still. Tired of playing coy, she finally just stood up and walked over to the porch rail. She placed her hands firmly on the rail and stared directly into the forest, daring whatever was out there to make a move. The wind stopped, and a tense, silent moment passed as Celeste scanned the forest again, doing her best to look confident and imposing. Who's out there? She asked, trying to sound brave. A thick bush at the edge of the tree line started shaking, and Celeste's heart leaped into her chest. She tightened her grip on the railing and poised her legs to run as adrenaline began to course through her system. The shaking moved to the edge of the bush, and Gracie stepped out, meowing happily as she did. Celeste almost fell over from relief at the sight of the cat. She chastised herself for getting so worked up as she called out, Gracie, you stupid cat, you scared me silly. The stupid cat hopped onto the porch and squeezed between the two posts on the rail before rubbing up on her legs, purring as she did. Gracie looked up at her and meowed again. Celeste, knowing that meow by heart, led the cat over to the back door and let her into the house. She watched Gracie trot over to the couch and hop up onto Andrew's lap as he read, doing her best to distract him. Celeste walked into the kitchen to get a drink, still shaking her head at how easily frightened she was. She filled the glass with water and turned around to lean on the counter, surveying the room as she drank. All she could see was more work to be done. The coffee table was still covered with magazines and random loose papers. The bookshelf was still overflowing and the pile of newspapers by the fire seemed like it had somehow grown since they had arrived. It was all simply too much for her to bear at the moment, and Celeste decided that she needed a walk. She tossed back the last bit of her glass of water and marched across the kitchen into the living room. Andrew looked up from petting Gracie, apparently giving up on reading for the moment, and immediately noted the look on Celeste's face. You going for a walk? He asked, dipping into that little bit of latent telepathy they appeared to have developed over the years. Yep, she replied simply. He began to get up before asking, Do you want to walk alone? Two for two, she nodded as she passed by without breaking her stride, then turned around at the front door. Can you clean up this room before I get back? Yeah, sure, he said, a little caught off guard by the brevity of their interaction. She threw on her jacket and stepped out, blowing a quick kiss to Andrew as she did. He barely had time to mime catching it before the door closed behind her. Being back outside was nice. Celeste could feel the walls in the house closing in, threatening to bury her in an avalanche of unfinished tasks and terrifying keepsakes, most of which she did not care for at all. If she never saw another picture of that monster thing again, it would be too soon. It honestly wasn't that much better being outside surrounded by all that forest though either, especially after her dream the night before. Celeste shivered as she relived it again. It all felt just a bit too real for her taste, and she decided that maybe she would feel better if she avoided walking through the woods. That left the driveway as the only viable option, which, while creepy, would take her out to the field, which was the least unnerving place on the whole property. Just a few scarecrows and a lot of dirt. She half walked, half jogged the length of the driveway, doing her best to keep her eyes forward and to ignore the looming shadows that danced around her. 
It became harder and harder to keep her cool as every gust of wind became a portent, and every rustling of leaf became a pursuer. She was practically running by the time she reached the main road. She crossed the road into the field and leaned on a fence post to catch her breath, reminding herself to get back into shape when they got back to Boston. She put her hands behind her head and walked toward the barn, coming to terms with the fact that she wasn't in her twenties anymore. The endless marching of time notwithstanding, it was a beautiful evening. The sun was just starting to set over the horizon, painting the clouds with a thousand shades of orange. The deep blue that was creeping in on the other horizon bringing with it a brilliant blanket of stars, each twinkling silently as it took its place in the approaching night sky. From her vantage point by the barn, Celeste felt small and insignificant in the best way. It felt like the universe was pulling her into an embrace and whispering gently that there was far too more out there than she could ever know. And for just a moment, her worries felt small. And then she saw the headlights. They were still a little bit down the road, but something in the back of Celeste's mind screamed for her to get out of sight. She ducked into the barn and peered around the corner, watching as the vehicle approached. Through the light of the setting sun, Celeste could see that it was the same blue truck that she had seen at the funeral. Her mind reeled with absurd fear and outlandish scenarios as she watched the truck near the turn onto Corvus's property. Was someone following them? Were they an enemy of Andrew's grandfather? Was there a secret small town conspiracy to destroy the property and embezzle the insurance money? She knew she was being ridiculous, but there was something about the staying in the farmhouse that seemed to breathe that paranoid brand of irrationality within her. Celeste breathed a sigh of relief when the truck passed by the driveway and continued onward. Creeping around the side of the barn to get a better view of the vehicle as it moved, she watched as it pulled over and parked in front of a house down the road. An old man got out of the rusted truck and walked slowly up to his porch. He opened the door and paused, looking surreptitiously over his shoulder. Celeste pulled her head back out of sight and waited a moment before peeking out again, just in time to see the door to the house shut. For the third time in a single day, she grumbled to herself about getting so worked up. There had to be something in the water at the farmhouse. She peeled herself off the side of the barn and started walking back toward the driveway. It had been the old man's neighbor the whole time. He must have just been driving by the cemetery to pay his respects. But still, Celeste couldn't help but feel like something was off about the guy. The way he scanned the area before going into the house was odd, to say the least. She crossed the road and started walking up the twisting path of the driveway, the hairs on the back of her neck standing at attention as soon as her feet hit the gravel. Maybe teenage Andrew was onto something. She only managed to walk for a few more seconds before taking off running toward the house. Not too long after Celeste left for her walk, Andrew decided that it would be best to take a break from reading and clean the living room as she had asked. He grabbed a trash bag and walked over to the mountain of newspapers by the fireplace, ruminating on the journal as he did. Those entries were from back when his grandmother was still alive, back before Andrew had come to live with Corvus. Had his sanity been slipping that far back? And if it had... Why hadn't Andrew ever noticed? He admittedly wasn't the most observant guy in the world, but he figured he would have been able to tell if something was off with the man he was living with. But maybe Corvus knew to keep it hidden. After all, if the journal entries were reliable, then Eileen had made it very clear that his delusions weren't acceptable. 
There was always the chance that Corvus kept it all under wraps out of fear that others would react like his grandmother. That thought wasn't much better for Andrew. He hated the idea that Corvus would have been even more ostracized if he had been open about his superstitions. Of course, Andrew had to admit that he would have been amongst the people to label his grandfather a freak, which made the train of thought even worse. He decided to shake those thoughts off and focus on the work. After he tied the strings on the trash bag full of unopened newspapers, Andrew turned his attention to the kitchen table, held loosely in his right hand. The second garbage bag filled up almost as quickly as the first one as Andrew loaded it with plastic bags from the groceries they had bought for the week. Throwing the bags away made Andrew die a little bit inside, but he was willing to bet money that there wasn't a recycling facility for 50 miles in any direction. He didn't think Dry Creek even had recycling bins. Next came the counters, which were sparsely populated. The only trash Andrew found was the paper sack that held Celeste's inhaler. He picked it up and grinned a little bit at the smiley face that Jax had drawn on the receipt. After throwing that away, he went back into the living room to clean the coffee table off. He knew that Celeste would want to be the one to look through the bookshelf, though, so he left it alone. He carried the bag over in his good hand and set it on the floor next to the table, liberally sweeping the magazines and loose papers alike into it. The magazines ran the gamut from hunting and outdoor books to farming catalogs and even a home improvement one like it did him any good. On a whim, Andrew checked the date on the back of the farming catalog and saw that it was 15 years old, starting to seem like Corvus never threw anything away. As entertaining as the shockingly old magazines were, Andrew was more intrigued by the scribbled papers. There was no rhyme or reason that he could find as he shoveled them into the bag and he was prepared to shrug it off and forget about them until he saw the last piece of paper. Sitting in the negative space on the center of the page were two empty holes that looked suspiciously like eyes. Following a hunch, Andrew carried the trash bag over to the kitchen table and started digging through it for the rest of the papers. He placed the page with eyes near the head of the table and laid out all the rest of the papers as spaced out as possible. It was tough to find anything to work with on the full pages, so Andrew focused instead on the pages with fewer scribbles. The pieces with less drawing on them all had a defined sort of shape to them, typically a long curve or a line going long ways across the sheet. Andrew used the curves as an outline of the strange puzzle helping him set the boundaries of the figure. Then he noticed that the pages with lines seemed to connect as they tapered down into thinner shapes, growing deeper the more he figured it out. He had just put the final piece in its place when the front door opened and Celeste came in. She was breathing heavily as she shut and locked the door behind her. You know, I think I judged teenage you too harshly, she said between massive gulps of air. Being on that driveway, alone at dusk, was legitimately one of the creepiest experiences of my entire life. You ran for it, didn't you? He smirked, his mind going back to all the nights that he had done the exact same thing. Absolutely, she replied before noticing his project on the table. What's that? Well, apparently Corvus did charcoal drawings as well. He stepped back and gestured to the complete image. Fair warning though, you're not going to like it. Celeste's eyebrows furrowed as she crossed through the living room and entered the kitchen. She stopped a few feet away from the table, apparently having seen enough. You have got to be kidding me. Another one? She threw her hands in the air and started walking back toward the stairs. Just throw it away already. Hey, I told you you weren't going to like it, he called out as she made her way upstairs. 
Now alone in the kitchen again, Andrew took one last look at the finished puzzle in front of him. Spanning the length of the table was a crude, life-size sketch of the same menacing figure that was the focal point of every painting in the attic. The dark thing in the woods that Corvus called the Ragged. Chapter 11 Celeste stepped out of the shower once again thoroughly disappointed in the lack of heat and water pressure. The mirror above the sink was completely clear of steam as she toweled off and did her skincare routine. All the myriad horrors of the farmhouse paled in comparison to the dismal quality of the shower. Andrew had warned her before they even got to the house that the pressure and temperature were bad when they had lived there over 20 years before, but she had no way of preparing for the weak stream of water that trickled lazily out of the shower head. A long, hot shower was at the top of Celeste's list for when she got home. She exited the bathroom and threw on her pajamas before heading downstairs to find Andrew, who was strangely absent from the bedroom. As she rounded the corner at the bottom of the stairs into the living room, she saw him sitting on the couch with an empty cup, the bottom of which had the telltale tawny brown of his favorite whiskey. Andrew looked up at her and flashed a great big, dopey smile with half-shut eyes. She gave him a quizzical look in return. How many glasses of that have you had? She asked, astonished at the speed with which Andrew had gotten drunk. Her shower hadn't been that long. Just one? His words slurred as he spoke. But it's really good. Yeah, sure sounds like it. Celeste made her way to the bottle on the counter to check it out. It was 80 proof, which wasn't out of the ordinary for Andrew's taste. Not to mention that the bottle was still mostly full. A concerning thought passed through her mind. I'm fairly certain you're not supposed to drink alcohol with pain meds, she said as she made her way to the couch and took a seat next to him. I mean, it's, well, it's just over-the-counter stuff, he said. And I didn't even have a full cup, but <laughs> you sure have a couple of full cups on you, baby. She batted his hands away as he leaned forward to cop a feel of her chest. Great, Horny Andrew was there. She loved Horny Andrew. Okay, she said, standing up and pulling him off the couch. Let's get you to bed. Oh, well, I'd bet you'd like to... He put on his best attempt at a sexy voice. Oh yeah, you know me, you've really got me pegged. He giggled at her poor word choice. Well, maybe if I play my cards right. She had to admit that she set him up for that one. It was a slow pitch over home plate. Any idiot would have swung at that, especially a drunk idiot. One step at a time, Celeste managed to haul Andrew's increasingly loopy body up to the bedroom his one-liners getting worse by the minute. By the time he was laying in bed, his seduction tactics had devolved into him simply spreading his legs and raising his eyebrows repeatedly. She threw the blanket over him and turned off the lamp before walking away. Andrew was a wonderful man with an amazing heart, but Celeste absolutely could not stand him when he was drunk. She looked back at him when she reached the bedroom door, and saw that he was already asleep, his mouth hanging open and a gentle snore escaping his lips. As frustrated as she was with his drunken antics, Celeste couldn't help but smile when she saw that his legs were still spread wide open under the blanket. She pulled out her phone and snapped a quick picture of him for blackmail later. Drunk Andrew may not have been her favorite person, but hungover Andrew was a delight. He was always a precious bundle of apologies and small gifts, tied up with a lovely bow of, please don't send those pictures to anybody. With her future bargaining chip stashed away on her phone, Celeste got her inhaler out of the bathroom and took a big puff. She breathed in deeply as she watched Andrew sleep for a few minutes. From drunken frat boy to complete angel, 
in record time. She left the room and went downstairs to turn the lights out, worrying as she went about the fact that her husband was dumb enough to drink while taking pain medicine. Thinking back through what little she could remember about mixing alcohol and medicine, she was fairly certain he would be okay as long as he didn't drink too much. Andrew's behavior was part of the reason she avoided drinking entirely. As far as she could tell, no one's life had ever been improved by the presence of alcohol. She made it a point not to look down on people who did drink, but she also never understood the appeal. Celeste twisted the deadbolt on the front door and turned off the living room light on her way to the kitchen. After checking that the back door was locked as well, she went into the kitchen and flicked off the overhead light, leaving on a small lamp by the sink. Feeling strangely drowsy, Celeste poured herself a glass of water. As she was drinking it though, something in the air shifted. It was a subtle change but the air felt much heavier, almost oppressively so. The light of the lamp next to her flickered for a moment before going out entirely, plunging the room into darkness. The hairs on Celeste's arms stood at attention as she suddenly got the distinct feeling of being watched. A sharp rap on the window startled her, and she spun around to see someone outside on the porch, staring at her through the glass. She yelped in shock, dropping the glass she was holding. It hit the linoleum with a dull thud and bounced, and a spiderweb crack blossoming across the curve where it landed. The figure in the window didn't move. Everything inside, Celeste screamed at her to run, to get upstairs and rouse Andrew, but instead... She found herself slowly approaching the living room to get a better look. As she did, the figure came into focus. It was the horned girl. She stood frozen outside the window, her wild eyes looking right through Celeste. Dried blood covered the sides of her head and her shoulders, as well as being matted up in her hair. The antlers weren't growing out of her head. They had been drilled into it. Inflamed skin swelled around the base of the horns. The woman tilted her head to the side, sending a trickle of flesh blood from the right horn down to the side of her face. If she still had control of her body, Celeste would have gagged. With Celeste standing on the far side of the living room, the two women watched each other for a long, tense moment until the girl's head drooped forward suddenly, tapping the window with an antler. The sudden sound and movement shocked Celeste, making her step back a bit. There was something about the woman in the window that seemed familiar to her, like she was looking in a mirror. The girl knocked on the window again with her horns, more aggressively this time, before beginning to back away from the glass. Recognition hit Celeste like a freight train, and her stomach turned. She knew why the woman looked so familiar. It was Amelia Barnett. Her blondish hair was a dark brown from all the dirt and blood, and the muscles in her face were clenched in strange ways. But those brown eyes were the same. That was the girl from that month's missing persons poster in the pharmacy. Tears ran freely down Celeste's cheeks, and she almost collapsed. The dizziness threatened to overtake her, but she caught the back of the armchair in front of her and steadied herself on it. She wanted to call out, to say Amelia's name, but her mouth wouldn't move. The room started spinning as Amelia slowly turned and stepped out of sight. Her feet unglued from the floor, and Celeste ran to the window, nearly falling over as the living room tumbled around her. She pressed her face against the window and strained her eyes in the darkness, looking for the missing girl. Nothing moved outside. Silence fell over the house. Only Celeste's ragged breaths and sniffling could be heard. She stared out the window, wondering where Amelia went. Her shoulders slumped in defeat and exhaustion, the static in her head growing louder. The girl was gone. 
lost again. A loud crash shattered the silence as the window exploded inward, peppering Celeste's face with shards of glass. A thick, strong hand wrapped around her throat and lifted her into the air. Celeste struggled to breathe and to free herself from the grasp as she looked down in horror. It was the thing from the paintings. Dark eyes locked with hers as the thing tightened its grip on her throat. Celeste kicked limply at it until her vision faded to black. Chapter 12 Andrew woke up with a throbbing headache and a strange ache in his hips. His vision blurred slightly as he sat up and squinted at the blinding light that slipped between the curtains. The sound of his pulse in his head made him sick to his stomach. He smacked his lips together, feeling like he had spent the night sucking on cotton balls. Grabbing the water off the bedside table, Andrew took a long, slow drink and tried to remember the night before. He remembered pouring that first glass of whiskey, intentionally not putting very much in it. He just wanted the flavor. Then Celeste came downstairs. Did they have sex? No, they wouldn't have. She couldn't stand him when he was drunk. Wait a minute. Where was Celeste? For the first time, Andrew noticed that he was alone in the room. The blanket on her side of the bed looked untouched, like she had never gotten in bed at all. Did she sleep on the couch? Andrew climbed out of his bed, his head and hips screaming in protest. What had happened last night? Before he could find Celeste and ask, he desperately needed a double dose of pain meds, half for his broken arm and the other half for his splitting headache. He got up and pulled the curtain completely shut. The light was far too bright for his sensitive eyes. Now that he could see, Andrew stumbled across the hall and into the bathroom. The mirror on the medicine cabinet above the sink squeaked loudly as Andrew pulled it open, making him wince. He made a mental note for sober Andrew to oil the hinges later that day. And the small pills rattled thunderously in the bottle as he struggled to open it, and even the faucet was far too loud. He popped a couple in his mouth and bent down to get a drink straight from the tap. The icy coolness of the toilet seat woke him up slightly as Andrew used the bathroom, his elbows resting on his knees and his head buried firmly in his hands. There was no possible way he had drunk enough the night before to feel that hungover. He knew that medicine and alcohol didn't mix well, but he had thought for sure that a small glass of whiskey would be fine. Celeste was far more knowledgeable about the drugs than he was, so he would have to ask her about it. Celeste? Andrew cursed himself for forgetting about her so quickly as he unrolled more toilet paper than necessary and wiped. The sound of the flush nearly made him black out, but he found his way through the hall and down the stairs. There hadn't been a single time in their marriage that she had been upset enough to sleep anywhere other than their bed, which meant that he had either royally screwed up or something was very wrong. Stuck between a rock and a hard place, Andrew prayed for the former. He waddled down the stairs as quickly as he could, his hips roaring at the apparent abuse of walking. The creaking of each step might as well have been an ice pick to the brain, as far as Andrew was concerned. Every sound and movement made him sick to his stomach. Even back in college, Andrew had never been as hungover as he was at that moment. But none of it mattered once he saw Celeste. She was laying unconscious on the living room floor, bathed in the light of the window above her. Andrew skipped the last few steps and ran to her side, wincing as he did. He grabbed her shoulder with his left hand and shook her gently, but firmly. Celeste, he said through the mounting panic, oh, please wake up, come on baby, please wake up. She didn't react. Andrew shook her harder, praying for the first time in years as he did. He needed her to wake up. He couldn't go on through this world without her. She didn't move. 
He tried shouting to no avail. Desperate and out of options, Andrew said a quick apology before slapping her limp body across the face. Celeste's eyes shot open and threw herself into a sitting position, gasping wildly as she did. Andrew threw his arm around her and did his best to calm her down. Oh baby, thank God you're okay, he said, tears streaming down his face. I thought I lost you. It was so horrible, she told him through tears of her own. It attacked me. What attacked you? He held her face in his hands and looked in her eye. She was so frightened. That thing from the paintings, she choked out. It broke through the window and grabbed me by the throat. Confused, Andrew looked up to find the glass completely intact. As far as he could tell, it looked untouched. Babe, that window's not broken. Celeste's eyebrows furrowed as she stared in disbelief behind him. But, but it was, she stuttered. He attacked me and the girl from the missing persons poster was there too. She had horns and was covered in blood. Andrew's concern faded slightly when he realized what was going on. Listen, darling, he said, tucking a loose strand of hair behind her ear. I think you were having a nightmare. Then, how did I end up down here? She protested, pulling back from his hand. Well, maybe you were sleepwalking. No, 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 I was not sleepwalking. She stood up and stormed off toward the kitchen, looking for something on the ground as she went. She got up to the sink before ducking down and disappearing behind the half wall, reappearing a second later with a glass cup in hand. You come look at this. Andrew winced at the volume of her voice and did as he was told. When he got to her, she thrust the cup into his hand. He took it gingerly, seeing the series of cracks that were cascading around its circumference. What am I looking at here? He asked, unsure of where Celeste was going with this. I dropped this last night when I saw Amelia Barnett in the window. Who's Amelia Barnett? She grew more agitated at his question, explaining. She's the girl from the missing persons posters at the pharmacy, except she's got horns now. I saw her standing in the backyard two nights ago, and I just saw her again last night. She was outside that window, just staring at me. Then she left right before that thing attacked. Her words slowed and her shoulders slumped as she reached the end of her explanation, as if saying it all out loud made her hear how it sounded. She looked up at him, upset and confused, searching for an explanation. A wave of pity and guilt washed over Andrew. He had so focused on himself the whole time that he failed to see how much Celeste was struggling. Looking down at her now, Andrew could see that she was drowning. Trying and failing to think of the right thing to say, Andrew simply pulled her in for a hug. She awkwardly embraced him, trying to wrap her arms around him in a way that avoided his sling entirely. After she found the optimal position, though, her muscles relaxed as she took a deep breath and buried her face in his chest. They stood like that for a long time. I'm sorry you were having these nightmares, he said, but I'm more sorry that I haven't been paying attention to you since we got here. I've just been focused on myself and, well, somehow I completely missed the fact that you're struggling with this too. She nodded against his chest and he heard a small sniffle. Just how sucks, she said, and he could feel her crack a small smile. He let out a small, sharp laugh and sniffled too. Yeah, <laughs> it's the worst. They both laughed together for a moment as the intensity of their emotions melted away. After such an eventful start, Andrew had a hard time believing it was just a normal Wednesday morning. They broke their embrace and started making breakfast, doing their best to move on with the day. Celeste told Andrew all about his antics the night before, showing him her newest piece of blackmail evidence. The pain meds may have kicked in by that point, 
but they did nothing to quell the emotional pain of seeing himself passed out, laying spread eagle on his back. Celeste grinned smugly as she pocketed her phone before returning to her pancakes. Having had the previous night's events laid out for them, Andrew was left with no good explanation for his hangover. He even checked the bottle of whiskey himself and saw that there was barely more than two shots worth of the golden liquid missing from the bottle. Something felt wrong about the whole situation, but with nothing else to go off of, Andrew decided that it must have been a weird interaction with the medication. He decided that he would avoid taking his medicine that evening so he could have a drink and remember it too. As they were eating, Celeste also told him about the truck she had seen at the funeral and how it was the neighbor from down the road. I know he's just probably some old dude, she said, but I got a really weird vibe from him. Do you think you could go over today and check him out? You want me to spy on her elderly neighbor? Andrew asked. Not spy, just check it out. Like, go over there and introduce yourself. Why would I do that? I don't know, maybe he knows something about Corvus that we don't. She certainly knew how to pique his interest. If he does, then it's a win-win. You learn more about your grandfather, and I get the comfort of knowing that the man down the road isn't a complete weirdo. Andrew mulled it over for a moment. Normally, he'd been able to resist the offer, but the guilt he felt over Celeste's night terrors tipped the scales in her favor. It wouldn't make up for him being so oblivious to her struggles, but it was a start. Fine, he said, but only because of your superior negotiating tactics. She walked around the table and kissed him on the cheek. You're the best. I know, I know. Celeste had left and was walking up the stairs when Andrew called back to her. Hey, wait, he said. What is it? she asked. That thing you saw, the thing in the paintings. Corvus gave it a name. He called it the Ragged. Celeste gave Andrew a quick kiss goodbye and listened as the sound of wheels on gravel disappeared down the driveway. Then she turned her attention to the squat, unimpressive, and overflowing bookshelf under the window. She sat on the floor next to it and took a deep breath in. Nothing beats the smell of old books. Corvus's selection wasn't too exciting, being composed mainly of almanacs and manuals, but the content of the book didn't change the scent. She pulled her hair back in a ponytail, trying to decide how she would go about organizing it all, but found herself instead staring at the window above the shelf. There wasn't a scratch on it. It had all felt so real, yet... The only piece of evidence she had was a broken cup. The Ragged. That name hung over her mind like a dark cloud. Images flashed through her head again. A massive hand punching through the glass and wrapping around her throat. The feeling of suffocating as her feet left the floor. The look of malice in those eyes. She shook her head clearing the thoughts away. It was all a dream. She had sleepwalked and knocked the glass off the counter before falling over in front of the window. The rest was a figment of her overactive imagination. A few deep breaths and reassurances later, and Celeste was finally ready to tackle the task at hand. She had found a couple of cardboard boxes in Andrew's old closet and set them aside. One was for books that may be worth keeping or selling, and the other was for books that could be thrown away. She knew that it would be simpler to just put the useless ones in a trash bag, but Celeste couldn't bring herself to treat books with such disrespect. She would throw them away in a box and maybe give them a Viking funeral, if Andrew would allow it, and if she could find a lake. So on she went, picking up books one at a time, leafing through them and deciding their fate. The series of almanacs was simple enough to figure out. She decided that, while she didn't want them, she understood the value of records like them. Keep. 
Next came the various handbooks and manuals that explained the processes and mechanics of machinery, and tools that Corvus had presumably used around the farm. She flipped through the pages absent-mindedly, neither interested nor seeing the value in keeping the manuals to pieces of equipment that were likely just going to end up in a landfill somewhere. It was trash. After the top shelf was cleared off of more material, Celeste started finding more interesting reads. The second shelf from the top was comprised largely of unreturned library books, of which there were half a dozen books on folklore. They were mostly focused on the legends of the British Isles, but there were a couple dedicated to mainland Europe, and even a single book about Icelandic beliefs. That group took a great deal longer to parse through, mainly because Celeste kept getting sucked into the stories. They were fascinating and peculiar, chock full of colorful characters and outlandish events. She just couldn't stop reading once one had caught her eye. Of particular interest to Celeste, though, were the dog-eared chapters of the books. It seemed that Andrew's ghoulish habit of folding the corner of perfectly good pages ran in the family. As much as the habit upset her, Celeste found herself quietly thankful for the insight it had given her over the years. She could always pick up one of Andrew's books, and, using the pages she had dog-eared, figure out what he was fixating on at the time. Andrew wasn't the most open man, so Celeste had to get a little bit creative to figure out what was going on in his head. Hoping to obtain a similar insight into her enigmatic grandfather-in-law, and to stop herself from outright reading each folklore book cover to cover, Celeste began focusing solely on the bookmark sections. And strangely, all of the pages were about fairy folklore. She quickly learned during her reading that the fairies from children's movies were nothing like the fairies from folklore and legend. The images that she had carried her whole life of sweet little people with wings and the occasional temper were quickly supplanted with vindictive alien beings of immense power. The Fae was not to be trifled with. In Iceland, she learned, people still refuse to move boulders because they fear upsetting the hidden folk who live inside them. In many places, it seemed that the old beliefs in the Fae still held sway over the people of the region. But why did Corvus care? What sway did fairy folklore hold over him? Enthralled by both the content and the added mystery of the man who owned, well, stole them, Celeste put the folklore books in the keep box. She would have to wait until they went back home before she could read any further, though. She was far too on edge as it was. Normally, she'd be embarrassed by being so easily spooked. But after all the strange and unsettling events and dreams she had experienced in the farmhouse, Celeste was willing to cut herself some slack. After the folklore books came a couple of Harlequin romance novels, their covers bearing images of half-dressed men holding onto dainty yet buxom women as their hair billowed in the breeze. Celeste assumed that the books belonged to Corvus's late wife, Eileen but she was also open to the idea that the old man had a secret passion for poorly written erotica. That theory seemed to fall apart as she skimmed the pages, though. There wasn't a single folded corner in the entire collection. Trash. At the very end of the bottom shelf sat an old atlas, well worn from use. Celeste perked up when she saw it. Realizing that the book might contain some documentation of Corvus's travels, as much as she would prefer not to be interested in the man's odd life and ideas, she had to admit that even she had grown curious. Celeste picked up the book and immediately noticed just how many of the pages had been dog-eared. There had to be dozens of them, each one promising a small little insight into the increasingly strange mythos of Corvus Wilson. She opened the book to the first folded corner and found a road map of the entire state of Georgia. Several dots had been drawn in pen across the map, each one in a different city or town across the state. Celeste marveled a little bit at the sheer number of marked locations. 
had Celeste traveled to all of them. Using the map scale at the bottom of the page, she surmised that some of the cities marked were over 200 miles away from Dry Creek. The man may have never left Georgia, but he certainly seemed to have been well-traveled within the state. As she turned to the next marked page, Celeste wondered idly about what he did on these trips. Did he meet with other farmers and go hunting? Or were they all pleasure trips he took with his wife? The couple's getaway idea faded when Celeste got to the next map. This one a close-up view of the nearest city, Blakely. There was a dot placed on a stretch of woods on the edge of the city, and next to it was a date. October 3rd, 1993. Celeste frowned. Didn't Eileen disappear in 1992? That made the romantic getaway theory hold a lot less water. She flipped to the next dog ear and found a similar sight. This time, it was at the Kolomoki Mound State Park. A dot was placed in the forest with a new date. October 5th, 1994. Every map that followed had the same treatment. Arlington, October 1st, 1995. Damascus, October 10th, 1996, Bluffton, October 2nd, 1997, page after page, year after year, each one in the woods, and each one in October. A small idea scratched at the back of Celeste's mind as she flipped through the rest of the atlas and saw that the pattern continued. She pulled out her phone and typed each location and year into a note document. Something about it seemed disturbingly familiar. Something that she didn't want to name until she had more evidence. Celeste sat the book on top of the shelf and resolved to take the car into town the next day. She had a hunch that she wasn't going to like what she found. Gravel kicked up as Andrew moved out of the driveway and turned left on the main road heading out to pay a visit to his neighbor. A mission to scope out an elderly man and press him for information about his late grandfather was more than a little bit out of his comfort zone, and, all things considered, Andrew felt that it was a decidedly childish pursuit. Of course, that wasn't about to stop him from doing it. All the information he had about Corvus came from his journals, ramblings, and ravings, and Andrew was starting to get desperate for an outsider's perspective. Anything that could help him get a clearer picture of who his grandfather was would be worth it. Helping his wife feel safer was a bonus too, he supposed. Andrew pulled up to the house after a few minutes and parked next to the old blue truck that Celeste had described. The couple didn't own the best or nicest car in the world, but their mid-sized sedan looked like a Tesla compared to the hunk of junk he was now idling by. It was the little things that reminded him to be more thankful. Andrew put the car in park, which was quite the ordeal with his right arm in a sling, and got out. He approached the front door with caution, taking note as he did of a curtain in the living room window that dropped back into place when he looked at it. You couldn't be too careful walking up to a stranger's house in the country, an uninvited guest was equally likely to meet the barrel of a shotgun at the door, as they were a smiling face. He then walked up onto the porch and raised his hand to knock on the screen door, when the interior door opened suddenly. A silver chain stopped it after a few inches, and Andrew was met with both a face and a gun barrel, although neither was smiling. What do you want, city slicker? The voice asked, voice crackling slightly as it did. Uh, hi, Andrew said, awkwardly raising his good arm above his head. Off to a great start. He was not a fan of guns in general, and having one trained on him was certainly not going to make his list of favorite experiences. I'm Corvus's grandfrom from down the road. I'm getting his property ready to sell now that he's gone, and I was wondering if I could just talk to you for a few minutes. 
The interior door slammed shut, and the sound of the chain scratching on the door as it slid and fell could be heard on the other side. A second later, the door opened, fully this time, and Andrew was face to face with his neighbor. Thankfully, his gun was pointed at the ground. What's your name, son? The old man asked as he stepped up to the screen door, clearly hesitant to come out any further. In the light, Andrew had no idea how Celeste could have been scared of the guy. It was a good foot shorter than Andrew, and outside of the paunch on his stomach, he was all skin and bones. Frail arms trembled slightly as they held the shotgun, which was still plenty terrifying, despite the body that was wielding it. He wore striped overalls and a bathrobe, both of which looked and smelled like they hadn't been washed in a long while. Looking at him behind that screen door, Andrew wondered if this old man wouldn't be next on the Grim Reaper's list. My name's Andrew, he replied. May I ask yours? Name's Elliot, he said. Now what is it you want to know? Andrew's confidence was bolstered a little by Elliot's question. Certainly, exchanging even the smallest of pleasantries meant that he was at least safe from having a gun pointed at him again. Well, I was wondering if you could tell me whatever you might know about my grandfather. See, he was always a bit of an enigma to me, and I'm afraid I'm having the hardest time piecing together who he really was. Elliot's eyes narrowed for a moment. Well, aren't you the boy who came and stayed with him back when his son died? Andrew was somewhat taken aback. He didn't expect anyone to remember him, much less a neighbor he had never spoken to. Yeah, he said. That's me. Then shouldn't you know your own granddaddy better than I could? You lived under his roof for a couple of years. This conversation might be going nowhere fast. Andrew opened his mouth to speak a few times, trying to find the right way to explain himself. After a moment, he settled on Candor, figuring that a man like Elliot would appreciate him being direct more than him being tactful. Sir, he began, maybe laying it on a bit too thick. With all due respect, my grandfather was an odd man. He kept to himself, and he apparently kept a lot of secrets. I'm just trying to figure out what those secrets were, and anything you may know could help me greatly. Elliot seemed to consider this for a moment, his jaw moving back and forth as he did. Yeah, well you're right about Corvus being odd, ah, that's for sure. Well, he and I both kept to ourselves mostly, but I always thought it was weird how much time he spent out in the barn at night. Andrew leaned forward, tantalized by this revelation. Excuse me? Well, as far as I can remember... Every year in early October, your grandpa would spend about a week straight going out to the barn in the dead of night. He'd leave for a day or two, then he'd come back in the middle of the night and back his truck up to the barn to unload something. I always figured he was hunting early and dressing the deer in the dark to keep it a secret. But, you see, it doesn't take a week to dress a deer. So I got no clue what he could have been doing the rest of the time. Elliot paused to check on Andrew, who stood dumbfounded. Well, I take it you didn't know that, he asked. Andrew could only shake his head. Well, Elliot said, I told you all I know, and I don't want to miss any more of my program than I already have. Andrew snapped out of his stupor. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Elliot. He eyed Andrew up and down once more before saying, You have a good day now, son. You too, sir. He responded as he made his way down to the porch steps. And young man? Elliot called out. Andrew turned back to look at him once more. Yes, sir? Well, don't come round here anymore. You understand? I don't appreciate visitors. Absolutely. Without another word, the old man closed the door, and the sound of the chain could be heard as it slid back into place. 
Andrew made a face as he walked back to his car. The spirit of Southern hospitality hadn't reached his house yet. As he turned the key in the ignition, Andrew wondered about Corvus's late night visits to the barn. The only new detail he had seen was the pile of deer skulls, a feature that seemed to line up with Elliot's illegal hunting theory. He remembered the October trips Corvus would take, but had Andrew never noticed his grandfather staying out in the barn all night for a week straight? Of course, that was assuming that Elliot was a trustworthy source. Nothing about him screamed reliable witness, but if Andrew was willing to take him out of his word, then that meant that Corvus had something secret hidden in the barn, and that was worth looking into. He made a quick pit stop on his way back to the house, turning left into the field across from the gravel driveway. Parking by the barn, Andrew looked up at the looming structure. A thick sheet of darkening clouds loomed in the distance behind it, threatening to bring rain. He remembered the forecast calling for a heavy storm Thursday night. Maybe it was coming early. The interior of the barn was exactly as Andrew remembered it when he fell. The tools on the workbench were where he had left them, and the tractor remained in the center of the space, right where Corvus always parked it. As he started poking around, Andrew made a mental note to finally drive the old thing before he and Celeste went back home. Maybe he could take her out for a ride to celebrate finally skipping town. Unsurprisingly, Andrew found nothing in his second search that he hadn't already found in the first. There were no secret panels on the tool bench, no hidden compartments in the tractor, and no room in the loft to hide something. Not that he had been able to climb up and check. His shoulders slumped as he made his way back to the car. It seemed that his neighbor was either right and Corvus was out cleaning illegally caught deer in the dead of night, or he was wrong and there was nothing to be found out there. Either way, Andrew was no closer to understanding his grandfather than when he started that day. Thanks for nothing, Elliot. Chapter 13 During dinner that evening, Andrew updated Celeste on his conversation with Elliot, reassuring her that he seemed harmless enough. When she asked him if their neighbor knew anything useful about Corvus, Andrew told her no. It wasn't completely a lie, the way he saw it. He had already known about the deer skulls in the loft, and he wasn't even certain whether or not he could trust the old man. Andrew didn't see any reason to make Celeste more uncomfortable than she already was. The couple finished up dinner and wound down for the evening, snuggling up on the couch to watch another movie Celeste had downloaded on her laptop. This rom-com was about a photojournalist who discovered she could take pictures of people's true emotions after dropping her camera in a wishing well fountain, and Andrew found himself strangely sucked in by the story. After a whole movie of using the camera to help other people fix their problems, the protagonist's best friend took the camera from her and used it to help fix her problems too. It was cheesy, corny, and it had a soundtrack ripped straight out of the 90s. But Andrew had a great time watching it. He would have to request more movies like it in the future. Andrew woke Celeste who had fallen asleep on his shoulder a little over halfway through the film. And he said, Hey babe, it's time to get up. You can't sleep on the couch all night. Celeste stirred for a moment, then yawned, stretched, and rubbed at her bleary eyes. Did you like the movie? Weirdly enough, he said, I kind of loved it. Oh, good. She laid her head back on his shoulder. We'll have to watch it sometime. Yeah, you definitely need to go to bed. Andrew helped Celeste make her way to her room, halfway carrying her up the stairs. Sleepy Celeste was both incoherent and uncoordinated. Once he had walked her into the room, she collapsed on the bed and started snoring the moment her head hit the pillow. Smiling to himself, Andrew pulled the blanket up over her shoulders and turned out the lights. While going to the bathroom, Andrew saw Celeste's inhaler on the sink, 
and realized that he had forgotten to have her take it before bed. He left the bathroom with her inhaler in hand, ready to rouse her enough to take a puff. Upon hearing the sound of her snoring resonate through the hallway, Andrew decided that she would be okay for one night without it. After the past few nights she had had, Celeste deserved to rest. Plus, once she was out, it took nothing short of a literal slap in the face to wake her up. As much as Celeste would have loved laying in bed and listening to her snoring for an hour as he tried to fall asleep, he decided that now was the perfect time to finally enjoy a glass of that whiskey Jax had given him. The creaking of the stairs seemed quiet for the first time when compared to Celeste's snores, and he chuckled to himself about that fact as he descended into the living room. The whiskey bottle stood as a glimmering beacon of hope on an otherwise bleak and barren countertop, one that Andrew would happily answer the call of. Plucking the cork off the bottle and taking a nice, deep whiff of the scent, Andrew felt his muscles relaxing. He needed this. He poured himself a little more than he normally would, thinking that it would help him get to sleep faster if the snore of the sentry didn't subside soon. The armchair in the living room groaned quietly as he sat down, protesting the unexpected weight. Andrew took a small, slow sip and let the flavor wash over his mouth as he swallowed. Warmth spread through his chest as the whiskey made its way to his stomach, and a small sigh escaped his lips. The whiskey may have been cheap, but it sure was delicious. Andrew found himself staring at the journal while he took a few more drinks. It was late and his appetite for strangeness was depleted for the day, but the siren call of the journal wouldn't let him go. After another minute and a bigger gulp, Andrew reached over and plucked the book off the coffee table in front of him. He felt a slight buzz come over him as he turned to the last dog-eared page and started reading. There were fewer entries by this point. Corvus's thoughts becoming more and more focused on the ragged. Scribbles and sketches of the thing would show up in the margins and would even take up the whole pages at times. Andrew skimmed over the bulk of September, looking for an interesting entry. And the one he did find was a doozy. Chapter 14 September 27, 1992 well, I've been leaving spare meat out for the ragged every night after Eileen goes to bed. Probably about for a month now. Each morning I go outside and see that he ate it all up. Or at least, took it with him to wherever he comes from. I know there's more to him though. And there has to be. Now mama always told me that it was better to leave the fae alone. To just be respectful and leave them be. But I reckon Mama never saw any of them in the flesh, looking up at her from the backyard. Now I've made up my mind. I'm going to wait for Ragged outside tonight. I've never seen God do anything for me. I've tried to live my whole life trying to make him happy. But I've seen Ragged in the things he's doing for me. If he's the one making my crops better, well then I want to thank him myself. September 28th, 1992. I did it. Well, I met the ragged. Last night, I left the food out like I normally do, but then I went out to the front door and snuck around the back of the house to wait for him. Well, I watched for over an hour, but ragged was nowhere to be seen. I turned around to go back inside, and he was right there behind me. Wouldn't you know it? Well, I fell down out of fright. And that's when Ragged stood over me and taught me things I never knew before. He stank to high heaven, like death on a warm day, and his voice sounded familiar like I'd heard it in a dream somewhere. And this is what he told me. Women hold the key to vitality. All things spring forth from women, even the fertility of nature itself. Well, without them, without their flesh bringing forth our flesh, we cannot come into being. 
He told me that female flesh is the secret to continued vitality. That from the flesh we come, and back to the flesh we must go, if we wish to have life. He told me to take the night and consider these things. And then he told me there are consequences for those who lose their vitality. Andrew closed the book in disgust. What on earth was wrong with Corvus? He was already having a hard enough time reconciling with the fact that his grandfather had become obsessed with a figment of his imagination. But now on top of that, he had to deal with his grandfather's grotesque views on women too? Well, his stomach turned as he tossed the journal onto the table. Vitality and flesh. It was all just too much. He didn't even like that word. Flesh. It had a bad feeling in his mouth, reminiscent of the few fundamentalist Baptist sermons he had heard as a kid before his mom died and his dad quit having them go. There was too much baggage attached to that word for it to ever not sound creepy to Andrew. Noticing that Celeste's snoring had died down and deciding that he had had enough reading for one night, Andrew pulled himself out of the armchair. A wave of dizziness took over him as he stood up, toppling him right back down into the seat. His vision blurred for a moment before evening out again. He was more tired than he thought. Getting up again was a struggle, but Andrew managed to make his way into the kitchen to put his glass in the sink. Then he turned out the lights and went upstairs, fully recovered from his dizzy spell. He stumbled over to the bedroom door, but paused before going in. Was it his imagination? Or could Andrew hear something in the attic? He tilted his head and held his breath, trying to pick up the sound again. Nothing. The attic door was still open. Its gaping maw opened wide, beckoning to him, bidding him to enter. Every rational part of his mind told him to just go to bed, but Andrew found that his body was moving against his will. He approached the attic as quietly as possible and began to climb, the steps creaking softly under his bare feet. Poking his head through the opening and peering into the darkness, Andrew saw nothing that could be making the sound. A small beam of moonlight streamed in through the small window behind his head, illuminating the small path to the back of the attic, which was hidden behind an impenetrable wall of shadow. After listening for a moment and allowing his eyes to adjust, Andrew located the sound. He climbed up the last few steps, tiptoed slowly across the floor over to the nearest ragged painting. This one was a close-up, showing just the creature's face. Thick black hair covered all of its features, except for those red eyes, which met Andrew's gaze with a malevolent stare. The sound was coming from the portrait. Andrew's eyes widened as he leaned in closer to listen, his ear almost touching the canvas. And that's when the sound became a word. Flesh. He jerked his head back and was met with a new wave of dizziness. Losing his balance, Andrew turned and caught himself on a box behind him, landing face to face with another one of the paintings. This one was a wider image of the creature tearing the meat off the body of the horn girl in white. The word came again, this time from the new portrait he was facing. Flesh. Andrew pushed himself back into a standing position and moved to the next painting in line. Leaning forward, he heard the word a third time. Another image called out from behind him, louder this time. He spun back around to find the source, but heard the word from another place further down the aisle before he could find it. And soon, multiple voices were speaking at the same time, overlapping as they did. The chorus grew rapidly, leaving Andrew in a daze as dozens of small voices began to chant, Flesh, flesh, flesh. Through the noise, Andrew somehow heard a new call, a silent voice telling him to go to the window. Numbness overtook him, and his feet carried him through the moonlight, 
taking him to the small octagonal pane on the wall. The voices, which had been steadily growing in volume, suddenly fell silent when he put his hand on the glass. Out in the backyard, standing in the moonlight, was the ragged. Its features were tough to make out in the darkness, but Andrew was certain of what the creature was. It looked like a living shadow, all dark and amorphous, as if its body were made out of a tattered fabric that hung off it in heaps. Thick black hair hung over its face in slick, matted strands, obscuring most of its features, just like in the paintings. The ragged was staring at the house when Andrew approached the window, but it seemed to notice his movement, lifting its gaze upward. Looking directly at him now, the creature tilted its head back to the side, as if in contemplation. It swayed back and forth for a moment, looking like it may fall over, but then it stepped forward. It took short, stiff steps and Andrew noticed that it was favoring its left leg as it moved. After limping five feet closer to the house, never breaking eye contact with Andrew, the ragged stopped again. Then, it slowly lifted its right hand and placed it on its stomach, tilting its head to the opposite side. Almost instinctively, Andrew found himself gently shaking his head no, he remembered how the ragged had made that same gesture in Corvus's first journal entry, and, while well, some part of him in the back of his mind believed he was dreaming, he didn't want to go down the same path as his grandfather. If what he was looking at was real, then Andrew wanted no part of it. Upon seeing his response, the ragged lowered its hand back to its side and slowly turned around limping slowly back into the woods. As Andrew stood frozen to the spot and watched the creature retreat to the back of the clearing, the voices and the paintings returned, quickly growing in volume. Flesh. 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 Andrew's open palm turned into a fist on the glass as the intensity of the chanting sent a new wave of dizziness over him, buckling his knees. Flesh. Flesh, flesh, he clamped his eyes shut and pulled his good hand away from the window to cover an ear as he sank to the ground. Flesh, flesh. Overwhelmed by the cries of the portraits, Andrew pushed his head against the exterior wall and began to pray. He had never been much of a praying man. His father didn't have any patience for religion, and Andrew found that he got along just fine without it. But at that moment, he prayed to whatever god might be listening, to anything that wasn't the ragged. After an eternity of cowering on the floor, begging for the noise to stop, the chorus began to subside. One by one, the voices shrank in volume and fell off, until the last word hung gently in the silence. Andrew didn't move. He kept his eyes shut and listened intently. Nothing. It was complete silence in the attic once more. Andrew slowly lowered the hand from his ear and opened his eyes as he pulled his head back from the wall. He hesitated there for a moment, half expecting the shouting to return. The air was still. A sigh of relief escaped Andrew's lips. He pulled himself up to his feet and turned his head down the stairs. And that's when something caught his eye. On the far end of the attic, deep into the shadows, was the faintest glint of color. Andrew froze in place and stared, mystified by the glow of what he now saw to be two small, reddish lights floating next to each other a few feet off the ground. They swayed for a moment before quickly rising over six feet above the floor. Andrew's heart fell into his stomach as he realized what the lights were. They were eyes. A dull thud could be heard in the distance, and floorboards creaked under a new weight. Then another thud resounded closer this time, 
The red lights bounced in the air. As the sound grew louder in the shadows, Andrew could hear the telltale gallop of a limp. Thud. Thump. Thud. Thump. The steps picked up speed in the darkness. Andrew tried to move but found himself rooted to the spot. He held his breath as the red lights grew brighter. Thud. Thump. Thud. Thump. Thud. Thump. And suddenly, the ragged's form came charging out of the shadows, its glowing red eyes trained on Andrew. It cleared the space impossibly fast and shoved him, sending him flying backwards into the wall. He slid limply to the floor, his eyes rolling back from the pain. The creature above him went in and out of focus as Andrew struggled to stay conscious. The last thing he saw was blood-red eyes staring down at him, full of malice. Chapter 15 Celeste yawned and stretched before rolling over to snuggle up next to Andrew. It didn't surprise her to find that he wasn't laying next to her. His early riser lifestyle had baffled her for too many years for her to forget about it. What surprised Celeste was that half the bed was cold. Had he gotten up even earlier than normal that morning, she supposed. A small sinking feeling made itself known in her gut when Celeste realized that she didn't smell breakfast. Now that she thought about it, she couldn't hear any of the usual signs that Andrew was up and around. No humming, no shower, no cooking, nothing. She shivered as she slid out of bed, throwing on one of Andrew's flannels. Celeste set about looking for him. She checked in the bathroom, looked around the hole of the downstairs, and even checked out front for their car. The sedan had developed a layer of frost on the windows during the night, meaning it hadn't been used during the night. Confused, Celeste went back inside and poked her head into the basement. It was dark. Next, she went upstairs and peeked inside Corvus's room, finding it in the same condition she had last seen it in. She frowned and closed the door before begrudgingly turning and looking over at the stepladder leading up to the attic. Andrew? She called out as she made her approach. Hearing nothing, she slowly started ascending the stairs. I swear, this is some kind of joke. She stopped mid-sentence. When her head lifted above the ceiling and she saw Andrew slumped against the wall underneath the window. Andrew! She cried, running up the last of steps and kneeling next to him. His eyes opened groggily to the sound of her voice, and Celeste scooped his head into an overly tight hug. What are you doing up here? The fog of sleep immediately left Andrew's demeanor, and he stood up with startling speed. We have to leave, he said as he took her hand and led her back to the stairs. Wait! She protested, pulling her hand back. Why? What's going on? Andrew never broke stride as he descended into the hallway. Celeste nearly missed the step as she struggled to keep up, narrowly avoiding tumbling to the floor below. He had already stormed into the bedroom. She followed him in and found him hastily throwing their belongings into suitcases. She tried unsuccessfully to get his attention multiple times, before finally getting fed up. Andrew, stop! She shouted. The window pane shook from the force of her voice, and she could hear Gracie fall off the couch in the living room in shock. Even Andrew froze in place and stared at her. You need to tell me what's going on right now, Andrew Wilson, or so help me God, I'll move into this house permanently. He stood still for a few moments seemingly stunned by her sudden outburst. Vindictively, she thought that maybe, if he had been paying attention, it wouldn't have felt so sudden for him. Celeste crossed the room and took his hand, sitting him down on the side of the bed. Darling, what's going on? She asked, her voice softening. The energy melted out of his body, and Andrew looked at her with distant eyes. I think it's real. 
he said quietly. I think it's all real. What's real? The ragged. And with that, Andrew began to tell Celeste everything he had been keeping from her. He told her about the deer heads in the barn, described the entries in Corvus's journal, and even recounted his experiences from the night before. She listened to all of it, doing her best to digest the startling amount of information that she simply hadn't been made privy to. Part of her wanted to be angry with Andrew, but the impulse was certainly there. But there was something about the way he told her everything, maybe the genuine fear in his eyes, that let her know that now wasn't the time to be upset. Whatever Andrew had kept from her, Celeste was certain that he had had a good reason. I thought it was fake the whole time, you know? He began wrapping up the briefing session. Just a bunch of weird coincidences and the imagination of a crazy man. But with everything that's happened, and how edge we've both been, and especially after last night, I'm just not sure anymore. I'm scared that it's all real. That the ragged's out there, and it's been messing with our minds. I'm just, I'm scared. Andrew leaned in for a hug, and Celeste embraced him holding him close as he buried his face in her chest. She ran her fingers through his hair and stared at the wall. It was all just so much the process at once. But through the flurry of emotions and information, something nagged at the back of her mind. I don't think it is, she said after a few minutes of holding him. He pulled back and looked at her. Well, what do you mean? You're not the only one who's found weird stuff around here. Celeste laid it all out for Andrew. She told him about her nightmares and about the general sense of unease she had been feeling since their arrival. But she also told him about the missing girls in the pharmacy, the books on folklore, and the atlas, including her theory. I think Corvus was up to something really bad she finally said after laying out her side of the puzzle. The journal, the atlas, the folklore, the paintings. I think your grandfather may have been using his delusions to justify some awful stuff. You think he was capable of something like that? He asked, clearly not wanting to accept the idea. Well, you've seen all the creepy stuff around here, she replied. What's more likely? That there's an ancient fey creature living in the woods behind the farmhouse, or that a mentally ill old man convinced himself there was one to help with his guilt. Andrew sat silent for a moment, staring blankly into space. I just don't see how there could be any other possible way to explain all of this, Celeste said trying to coax a reaction out of him. He blinked a couple of times before his eyes refocused, and he looked at her. So, where does that leave us? He asked, his face a forlorn mix of fear and sorrow. Celeste felt genuine pity for him at that moment. His only good influence growing up was on the cusp of being posthumously ousted as a monster. We can't both be right. She absorbed his statement and took a minute to think. Okay, well, that's true, she finally said. Why don't we each act like we are? Well, what do you mean? I mean that there are half a dozen books on folklore creatures in a box downstairs. Certainly one of them tells you how to fight off a fairy. You stay here and I'll study up and I'll go into town and follow my lead. We've got all day to figure this out and then we could stay in the motel the rest of the time. But we cannot leave town until we're certain there weren't real crimes committed here. Andrew's eyes met hers for the first time since she had brought up her theory, and they were full of pain. Admittedly, it wasn't Celeste's best pep talk in the world, but the point seemed to have gotten across when he set his chin and nodded. Alright, he said, let's do it. 
The next few hours passed at an unbearably slow pace for Andrew. Two thoughts wrestled with each other in his mind as he and Celeste packed their bags and did last-minute sweeps of the house for anything of value. The idea that his grandfather could have been a serial killer fought for dominion over the admittedly absurd notion that a being beyond mortal comprehension had been living in the forest behind the farmhouse and communicating with him. He knew logically that the latter option was foolish to even consider, but after his experiences the night before, Andrew just couldn't be certain. And to him, at least, the idea that Corvus was up to anything nefarious felt just as outlandish. His grandfather was a gruff, even cold man, but a murderer? Even back when he was a teenager, hearing the rumors about Eileen's disappearances for the first time, Andrew had refused to believe that Corvus could have been capable of something like that. It felt completely counter to the man that he had met. After the couple had finished packing their bags and prepping to leave, Celeste picked up the keys off the counter and went out the front door. Andrew followed her out to the car, watching as the prevailing winds brought with them those same dark clouds he had seen the night before. Celeste rolled the window down to say goodbye. Are you sure you don't want me to come with you? He asked, his elbow propped up against the door as he leaned forward, ducking his head out of the wind. Yeah, she nodded. Both of us going would attract too much attention. Plus, this is going to be a quick in and out thing. I won't linger and I won't be chatty. Okay, well, just get back here before this storm hits. It's supposed to be pretty ugly. Don't worry, babe. I'll be back by sundown. Celeste gave Andrew a quick kiss before flashing him a small smile and backing out of the driveway. Andrew did his best to return the look, but his nerves were getting to him. He still wasn't certain why she was so insistent about being secretive but he was willing to take her word for it. Celeste had always had excellent gut instincts, and a small part of Andrew mused that they might not be in their current predicament at all if he had listened to her gut sooner. Walking back into the house, Andrew heard the sharp crack of a branch being broken underfoot echo from the trees to his left. His head snapped to attention and he scanned the area, looking for the source. His heart rate picked up as he stood frozen in place, watching for any signs of movement. Seeing nothing, Andrew took a deep breath and reassured himself that it was probably just the wind. He quickly finished his walk up the porch steps and stepped inside the house, locking the door behind him. Now that Celeste was gone with their only mode of transportation, the farmhouse felt vast and cavernous to Andrew. Feeling remarkably unnerved, he went to every door and window in the house, locking and fastening them however he could, even drawing the curtains on the ones in the kitchen and living room. After thoroughly and methodically indulging his paranoia, Andrew walked over to the small bookshelf and peeked out the window through the blinds one last time. Trees swayed dramatically in the breeze, and shadows grew longer but that was all the result of the coming storm. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, he let out a long, slow sigh before turning his attention to the books. The first book he picked up was the atlas sitting on top of the shelf. Andrew leafed through it and saw what Celeste had been talking about. Counting up all the different markings, Andrew found 29 locations in different towns, cities, and national parks across the state of Georgia each with a date marked beside it. Shivering at the potential implications, he put the book down and set his sights on a far more palatable option. Fairies. The folklore books were in the box marked Keep in Celeste's boxy handwriting. Andrew had always joked that she had the penmanship of a high school social studies teacher. He had to pull the books out one at a time, grumbling as he did about how unfair it was to only have one good arm. Andrew sat the books in a stack on the coffee table, noting the library classification stickers on the spine of each. 
killing coeds didn't feel like Corvus at all. Stealing from a tax-funded institution, however? Well, that was perfectly on brand for the man Andrew had lived with. Starting with the only book on Icelandic folklore, Andrew checked the table of contents for ways to ward off what Icelanders call the Hidden Folk. Finding no distinct section for it, he heavily skimmed the book. Frustratingly, Andrew found nothing of value outside of reading that sunlight turned trolls into stone, a fact that J.R.R. Tolkien had taught him in middle school. Throwing the book aside, Andrew moved on to the next one. The entire stack of literature took him half an hour to leave through, and only yielded two possible leads, iron and salt. While accounts varied from country to country and myth to myth, the overall consensus was that salt could be used to ward off the fae. Some stories have told people putting salt in their milk and meat to keep their fair folk from spoiling them, but that sounded to Andrew more like a case of common people not knowing that salt was a preservative. As far-fetched as it all sounded to him, though, he found that he was open to another idea, which was that fairies and spirits can't cross lines of salt. The stuff about iron was a little tougher to rationalize. Many accounts told of people using iron nails to hang iron horseshoes above their doors to ward off the fae. It seemed to be directly related to the modern notion of horseshoes bringing good luck, but Andrew couldn't make sense of where the idea had originated. He thought for a few minutes about where he could find those things. Salt was easy enough, Corvus had always kept the jumbo-sized container of iodized table salt in the cabinet above the stove. Iron was a little bit trickier, though. Andrew knew that there weren't any horseshoes around, but he was willing to bet that the fire poker hanging on the wall below the mantel was made of the same stuff. And even if it wasn't, he figured he'd still feel safer holding something sharp. And then a strange feeling washed over Andrew as he went into the kitchen and pulled the salt out of the cabinet. Like some part of him was scared to move forward with his plan. Was he prepared to cross this line? Once he started salting the entrances and arming himself with iron, where did he stop? Sure, he had been nervous that it could all be real, but was he ready to jump off the deep end like this? A harsh wind picked up, pelting the side of the house with a light smattering of rain. Andrew thought of the coming storm and the increasing darkness before deciding that peace of mind was worth feeling a little kooky. He took the salt and did the front and back doors first, pouring out a thin but unbroken line across each threshold. Then, he went window to window starting in the living room. The salt container began the trip a little over half full, and Andrew had begun to run dangerously low by the time he finished lining the upstairs windows. Having saved the worst for last, he climbed warily into the attic. The gentle stream of sunlight from the small window had soured in the dark pall of the clouds, casting a bleak light across the stacks of boxes and rows of paintings. Andrew stared at the back corner of the space for the longest time before fully entering the attic. Even in the daytime, the shadows that occupied that corner were thick and menacing. Reminding himself that he was a grown adult, Andrew swallowed his fears and made his way across the attic floor. Having confirmed that no spooks or specters were hiding in any nooks or crannies, he busied himself with salting the last window in the house. Small rivulets of water streamed down the glass as the rain began to fall harder outside. His thoughts drifted to Celeste, out on a mission to uncover the truth and get back before the storm hit in earnest. All while, he sat home and poured preservative seasonings all over the house. As much as he loved seeing his wife in charge, Andrew was growing more concerned with her safety as the skies darkened. Lost in thought, he stared out at the backyard and watched the rain coming down in sheets for a few minutes. The house creaked from a sudden onslaught of wind, and Andrew abruptly remembered where he was standing, 
Goosebumps spread across his arms as he turned to face the attic. Nothing had changed since the last time he had looked, but the eerie feeling that had settled over him wouldn't listen to reason. His imagination ran wild, conjuring up images of forest spirits attacking the house, furious that he had barred their entrance. Maybe the storm was just nature's wrath. Having creeped himself out more than enough, Andrew quickly made his way down the stairs. He thought briefly about closing the door to the attic, but decided against it. He had already salted the window up there, and theoretically, that was all the protection he needed. Returning to the living room, Andrew completed his fairy-proofing mission by taking a couple of practice swings with the fire poker. Figuring he had done all he could with the salted windows and a weapon nearby, Andrew decided to use the rest of his time to finish Corvus's journal. He sat down on the couch and slid the fire poker underneath it by his feet for safekeeping, then picked up the book. There weren't very many entries left to read, and he figured that was because his grandfather probably stopped writing in it shortly after Eileen's disappearance. Opening to the next unread page, Andrew immediately got more than he bargained for. Chapter 16 September 30th, 1992 Rag had finally told me what it is that he wants, and I'm not sure if I could go through with it. Everything he's told me so far has felt true. We all come from women so that part didn't confuse me much, and the part I didn't understand was what Ragged said about returning to women. I asked him what he meant by that when I went back out to talk with him last night, and he told me that it wasn't about sex, like I had thought. He said it was about consuming the flesh that gives us life, and that women hoard vitality if we allow them promised me that my crops would grow if I could bring him flesh. He said that the only way to replenish the vitality of the soil is to take it back from the women who stole it. Then he told me that by consuming the flesh of a woman, he can return her vitality to the earth she stole it from. I'm not sure what to feel. I thought Ragged might be a kind spirit, but... I don't think he is, and now I fear I may have no choice but to obey him. Crops were horrible this season. Another year like this and I'll lose the farm. October 3rd, 1992 It's been a few days since my last talk with Ragged, and I've decided against obeying him. At least, I had decided that until Eileen ran her mouth off again. A no good, ungrateful wife of mine had the nerve to threaten to leave me. She said she was done with all of my stupid superstitions, and that I was lucky she was just leaving and not throwing me in the loony bin. After all the year I've spent bending over backward to please her, she had the gall to look at me and call me crazy. But you know what? I was crazy, crazy enough to put up with her for so long, but that ends tonight. I'm fed up, I'm sick and tired of being mistreated all the time. If she wants to leave, then she can, but I'm getting what's mine. I've got her tied up, and I'm about to do the antlers just like Ragged taught me. Tonight. All that vitality she took for me is getting dumped straight back into the ground. October 5th, 1992. Ragged gave me Eileen's wedding dress back today. It was all covered in blood. He told me that she was a good start, but was just too old. Well, I couldn't agree more. He said the next one had to be much younger, and that the next girl had to be in the prime of her life. I thought I'd feel bad for what I have done, but I feel the opposite. I feel good. For the first time in my life, I feel like I know my purpose. 
I spent so many years just getting by, but now I can excel. Ragged gave me purpose and a connection to nature I've never had before. I'm no longer at the mercy of droughts and storms because I'm on the good side of the thing that makes them. Just one sacrifice a year, and he'll be happy. What did Eileen or any other woman ever do for me anyway? September 1st, 1993 This year has brought the best crops that I'd ever seen in my life. Ragged seems to have kept his end of the bargain, which means I just need to keep mine. If things keep going this good, I don't think I'll need this journal anymore, especially since there's no one around to tell me to shut up. The police keep coming over every few weeks asking if I've heard anything from Eileen. They've searched my property a dozen times but never found anything. People in town think I did it. They can't prove nothing. Cleaning the house after Eileen was a pain, so I came up with a new idea to make things easier on me. I've dug a hole out in the barn, right in the middle of the floor, and I've covered it up with the trap door I made myself. It'll be the perfect place to prepare for this year's sacrifice. Andrew slammed the book shut and tried to steady himself. The room was spinning as his whole world came crashing down around him. His stomach turned. If the journal was to be believed, then Corvus was guilty far more than Andrew ever could have thought. He threw the book down onto the coffee table and went over to grab his jacket. He slid his good arm into the left sleeve and draped the rest of the jacket over his right shoulder, zipping it up and throwing the hood on. Andrew unlocked the front door and went outside. He needed to see the barn for himself. He needed to know the truth. Storm or no storm, this ended now. Dark clouds were beginning to amass overhead as Celeste pulled into the pharmacy parking lot. She had practiced the plan in her head the entire drive over, but now that she was there, her mind was blank. She softly banged her head against the steering wheel, trying to jog her memory. Celeste had never been much of an actor. She preferred to work behind the scenes in all areas of her life, a skill set that didn't lend itself to deception. Even as a child, her parents always knew when she was hiding something, which led her strong dedication to telling the truth. Lying wasn't an option for her, so truth became her modus operandi. Not to mention that she also found out through trial and error that life was almost always easier if she was just honest. Of course, there were a handful of exceptions to that rule, and Celeste had found herself smack dab in the middle of that one. Her heart rate picked up when it sunk in that she was about to do this, and that she really could fail. The car suddenly felt hotter and more cramped. She turned the air conditioner up a few more notches and let the fans cool her off. Take a deep breath, she chided herself, doing a quick search on her phone for how to lie. Most of the results that came up were less than helpful. How on earth was she supposed to try not to sweat? Celeste dug for a few more minutes and found a few needles of solid, actionable advice amongst the haystacks of useless articles. Keep it simple and base it on the truth. She could do that. She gave the steering wheel a few more small headbutts as she racked her brain for something simple and truthful that she could build her lie around. She needed a reason to be in the pharmacy which meant she probably needed something medicinal. He had picked up her inhaler a few days ago, so that wouldn't cut it. And Andrew wouldn't reasonably need any more pain meds after only three days, so that wasn't a good reason either. Celeste had begun to lose hope of pulling off her plan when a well-timed cramp gave her an idea. Small spurts of rain had begun pelting the windshield by the time Celeste was getting out of the car. Speed walking across the parking lot, she snuck a peek through the pharmacy window. 
there was a perfect gap for her to look through between an informational HIV poster and an advertisement for the 2016 Peanut Jamboree, an event that Celeste wouldn't have given her left kidney to attend. From her vantage point, as she shuffled past, the place looked devoid of customers. Good. Fewer people meant fewer chances to get caught up in her lie. If Dry Creek was anything like her hometown, everyone would have something to say about her business. The small bell above the door jingled cheerfully as she pushed it open and darted in to get out of the increasingly heavy rain. Celeste's breath caught in her throat when she made eye contact with Jax, who lifted his head up at the sound of the bell. Pavlov's pharmacist flashed her an iconic grin, and she did her best to return it, knowing full well that she looked more constipated than excited. Well, hey, stranger, Jax called across the store. Cramps, Celeste shouted in response. Crap. She had been repeating her cover story over and over to herself in her head, and it had unintentionally slipped out when she opened her mouth to say hello. Great, now fraud was there too. Flexing her atrophied deception muscles was going to be harder than she thought. Thinking on her feet, Celeste placed a hand on her gut and grimaced. <laughs> Sorry, she blushed. That part wasn't acting. I'm just having the worst cramps. They really scramble my brain, if you know what I mean. She lifted her other hand and twirled it next to her temple in the universal cuckoo gesture. Jax's smile grew somewhat strained at the mention of her cramps, and Celeste silently rejoiced. She may have been laying it on way too thick, but no amount of bad acting could overcome a small-town man's fear of periods. She fumbled over his words for a moment before saying, Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, me too. I, uh, I'll give you some privacy while you get what you need. And with that, Jax disappeared to the back of the pharmacy. She didn't want to lie to her new friend, but there was no way to know if she could trust him or not until after she had verified her theory. It couldn't possibly be a coincidence if all the missing persons posters in the pharmacy had the same location and date as a page in the atlas. Corvus was an old man, and if her theory was correct, then it was all but guaranteed that he wasn't working alone. As much as she hated to consider it, there's a strong possibility that Andrew's childhood friend was Corvus's accomplice. Moving quickly, Celeste went over to the feminine hygiene products and pulled out her phone. Thunder boomed loudly outside as she opened the camera, zoomed in, and took aim at the corkboard, then snapped as many pictures as she could. Jax walked back in as she was taking the last picture, and Celeste abruptly pivoted, holding her phone higher and moving it around a little bit. I just can't get service out here. She said far too loudly before grabbing a random bottle of cramp relief pills off the shelf. Scurrying over to the counter, Celeste continued over-explaining, apparently unable to stop. I couldn't find my normal brand, so I was trying to look up the next best thing, but, but I guess the storm is interfering with the cell signal right now, so I guess I'll go with this one. I mean, how bad could it be? Anything's better than nothing. Jax's eyes narrowed briefly, and he took a slow breath in before asking, Are you okay, Celeste? What, me? Yeah, I'm fine. Quiet moment passed before she added, Like I said, period, brain. His discomfort became palpable as Celeste said the word, period, out loud. His posture abruptly stiffened, and he practically tore the bottle of pills out of her hand in his haste to get her checked out and end the conversation. Are we still on for tomorrow night? He asked, changing the subject as she handed him her card. Absolutely, she said, plastering on her best smile. We'll eat dinner, play games, and maybe even go on a joyride around town. I'm dying to hear all about Andrew's old stomping grounds. 
so much for keeping it simple. Jax's smile seemed to falter for a second before returning to normal, like a light flickering. It was never fully gone, but it noticeably dimmed for the briefest of moments, making Celeste's heart skip a beat. Had she just blown it? Well, he said as he drew a smiley face on the receipt and reached out with it looking her in the eye. She met his gaze and saw that his eyes were different. There was a coldness to them now that there hadn't been when she first walked in. Hopefully you're feeling up to it by then. Well, you know what they say, she replied, taking the receipt and holding eye contact as best she could. The first day is always the worst. I bet I'll be rearing to go by tomorrow. Well, I'm sure you will be. Celeste left the pharmacy as quickly as possible and ran out to her car through the downpour. She was nearly drenched by the time she slammed her car door shut, her teeth chattering from the sudden cold of the autumn rain. After turning the car on and cranking the heat up, Celeste pulled out her phone and started looking through her pictures to find the best one. It turned out that Celeste's hands were shaking so badly from nerves that she ruined almost every single photo she took. Thankfully, the last one was clear enough that she could zoom in and make out the information on most of the missing person flyers. She took individual screenshots of each poster before setting about on the last leg of her mission. Celeste's heart began beating faster as she cross-checked the dates and locations on the flyers with the ones from the Atlas. Starting from the oldest to the newest, every last piece of information she could see in the pictures was a one-to-one -one match with a page on the atlas. 29 locations and dates, 29 missing women, and 29 perfect matches. There was simply no denying it. Corvus was responsible for every single disappearance. Her stomach turned at the revelation. Should she go to the police? Her mind turned to Andrew, alone at the farmhouse and awaiting her return. With the phone line disconnected, she had no way of updating him on the discovery. Going to the police could take hours. Plus, she didn't have any of the evidence on her. And would they even listen? Her racing thoughts were interrupted when a bolt of lightning cut across the sky, followed by a half second later by a massive thunderclap. Visibility was growing more limited by the minute. She needed to hurry if she wanted to make it back to Andrew before the storm got too bad. Celeste decided on the spot she would pick her husband up first, help him collect the evidence, and then the two of them would go to the police together. Throwing the car in drive, she pulled out of the parking lot and started the trek back to the house. Unbeknownst to Celeste, Jackson Crawley stood in the front window of his pharmacy and watched as she sped down the road. Chapter 17 Andrew hardly noticed the sheets of rain hammering down on him as he stalked purposely down the driveway. He met gusts of wind head-on, grunting as he braced himself against them. Thunder boomed and lightning danced across the sky, but still, he marched onward. The storm above couldn't hold a candle to the maelstrom within him. Everything he thought he knew about his grandfather was a lie. How many times had he shouldered the weight of the town's rumors about Eileen, how many times had he defended Corvus and ended up with his face in the dirt for it? How many quiet moments had he spent convincing himself that those rumors couldn't possibly be true? That his grandfather couldn't possibly be capable of something like that? It was all for nothing, and now Andrew was the fool for sticking up for him. His tumultuous thoughts turned to the countless hours he had spent alone with Corvus in the two years he had lived in Dry Creek. They ate dinner together five nights a week, worked on the farm together daily, and slept 
right next door to each other every single night. Well, every night that Corvus wasn't out kidnapping and murdering young women. Tears mixed with rain as Andrew thought about those girls. If Celeste was right, then Corvus had at least 30 victims under his belt, including Eileen, and two of them had died while Andrew was just a short walk away. He had likely been in the barn at the same time as them, and never even knew it. His stomach lurched inside of him at that thought, threatening to empty its contents on the pavement as he reached the main road. He quickly checked both ways for headlights, and seeing none, he stomped across the road, setting his eyes on the building in the center of the field. The barn looked skeletal in the storm. Flashes of lightning revealed every missing board and loose shingle, and the entire structure swayed slightly in the strong wind. It looked like it was one missing nail away from collapse, and Andrew figured that, with his truck, Tonight would be the night it finally did. His feet sank deep into the mud with each step, the suction threatening to take his shoes if he wasn't careful. The last dozen yards in front of the barn were the worst of it, where years of farm traffic had compacted the dirt and left it a veritable quagmire. It was there that the mud came up over his feet entirely, and Andrew had to stop completely to pull his right shoe out of the mud a balancing act for the ages. Andrew pulled the door open and stepped inside. Water fell from the ceiling in steady drips around the barn, their impacts blending with the steady rattling of rain outside as they echoed through the cavernous space. Andrew flipped the switch on the wall next to the entrance and watched the overhead lights flicker to life. They cast a dim glow over the barn, washing out the room and throwing long shadows across the walls and floor. Thunder crashed in the sky above as Andrew dropped to his hands and knees to search for the trap door. The whole endeavor was awkward with only one arm, and Andrew was fairly certain that he looked like a madman, but he managed to eventually sweep most of the hay to the sides of the room. He didn't find anything. Pacing the length and the width of the barn several times, Andrew scanned the floor as thoroughly as possible, growing more convinced with each pass that the journal was just an old man's deranged ramblings. Maybe Corvus was only guilty of what happened to Eileen, or maybe he wasn't even guilty of that. Grief could do strange things to a person. Maybe. He made it all up as a way to mourn the disappearance of his wife. Andrew gave up his search and slumped against the wall by the door to pout, flexing the fingers on his left hand, trying to get feeling back to them. He had gotten so worked up and marched out of the barn in the middle of a torrential downpour. And for what? To sweep the floor and feel foolish? He leaned his head back on the wall and let his eyes unfocus, sinking deeper into despair. He was about to get up and leave when a brilliant flash of lightning illuminated the space, briefly filling in all of the shadows and even reflecting off the tractor in the middle of the room. The tractor? Andrew nearly jumped to his feet. The answer was right in front of him the whole time. How could he have been such an idiot? He practically ran over to the side of the tractor and climbed up the side before opening up the door and sliding into the cabin. Scrambling to find the key, Andrew frantically checked all around the floor and dashboard. They weren't there. He hopped down and checked each wheel well, starting with the front left tire. The key was tucked up on the ledge of the last wheel well he checked because of course it was. He looped back around to the other side and climbed back into the cabin. Awkwardly turning the key in the ignition with his left hand, Andrew felt the vehicle roar to life. The teenager in him roared with glee along with the engine, thrilled to finally be living the dream. The adult in Andrew, however, maintained a laser focus on the grim task at hand 
and shoved the teenager back into the depths of his mind. This was no place for an inner child. Headlights filled the front half of the room, even spilling out through the open door, illuminating the deluge outside. The gears shifted cleanly, and Andrew backed the tractor up to the end of the barn, stopping just a few inches shy of the wall. Between the purr of the engine and the smooth handling, it was clear that Corvus never let the vehicle's maintenance slip, even as the last of his home and property decayed around him. Having cleared a whole new section of the floor, Andrew parked the tractor and climbed down out of the cabin, leaving it running as he did. The extra light would make his search that much easier. He got down on his hands and knees once more, and swept away the last patches of hay with renewed vigor. It didn't take long for him to feel something cold and metallic beneath the straw. Grabbing hold of the metal handle and lifting, Andrew retched as a sickly sweet stench erupted from below in a blast of warmth. He dropped the trap door and vomited on the ground next to it, adding that to the ever-growing list of unpleasant experiences that day had brought him. Certain that they were at least two or three more unpleasantries awaiting him under the surface, Andrew took a deep breath and pulled the hatch open again. The trap door flipped over and landed on the other side of the opening with a resounding thud, and Andrew peered into the darkness below. He fished his phone out of his back pocket and turned on the light, revealing a ten-foot drop and a wooden ladder leaning against the earthen wall. Andrew put his phone between his lips and clamped down as he awkwardly maneuvered in position to climb down into the hole. Out in the field, illuminated by the tractor's headlights, a horned silhouette slowly approached the barn as Andrew's head dipped beneath the surface of the earth. It took far too long for Andrew to descend the ladder, having to carefully balance his body each time he moved his hand from one rung to another. He wasn't sure how he'd get back out again, but that was the least of his concerns at that moment. After Andrew's feet finally landed on the ground, he gratefully pulled the phone out of his mouth and massaged his lips with his tongue as he scanned the area. He stood in a small three-foot by three-foot entryway, that opened into a cramped tunnel. The ground sloped downward as it went, dotting every few yards by wooden posts and support beams. The hole looked like a miniature version of a mining tunnel, only without the stereotypical minecart tracks. Andrew also spotted a kerosene lamp and some matches on the ground near the mouth of the tunnel, and, after striking a match and lighting the lantern, the mine look was complete. Andrew turned his flashlight off and put his phone away, plunging the tunnel into a much darker, warmer orange light. And the sounds of the storm were much quieter now, and the underground itself was nearly silent, making Andrew feel like he had been transported to another world. He took a few hesitant steps forward, ducking beneath the low-hanging support beams. Oddly enough, even as Andrew crept through an underground tunnel toward what was presumably his late father's tortured dungeon, he felt almost nothing at all. He was drenched head to toe. His feet were covered in mud, and his whole right arm ached as he shivered from the cold. And yet, Andrew felt like he was a passive observer. To what was going on. Even the warmth of the lantern on his frozen fingertips seemed miles away. He absent-mindedly made his way through the tunnel as it sloped downward, going about twenty yards before taking a sharp right turn into a small cavern. The ceiling was a few feet higher in this new space, but that was the only thing it had going for it. Even from his detached vantage point, Andrew felt a jolt of disgust and terror pierce through the numbness. 
Lamplight spilled across the cave, revealing a scene out of nightmares. The kill shed was ten feet long and ten feet wide. The back wall was made of stone, and affixed to the rock face was a pair of thick iron shackles that laid open on the floor. Long, red claw marks marred the stone around the shackles, and thick gouges had been taken out of the earth in front of them, evidence of dozens of women trying desperately to escape their grim fates. On the right side of the room stood an old wooden operating table. Five sets of leather straps were attached to the sides of the table in perfect positions to bind someone's arms, legs, and head. Even in the dim glow of the lantern, crimson stains could be seen covering the wooden surface. On the left side of the room sat a workbench, grotesquely mirroring the one in the barn above, piled high with bloodied tools and several set of the missing antlers. Lined across the back of the bench were several bottles of pills and various fluids. Andrew's feet carried him over to the work area where he found, among other things, a hand-crank drill, a hammer and nails, and Corvus's pair of bolt cutters. He set the lantern down in an empty spot on the bench, as a small, dry laugh escaped Andrew's mouth at the sight of the tool. Of course they would be here. He threw the bolt cutters at the rock face to his right, feeling the smallest bit of release that managed to reach him in his distant hiding place. Following the next impulse that came to him, Andrew picked up the hammer, whirled around, and lobbed it at the operating table behind him, where it embedded itself claw-end first with a satisfying thud. A shuddering sigh escaped Andrew's lips as he stared at the hammer, which was now sticking straight up out of the table on the other side of the room. He turned slowly back around and grasped the first pill bottle with trembling fingers. Picking it up and reading the label, he could only make out the word, ketamine, before he threw that as well. It shattered against the stone, sending pills and small shards of broken glass cascading to the ground below. On Andrew went, just like that, down the entire back of the workbench, picking up bottle after bottle of sedatives and antibiotics alike and breaking it against the cavern wall, trying desperately to feel something through the numbness. Pills, liquids, and shards of glass alike littered the ground around the shackles, with some of the sedatives draining into the ruts that desperate bloodied fingers had left in the dirt. As Andrew picked up the last container and threw it, a small piece of paper fluttered off the workbench and fell to the floor below. The final crunching sound rang in his ears as he wiped the tears off of his face and caught his breath. He stared at the wall for a long time before he remembered the flash of white he had seen fall back behind the bench. His breathing steadied slightly as he stumbled over and picked up the small rectangle of thin paper. All of Andrew's lost emotions came rushing back to him at once when he realized with horror what he was looking at. He turned the paper over and saw an empty pharmacy script. The only writing on it came in the form of a small, familiar, smiley face. The rain beat thunderously on the windshield as Celeste tore down the dark road toward the farmhouse. She fishtailed somewhat on the gravel when she cut the wheel to the left, taking the turn onto the driveway far too quickly. The rain let up slightly as she sped by underneath the thick canopy of trees, but it returned in full force when Celeste roared into the clearing in front of the house. She skidded to stop in the middle of the lawn, kicking up mud and grass. Turning off the car and running through the rain, Celeste's clothes were soaked by the time she had run the dozen or so yards up to the shelter of the porch. The door was unlocked when she got to it, which was her first sign that something wasn't quite right. 
As much as Andrew liked to put on a show about being the protector and fearless guardian of their little family, Celeste knew better than anyone that he was a scaredy cat. His imagination often got the better of him, and Celeste was no stranger to coming home and finding every light in the house on, while Andrew sat huddled under a blanket because he watched a scary movie while she was out with her friends. Everything she knew about her husband told her that the door should have been locked when she got back. Pulling the door open, Celeste bolted into the living room to find it empty. Every light was indeed turned on, just like she predicted, but Andrew was nowhere to be seen. She called out his name as she ran up the stairs to look for him. Looking through both bedrooms and the attic, Celeste couldn't find a single dark room, but the house was very much empty. She turned the lights off as she left each room, plunging the house into darkness. Even in an emergency, there was no need to waste so much energy. The stairs let out their usual sequence of groans at an accelerated rate when Celeste ran down them to get back to the living room. She checked down in the basement and called his name a few more times, but it was becoming increasingly clear that Andrew wasn't in the house anymore. Where could he have gone? She paced back and forth across the living room in a tizzy, trying desperately to break through the noise in her brain and figure out why Andrew would have left the farmhouse in the middle of the storm. She was chewing on her thumbnail by the living room window when she noticed the line of white particles going across the sill. Frowning, she touched a finger to the line and found that it was salt. That's when the pieces clicked and Celeste realized what was different about the room. Outside of the strange salt line in the window, she saw that the Atlas and Folklore books had all been moved. They sat in loose stacks on the coffee table, with multiple new folded page corners visible from her perspective. That was the work of Andrew, which explained the salt. Celeste had always had a small fascination with myths and legends, and she had spent many nights as a child reading books about goblins and fairies and trolls. Those childhood memories had been what prompted her to keep Corvus's stolen library books in the first place, and they were also the reason why she suddenly recalled a piece of information that confused her as a child. Fairies hate salt. Andrew must have taken his side of this deal seriously going so far as to pour lines of salt in front of every point of egress. Now that she was looking for it, she saw the line at the base of the front door, too. But nothing about that explained where he had gone. Perhaps Corvus's journal, which had been tossed into an empty part of the table, held the answer. Picking up the journal, Celeste opened it up to the last dog-eared page, and she started reading it. What she found was both disgusting and incriminating, but ultimately unhelpful on her quest to find her husband. Celeste flipped instead to the very last entry, dropping the book in shock when she saw what it said. She needed to get to the barn. Now. Racing back out to her car through the rain, Celeste's mind raced about what Andrew might have found out in that old building. She threw the car into drive and made a wide, reckless turn through the front lawn before getting back on the gravel. The rain continued to pelt the car as Celeste sped back down the shadowy driveway, her headlights barely illuminating a dozen feet ahead of her in the storm. Pavement came into view, with the field lying just beyond, and Celeste didn't slow down. There wasn't any time. It was too late to stop by the time she saw the headlights coming from the right. There are no words in the English language capable of describing the abject rage and pain that Andrew felt looking down at the pharmacy script in his hand, at the smiley face cheerfully filling the space where prescription information was meant to be written. 
The paper shook and crumbled under Andrew's trembling, tightening grip. Tears traced path down Andrew's cheeks as memories flashed through his mind. There were all those nights spent on the porch roof outside Andrew's window, whispering about how big the world was and about how the two of them would take it on together. There were the days in school when the two of them sat alone in the lunchroom and ignored the whispers of their classmates. And then there were the Fridays when Andrew's best friend in the world came over and played poker with him and his grandfather. Two years were the memories of having each other's backs, of fighting together to stay afloat in a cruel and unforgiving small town. How many days had he spent with the two of them, both separate and together? How many times had he trusted them with his own life? And how many lies had there been? Corvus got to escape accountability. He got to escape punishment for his crimes. Andrew's eyes ran dry as a quiet fury settled over him, and all became clear. Jax was a dead man. Andrew was going to kill Jax for what he had done. Nothing had ever been so clear to him in his entire life. He tried so hard to see the good in the world, to see the beauty, but time and time again that goodness proved to be an illusion. His mother was good, and she was taken from him far too soon. His father wasn't good at all, but at least he had the decency to die young. And he thought his grandfather and childhood friend were good, but the two of them had quietly worked together to end the lives of who knows how many women. It was clear to Andrew, for the first time in his life, that goodness was a lie. The sickening crunch of metal in the distance pulled Andrew back to reality, and his heart dropped into his stomach. Celeste. He threw the receipt on the ground and turned to run back through the tunnel, but instead found himself face to face with the horned form of Amelia Barnett. The antlers on her head were lopsided, hanging at strange angles with caked on blood and matted hair surrounding the points where they had met her skull. She was drenched and wearing what looked like a wedding dress, covered in dirt and blood and muck. The fabric clung to her body from the rain, revealing an emaciated frame and ribs that shuddered with every breath. Sunken, haunted eyes stared wildly into his, as the grimace on her face contorted into a scream. She launched herself at him, wailing as their bodies collided and they tumbled to the ground by the workbench. The wind flew out of Andrew's lungs upon impact, and a searing pain swept through his right shoulder and down through his broken arm. Amelia landed on top of him and launched a flurry of clawed swipes at his face and eyes, the brunt of which he took directly in a pain daze. Amelia, stop! He tried to call out only for a filthy hand to hook inside his mouth and tear at his cheek, leaving him tasting dirt and blood. The girl wouldn't stop shrieking, a high-pitched pain cry of anguish that left Andrew's head throbbing and his ears ringing. It took several swipes to the face for Andrew to get his wits about him. When he did, though, he saw what he needed to do. Following his hunch, he waited for a small break between swings, when it came, Andrew threw his left arm into the air and grabbed a hold of her right antler. The screaming stopped for the briefest of moments when he gripped the horn before returning at a greater volume. Her hand shot up to grab at his, and he pushed down hard in response. Andrew heard a small crunch, and a fresh stream of blood came flowing out of the wound and falling onto his face. Amelia yanked her head back, letting out another sharp yelp as she did, and momentarily lost her balance. Andrew capitalized on her unsteadiness and bucked his hips to the side, throwing her off of him as she whimpered and clutched at the base of the antler. Seeing her curled up on the ground, he took his chance and made a break for the tunnel. His legs wobbled as he stood up 
nearly making him fall over again. But Andrew managed to stay on his feet and charge out of the room. Rounding the corner, Andrew found himself plunged into darkness and quickly realized that he had forgotten the lantern in the kill shed. He knocked his head against the support beam, sending a new wave of pain through his skull. He ducked as he ran the rest of the way up the slope, guided only by the ambient glow of the tractor's headlights bleeding into the tunnel from the trap door. Andrew had made it to the ladder when he heard another scream from within the darkness. He needed to hurry. Limping footsteps reverberated through the tunnel as he put his good arm on a rung above his head and climbed up a few steps before throwing his arm up to the next rung and doing the same thing. It was a slow and treacherous process, and Andrew almost lost his balance a few times as he climbed, all the while hearing the steps and frantic breathing grow closer. His hand had just reached the floor of the barn, when Amelia appeared in the light beneath him and screamed again before beginning her climb. Andrew scrambled up over the lip of the hole and rolled onto the ground, struggling to catch his breath. He only had a moment to breathe before the girl's hand sprang up and grabbed a hold of his leg. Kicking frantically, Andrew managed to land a hit directly in her face. Her eyes crossed for a moment before her grip loosened and she fell backward, tumbling back down into the hole. Andrew peeked over the edge and saw her laying unconscious on the ground, her ribcage rising and falling in labored breaths. She was still alive. Breathing a small sigh of relief, Andrew stood up and walked around to the other side of the hole before grabbing the metal hatch and throwing it shut. Amelia may have been Corvus's most recent victim, but she was clearly out of her mind and needed to be contained until Andrew could get her the help that she needed. He limped over to the tractor and slowly pulled himself up into the cabin. Throwing it in drive, Andrew turned the vehicle so that one of its front wheels covered the trap door. He turned it off and climbed back down to check his handiwork. Now certain that Amelia couldn't get out and cause any more trouble, Andrew made his way to the door of the barn and peered out through the rain. Seeing the crumpled frames of two cars blocking the road, with their headlights still running, he took off into the storm. Wading through the muddy field again was a much slower process as Andrew half dragged himself through the muck and mire to get to the wreckage. He finally made it to the road and stared in horror at their car, which was bent around the hood of a second vehicle. The collision had happened in front of the driveway, but inertia had led to both cars stopping several feet down the road. The driver who hit her hadn't slowed down, and Andrew knew exactly whose car that was, but he had more important matters to attend to. He hobbled over to the driver's side door of his car and found it hanging open. The front seat was empty. Panic welled up inside him, pushing his pain and rage to the side. There was only one thing left in Andrew's life that he knew for a fact to be good, and that was Celeste. If he lost her, then he would know for a fact that goodness was a lie because no good world would allow his wife to be taken from him after everything else that he had lost. Tears fell again from his eyes at the prospect of losing her, mingling with the rain that pounded down on him from above. He stood there for a moment, lost in premature grief, before realizing that he hadn't checked the other car. Clinging to that last shred of hope, he set his sights on the second vehicle. Andrew made his way to the driver's side door and found its front seat empty as well. The panic subsided slightly as he realized that both drivers were likely still alive. And that's when the rage returned. He limped over to the edge of the gravel driveway and stared into the darkness ahead as rain cascaded down around him. It was time to end this. 
The first thing Celeste noticed when she woke up was the pain. Her head throbbed and the light was too bright, even with her eyes closed. The coppery taste the blood lingered in her mouth, and when she moved her cheeks, she felt a dried stream of blood crack. Did she have a head wound? Opening her eyes, Celeste immediately knew that the answer to that question was yes. Rain pounded the roof and the ground outside, and the open front door only amplified the noise. Even the dim light of the living room ceiling was too bright for her eyes to handle, and her headache let her know it. But wait, why was she back in the living room? Despite her protests, Celeste forced her eyes to stay open and to look around. She was back in the farmhouse and sitting in the armchair with its back to the stairs. There were cuts and bruises all over her clothes and body, which hung off of her from the weight of the rainwater they had absorbed. Her arms were pulled behind the chair, and her wrists were tied together. And that's when the memory came flooding back. The car. Someone had T-boned her vehicle as she was crossing the road into the field. She remembered the flash of headlights and the way her head jerked to the right upon impact before swinging back to the left and colliding with the window. That was when she lost consciousness. And just then, a sharp metallic scrape from the kitchen caught Celeste's attention and sent new waves of pain through her skull at the sudden sound. The scraping continued as a voice called out across the room. Ah, oh, good, the voice said. Well, you're awake. Celeste didn't even need to look to know who it was. It was the only person who could have known that she had figured it all out. The only person outside of Corvus who knew what was going on underneath the barn. His accomplice. She turned her head toward the kitchen and locked eyes with Jax, who was leaning casually against the counter while sharpening a butcher knife against the honing rod. His wounds from the crash were far less severe, but still noticeable. His soaked clothes had a fair amount of blood on them, and he had a large gash on his forehead. You surprised? He asked with a smug grin. Not even a little bit. She spat some blood out onto the floor. Keeping a trophy wall in your place of business might not have been the smartest idea. Well, none of the idiots around here seemed to notice, he said as he stood up and walked toward her, methodically running the blade down the length of the metal rod. Celeste did her best not to visibly wince at each scrape. But, well, I guess it took someone with a big city education to crack the code. Celeste rolled her eyes at the way he emphasized the words, big city education like it was an insult. Having grown up in a small southern town, she had never understood the vitriol the people there felt for those who chose to go to bigger places or nicer schools. Is that what this all was about? She asked, not hiding the disgust in her voice. Some kind of ego trip? A way to feel big and important after living a dead-end life in a dead-end town? Jax moved with surprising speed, covering the last few feet and dropping the honing rod. His left hand lashed out and slapped her across the face, whipping her head to the right. The room spun. Jax grabbed Celeste forcefully by the chin and turned her head back to face him, brandishing the blade of the butcher knife inches away from her face. You better watch your mouth and remember who's holding the knife. He whispered as he touched the steel to her cheek. Celeste's breath caught in her throat at the cold of the metal, but she maintained eye contact. A strange, suicidal kind of bravery had filled her body, and she wasn't about to die without giving that depraved man a piece of her mind. I hope you enjoy this. She said, leaning forward and feeling the sting of the blade as it bit into her skin. A small trickle of blood fell down her cheek, because it's going to be the last thing you ever do as a free man. 
And you better hope the police get to you first. Because if Andrew does, then you're going to be a dead man instead. Jax's eyes flickered upward and looked over Celeste's head, breaking the staring match that they had been having. His scowl turned into a smile, and he looked back down at her. Well, I guess we'll find out. He stood up and grabbed the armchair before spinning it around to face the front door. The sudden movement sent her head into another spasm of pain, blurring her vision. Through the days, she looked out the open front door and saw a familiar form approaching the porch through the rain. Her eyes came back into focus, and the figure became Andrew. There was murder in his eyes as he limped his way up the porch steps and up to the front door. Jack still stood behind Celeste, and he had wrapped his arm around the side of the chair, bringing the knife up to her throat. His other hand grabbed her hair and yanked it to lift her head. Well, I'd stop right there if I was you, Jax called out. The fury in Andrew's eyes never faltered, but he complied, stopping in the middle of the doorway and raising his good arm in the air. That smart man, Jax said, revealing in his dominance and control over the situation. Did he hurt you? Andrew asked Celeste, ignoring Jax's taunts. I don't think it's her you should be worried about. The words rolled off her captor's tongue before she got a chance to respond. As if on cue, footsteps could be heard over the rain, and a gaunt, dark figure appeared behind Andrew. A grimy hand reached up and grabbed his arm by the wrist, and a second hand held him in place as the figure bent Andrew's arm behind his back. Andrew turned his head to see what had grabbed him, and a look of similar shock flashed across both his and Celeste's faces. It was the ragged. In the light that shone out onto the porch from the living room, Celeste saw a very obvious detail that Corvus's paintings and drawings had all left out. The ragged was just a man. A wild feral-looking man, but a man nonetheless. Decades of muck and grime, now slick from the rain, covered him. He wore several layers of worn-out and tattered clothing, and the smell of death emanated from him, souring Celeste's stomach. His nails were filthy and overgrown, and his hair was long and matted, covering most of his face. Well, go ahead, Dad. Jack said cheerfully. Bring him over and tie him up. A new look of shock and horror plastered itself across both Celeste and Andrew's faces as the filthy older man stepped over the salt line and inside the house, limping as he leads Andrew over to the smaller chair by the bookshelf. He pushed Andrew down into the chair before picking up the length of rope that had been laying on the coffee table and wrapping it tightly around his body. Celeste watched helplessly as her husband cried out in pain. Her mind raced as she tried to comprehend what she had just learned. Some pieces of the puzzle immediately fell into place for her, while others no longer fit. Jax, still standing behind her with a knife to her throat, seemed to notice the couple's surprise. After his father had finished tying Andrew to the chair on the other side of the room, Jax removed the knife from its position by her throat and took a slow, triumphant walk toward the front of the living room to close the front door. Ah, you know, I'm sorry, he said, turning back from the now locked door. Well, I thought you two had figured it all out. Celeste gulped and caught her breath as he stepped away, thankful to be free of the blade. But more than that, she was relieved that she could finally start working on her escape plan. It was a long shot, but there was a loose thread in Jax's knot on her wrist that she had started tugging at. She just needed more time. Well, I guess we're not as smart as we thought, she said. Maybe you could enlighten us. Jax had been waiting for that question for a long time, 
as he launched into an explanation that felt far too rehearsed to Celeste to have been made up on the spot. Well, it's simple, you see, he began. My dear old father isn't well, hasn't been for years. He left when I was young, running off into the woods to live a better life, a life closer to nature, as he told it. The ragged now crouching next to Andrew grunted softly, as if in approval. Then he turned and set his sights on Celeste, who did her best to just keep her eyes on Jack's. The man stalked over to her as his son monologued, eyeing her in the same way a lion eyes a gazelle. Now Andrew likely remembers this, but I spent so many years angry at my dad for leaving me. Andrew didn't say a word. He just kept staring intently at Jax. Well, of course, you know, nothing lasts forever. After mom died, I decided it was time to bury the hatchet and try to reconnect with my long-lost father. Well, it wasn't easy. I spent months searching throughout the forest, trying to look for him. It was all I could think about. The filthy man had limped over to Celeste by that point. She stopped her work on the knot behind her back, having loosened it considerably. He got uncomfortably close, his face just inches away from hers as he breathed in deeply, the heat and smell of his breath making her grimace. After I finally found the cave he was living in, well, I decided I'd never let him go. I mean, after all, family is everything. The ragged moved to the side of Celeste's face and licked her. A long, slow lick up the side of her face where the blood from her head wound had dried, and tears began to roll from her eyes. Now, as you could see, Dad developed some, well, shall we say, interesting perspectives in his time away from society. Perspectives that he managed to share with your grandfather. He took them like a moth to a flame. He gestured to Andrew, who had now focused all his rage on the ragged. And that's when our little operation came into full bloom. I supplied the old man with sedatives and antibiotics. He did the hunting, and then Dad reaped the benefits. Now granted, Corvus added his own supernatural flair to the idea, but, well, it turned out to be a mutually beneficial relationship for all three of us. Corvus thought he was helping his crops grow. Dad got his yearly feast. And I got to have my father back. Win, win, win. Celeste had heard enough. You're a monster, she shouted, causing the ragged to flinch away from her. How could you do that? You helped kill all those innocent girls and for what? So you could be close to your lunatic father? In response, Jax shrugged, flashed that horrid smile of his, and said, no family's perfect. Chapter 18 Andrew had never felt such rage in his entire life. His blood boiled as he sat in the living room tied to a chair, watching his childhood best friend confess that he helped his grandfather become part of a serial killer duo. It was a quiet kind of fury, the kind that made the whole world sharper and more focused. Riding that wave of focused hatred and anger, Andrew plotted his escape. Jax, that traitorous liar, was high on his sense of superiority, which would make him easier to distract. The ragged was a wild card to Andrew, and as much as it disgusted and enraged him to see what that pervert was doing to his wife, that was strategically the best place for him to be. If he stayed preoccupied with Celeste long enough, then Andrew would have a clear shot at Jax. Sneaking a quick look over at the base of the couch just a few feet away, Andrew saw exactly what he had hoped he would see. Underneath the middle of the couch, exactly where he had left it, was the handle of the fire poker. There was his weapon. Now, Andrew just needed to get out of the ropes. He tested the chair under the guise of trying to pull out of the restraints he was in. Pressing his bum arm against the rope was immensely painful, 
but it sold the part. Jax gave him a smug look as he failed to escape. Andrew kept his smirk hidden. It was one of the dining room chairs, the weakest one. Memories came to mind of how many times the chair had almost fallen apart underneath Andrew when he leaned back on his hind legs and he knew exactly how he would escape. Now it was simply a matter of creating the right opportunity. Celeste had finally had enough and started shouting at Jax, which meant now was the right time for Andrew to try and distract him. His cool and casual response to her shouting unnerved Andrew, but it also gave him the perfect place to start. Was it all a lie then? He asked, genuinely curious about what the answer would be. Our relationship. Was it all just a game to you? Was it a game to you? Jack shot back, stunning Andrew. Well, I haven't heard from you in over 20 years. You got out of Dry Creek and never thought twice about me, didn't you? Andrew didn't know what to say. That same guilt he had felt in the pharmacy returned, which surprised him. As much as he hated Jack's at that moment, at least half of that hate came from the feeling of betrayal, that his childhood best friend had stabbed him in the back. Hadn't he done the same thing by never reaching out? Granted, Andrew didn't feel too bad about the circumstances seeing as Jax was a homicidal maniac, but part of him also felt responsible for that, for leaving him alone. Look, he said after a moment, I'm sorry I never reached out. I'm sorry I've been a bad friend. But we could change that, right? It's not too late to mend our friendship. Just untie us and we'll all start from square one. Jax laughed a bitter, barking laugh. Ha, huh. oh sure, pal. He kept laughing. You and I could start from square one while you spend the rest of your life chained up under the barn. But unfortunately, we'll have to do that without Celeste. Because I'm afraid she's got a dinner date. Andrew's blood ran cold. He knew that they were in deep trouble but the reality of what they had planned for Celeste hadn't yet set in. He needed to do something big, and he needed to do it fast. You spiked that whiskey you gave us, didn't you? He asked as that piece of puzzle snapped suddenly into place. His old friend looked surprised. Now, how did you put that one together? He sounded impressed, which gave Andrew a surge of confidence. Every small advantage mattered. Nothing impossible happened to me until I drank some and didn't pass out, he said. But what really has me stumped is how you drug Celeste. Jax's classic grin spread across his face again, making him look smugger than ever. This might be Andrew's chance. Well, now that one, oh, I'm proud of. He began to pace across the front room gesturing with the knife and reveling in his genius. Your girl made things tricky by not drinking, but thankfully, I had the solution. It was the inhaler. I would have been sunk without that. Now it was Celeste's turn to speak. But why drug us at all? What good did that do? Well, it softened you up and gave Dad a chance to scope you guys out. And honestly... Well, it was just plain fun for me. He shrugged and started pacing back toward the door, lost in a story. We were going to make our move tomorrow night when I came to visit, but we had to move the plan forward a bit when we realized that Celeste was on to us. His back was to the room as he gazed out the small window by the front door, watching the storm. I can't say I'm going to feel too bad when Dad eats her. She's been a real pain in my... Capitalizing on Jax's distraction, Andrew charged. The chair they had tied him to was lightweight, a fact that Jax likely failed to consider in his haste to adjust his plans. The ragged saw Andrew's attack and moved to intercept, but he was too slow with his limp. Andrew turned slightly and lowered his left shoulder before colliding with Jax, sending the two of them crashing to the ground. 
he kept the momentum of his turn going and maneuvered so that the chair landed back legs first. Pain shot through his wary body as he hit the floor, but it was worth it to hear the satisfying crunch of wood beneath him. His plan had worked. He quickly scanned the ground for the knife, spotting it just a few inches away from Jax's hand. Jax reached out to grab it, but Andrew whipped his leg around. His muddy shoe made contact with the handle and sent it skittering across the floor. Footsteps from behind alerted Andrew to the ragged's approach, and he rolled over to see the man ambling toward him. What he didn't expect to see, however, was Celeste pulling her hands free from the rope behind her and escaping the armchair. She stood up like she was about to take on the older man in front of her, but Andrew shouted at her before she made a move. Celeste, run! He cried out. He couldn't risk her getting hurt. He would take care of this. Jax and the ragged both turned and saw Celeste, who froze momentarily in place before turning and running up the stairs as fast as she could. The ragged turned back around to face Andrew when Jax called him off. Will you go and get the girl, Dad? He said before kicking Andrew in the right arm, sending a spasm of pain throughout his body. I'll take care of the cripple. Celeste's heart pounded in her chest as she ran up the stairs. Not knowing where to go, she made a beeline for the best hiding place she could think of. The attic. Her body ached as she tore down the hallway toward the entrance, listening as the stairs behind her groaned unevenly under the ragged's weight. She got to the ladder and moved up it as quietly as possible, careful not to alert her pursuer to her position. Tiptoeing across the floor, Celeste found a spot on the far side of the attic that was perfect. She quickly crouched down and nestled herself between two stacks of boxes. There was no way out. Celeste tried to calm her racing thoughts, but nothing would work. He was going to find her. She was going to die. Limping footsteps could be heard from the hall below and Celeste listened in horror as they slowed down and began to move more methodically, like a predator stalking its prey. The sounds moved first to Corvus's room, where she could hear the door creak open. After a quiet moment, they moved on, going next to Andrew's room and doing the same thing. The door squeaked softly in its hinges, followed by a small silence. The steps paused momentarily by the bathroom door, before moving with greater speed toward the attic stairs. He was coming for her. Tears rolled down Celeste's cheeks as she heard the attic stairs creak under the weight of her assailant. She held her breath and listened, straining through the darkness to hear more footsteps. But none came. It was nearly silent in the attic. The only sound came from the rain as it beat steadily on the roof above, and Celeste clasped the hand over her mouth and prayed. The quiet moment stretched on as more tears tumbled over her hand and fingers, broken only by the distant sounds of the struggle below. A flash of lightning cut through the darkness of the attic, revealing the form of the ragged as he loomed over her. A small smile could be seen beneath the thick tangle of hair on his face. Thunder boomed as the man reached down between the boxes and grabbed Celeste by the hair. Andrew howled in pain, clutching his arm and writhing on his back. Jax recovered quickly and started crawling toward the knife, which sat by the front door a few feet away. Andrew sat up and tried to reach for Jax's leg, but his hand was kicked away with relative ease. Deciding that following Jax so closely would end with him meeting the business end of a blade, Andrew instead scrambled backward and climbed onto his feet. He picked a broken chair leg up off the floor and raised it in defense, just in time for Jax to stand up and lunge at him with the knife. Metal collided with wood as the blade glanced off the leg. Andrew batted the attack to the side and used the momentum to swing the piece of wood at Jax's head. It connected with his temple with a sickening thud, 
and broke in half. Jax's head snapped to the side as a chunk of a chair leg flew off in the opposite direction. Andrew's old friend jerked his head back and glared at him with malevolent intent before wildly swinging the knife. They were wide, uncontrolled attacks, but they did the trick. Each of Andrew's dodges backs him up further and further until his legs bumped against the coffee table behind him and he lost his balance. Jax capitalized on his wobbling and shoved him with his free hand, sending Andrew toppling backward into the old table. It broke in half underneath him, sending folklore books crashing down on Andrew's face. More pain moved through Andrew than he had ever felt in his life, and the room began to go black. His bleary eyes refocused just in time to see Jax bringing the blade down toward his chest. Celeste let out a pain cry as the ragged yanked her out of the boxes by her hair. She kicked and flailed, struggling against his grip as he dragged her back through the darkness of the attic. The pain was almost too much, and panic was starting to set in as the man limped his way toward the stairs dragging her along as if she weighed nothing. Wait. The limp. The epiphany cut through the pain, bringing with it a moment of strange, calm, and clarity. Celeste quit fighting for just a second and slumped completely. The sudden weight shift caught her captor off guard, and he rocked back just enough to lose his balance. Before he could regain his balance, Celeste planted both feet underneath her and launched herself sideways onto his legs. The man collapsed, falling on top of her and rolling to the side, the wind getting knocked out of both of them in the process. A whole new volley of pain quickly acquainted itself with Celeste's body, but she had no time to spare. She rolled onto her knees and stood up to run only for the ragged's grimy hand to reach out and catch her by the ankle, knocking her back down again. Celeste kicked free of the man's hand and got up again, racing toward the only exit. The ragged recovered quickly and somehow managed to close the gap on his bum leg, planting both hands on Celeste's back and shoving her. She flew forward and collided with the wall by the window, collapsing in a heap on top of an old dress form, with only a moth-bitten veil left hanging on it. This time, it was Celeste who recovered quickly, hearing the ragged move to block the stairs out of the attic. She got up on her knee and grabbed hold of the dress form. Then, she stood up and whirled around, swinging the wooden form in a wide arc and sending the veil flying into the air. The form cracked against her attacker's head, whipping it to the side. He swayed for a moment from the shock of the blow before Celeste returned the favor, giving him a hard shove to the chest. The man fell backward and tumbled down the stairs into the hallway below, landing in a crumpled heap. His head was turned at an unnatural angle, and a small pool of blood had already started forming underneath him. Celeste stared down at him, amazed at how frail he looked at that moment. The old veil drifted gently down through the air, eventually coming to a rest on his still corpse. A well-placed kick saved Andrew's life. As the knife was coming down toward him, Andrew managed to rock back and get his feet on Jax's chest, kicking hard. He bucked the man off of him, howling as the blade gouged a line down his thigh. Blood gushed freely out of his new wound, and Andrew scrambled backward until he found himself against the couch. His vision blurred again from the pain as he frantically felt around for the fire poker with his good arm. Jax got back on his feet and brandished the knife. You ever think it would end this way? Jax asked his smile never leaving his lips. He charged at the easy prey, raising the knife again for the killing blow, and Andrew's hand finally found the handle of the fire poker, and he pulled out from under the couch 
thrusting the point upward as Jax came down at him. The poker pierced through his gut with ease, and Jax took in a sharp, gasping breath as his momentum came to a sudden stop. He gurgled as he looked down at Andrew with wide eyes, the smile finally gone from his face. Trembling, he still tried to bring the knife down. Andrew twisted the poker hard, Jax's hands spasmed open. The knife clattered harmlessly to the floor beside Andrew, followed soon by Jax. No, I didn't, Andrew said as tears rolled freely down his cheeks. I didn't. He watched the light leave his friend's eyes before exhaustion overtook him. Chapter 19 Eight days later, Celeste and Andrews stood somberly in the Dry Creek Pharmacy. He had his hand around her shoulder as they looked up at the empty space where the missing person board used to be. The police had taken it, partially as evidence, but also partially to keep the media circus from finding it. News outlets had descended upon the small Georgia town after the word got out about what had happened there. The two of them had only managed to avoid being hounded by the press because they were holed up in the hospital for so long. Staring at the wall, Celeste's mind walked back through all that had happened. She had come downstairs from the attic to find Andrew unconscious on the living room floor, the police cars pulling up outside. Their neighbor, Elliot, had heard the crash and called 911. Jax and his father were both dead by the time the authorities had arrived, so Andrew and Celeste were rushed out to the hospital. Andrew was frantic when he woke up the next day, telling the police that they needed to get out to the barn immediately, and that was when Celeste learned that Andrew had trapped Amelia Barnett in the secret kill shed underneath the barn. Somehow, she had survived down there and was admitted to the hospital as well. After they had finally relayed everything they knew to the police, Andrew and Celeste learned that the Ragged's real name was Coy Crawford, and that he had abused Jax all of his life, and then he skipped town one day. It took Amelia the better part of a week in the ICU to start speaking again, but she was able to draw a map for the authorities that led them out to the cave that Coy Crawford had been living in for over 30 years. The police were still going through it, but the last Celeste had heard, they had recovered skeletal remains of at least 16 women out there. More were being found daily. The extra-long stay in recovery were by no means enjoyable for Andrew or Celeste. But she did find one point of solace in all of it when she met Amelia Barnett's family. That made it all worth it for her. All the pain and suffering was worth getting to see the look of relief on Amelia's mom's face when she saw that her baby girl was alive and safe. The townsfolk had felt bad enough about what had happened to Andrew and Celeste that they pooled enough money together to pay for a rental car to get the couple back to Boston. Celeste was touched by the gesture, unlike Andrew, who balked at it behind closed doors, insisting that they only did it so that the two of them would get out of town faster. Everything they had gone through hardened Andrew, and Celeste was nervous that she might never get to see the fun-loving and light-hearted version of him ever again. She was undoubtedly changed by their experiences too, but she had the luxury of at least being an outsider. Either way, there was going to be a long road to recovery for the both of them. And now, there they stood, staring at a now empty wall that had spent decades displaying the ghoulish trophies of three twisted men, marveling at how impossible it all seemed how neither of them could believe the amount of concentrated evil they had seen in such a short time. I just can't believe that three men were able to take so many lives, 
Andrew said after a moment of silence. And I can't believe how close I was to two of them, without ever knowing what they were doing. You can't blame yourself for that, Celeste said. No one knew, and besides, it's over now. At least all of those girls' families will be able to finally rest, knowing the truth. And how are we supposed to rest? He asked, staring forward. Celeste took a step forward and turned to face him. I don't know if we ever will, she said, taking his hand. But what I do know is that we'll figure it out all together. But is that enough? After everything that's happened to us, how can we ever believe in anything good ever again? Celeste brought Andrew's hand to her lips and kissed it, contemplating what he had just said. Because we're alive, she said after a while. And we're together. And to me, that's proof that no amount of evil can snuff out the good. There will always be something worth living for if we're willing to put in the effort to find it. So, come on, Andrew Wilson. Pull the ripcord, and we could go find the good together. Celeste led Andrew out of the pharmacy, and together the two of them walked across the empty parking lot to their rental car, where Gracie lay asleep in the back seat.